Hello everyone and welcome to this Python Phil course by Simply Code. In this Phil course, we will be covering some Python concepts that are important for developers. We have Anish with us who has been working with the industry for a very long time. He will be helping us to learn the in-depth concepts in Python and he will also explain us how to code efficiently. Over to you Anish. Hello everyone and welcome to our course on Python programming. My name is Anish Karan and I will help you learn the fundamentals of Python programming and what programming in Python really means and what it is all about. I am sure there are plenty of you over here that are watching this video that have their own reasons and multiple reasons to start learning programming and programming in Python in particular. Our goal over the duration of this course is to ensure that you are able to learn Python and learn Python programming to a level in which you can tackle whatever problems you have and whatever projects you set out to do in the future. Now I'm sure you must have heard that the, some of the most upcoming fields and some of the high prospect domains in, in the market right now such as data science, AI, machine learning require Python programming and our goal in this course is to get it to a level where you can start tackling and creating solutions to uh, whatever problems you may occur whether it be in your job or in your studies or anywhere else or any personal projects that you may uh, take up in the future. Now before we actually get started on the actual concepts and the fundamentals of Python I want to show you over the next two or three videos exactly what how Python came to be what was the philosophy behind creating this language and uh, uh, basically a brief introduction behind uh, Python and Python programming. So Python programming was developed first by a person, a Dutch programmer by the name of Guido van Rossum and Python was first released by him in the year 1991. Now the design philosophy behind Python was to create a language which was much easier to read and much easier to actually code in compared to the uh, or in contrast to the languages that were prevalent back in those days such as uh, the language C. Now formally Python is an interpreted high-level general purpose programming and what this means is that uh, Python is a it's a language that can be used for a wide variety of applications as we will see later. Uh, the high-level uh, part of this definition basically tells us that Python is written in a language that is very abstract at a much higher abstract level compared to the instructions that a computer can actually read. So in layman's term, you can say that Python is very close to the actual uh, language that we humans use and that's the way Python has been designed. And the difference between a high level programming language and a low level programming language is that low level languages are essentially machine language instructions that are the actual instructions that a computer can actually understand. A high level language like Python is something that we humans understand better and we can write in it better. Now the term interpreted over here uh, essentially means that we don't need to compile our instructions that we give in Python. Now as I mentioned earlier that the computers or any system that involves computing needs low level language to be fed to it so that the computer can actually understand because computers cannot understand the way we write our code and this process of converting from high level to low level is called compilation and in most languages such as C there's a special process involved called compilation which we do after we create our blocks of code or scripts or whatever. Now when we say Python is an interpreted language what this means is that we can actually work on Python and see the results right at the get-go. We can skip this step of compilation uh, because our system that runs Python actually does all of that uh, conversion from high level to a low level uh, language as we type our code and uh, this actually speedens up the process very well for us and makes uh, programming in Python uh, and other interpreted languages as well much much easier for us. Python is of course an open source language it's uh, the most bare implementation of Python known as CPython is actually uh, even currently being maintained by a foundation known as the software, Python Software Foundation. So essentially Python is being maintained developed by a group of very talented developers and it's it's open to pretty much anyone to work with and to create libraries for. This allows Python to be an amazing language in the in the modern world because in the modern world we have uh, different issues and different problems in different spheres and domains that we, we would need 
to update our libraries or update our packages that we use in our programming language on a very regular basis. And so Python being an open source language allows us to keep updating and keep up with the times essentially when it comes to solving problems. Now let's go over some of the features of Python. And these features are actually why it's considered that using Python is uh, advantageous over using other languages. So let's start with some of these points. Now, as we mentioned, Python is very, uh, it's a very readable program. Code readability is very important. It's one of the design philosophies behind this when it was being developed. It's very easy to learn, which is why Python is an entry point for many people that are just beginning to learn programming. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a high level language in Python. We, since Python is open source, as, as I had already mentioned, so it gets, it benefits from all the, the benefits you get from any open source technology. Now, it's also portable. So what this means is that if we create a code in, in Python and we create it in a particular system, say on Windows, uh, we don't need to make any changes. If we wanted to use the same script or this, that same piece of code on some other system, say on a Linux system or uh, a Mac system, Python itself comes with a very large standard library. This, this facilitates us uh, a lot because we don't need to uh, create our own libraries or modules or have to download very specific libraries. Most of the problems that we do encounter uh, quite commonly can already be solved by the standard libraries that have already been provided by the developers of Python right right from the beginning. Now later, later on during the course we will uh, encounter what is the meaning of a data structure. A data structure is essentially a manipulation of, a, if, of an object, of an object of data and um, as, as you will see later, uh, Python has one of the most user-friendly data structures uh, that can be found in any language, uh, especially compared to some of its contemporaries. Now, Python is a dynamically programmed language, and this is very important. And what this means is that in most compiler-based languages, we there are certain processes that can only happen during the compilation stage. So what a dynamic programming language does is it takes all those uh, compilation-specific uh, tasks and processes and it, it does it for us as we actually type the code so we don't need to waste time or spend extra time to do something that would otherwise be needed to be only done in compilation we would have to set out specific uh, runtime just for that uh, so this allows us to create our programs and solutions much faster and allows us to debug much easier and uh, yeah so it's a it's, it's a very important feature about python now quickly I will just go over some of the uh, areas of Python where like areas of uh, or, or different domains where Python is very heavily implemented and the first one the first few ones that come to mind are like web development and um, are AI and machine learning so you have technologies like Django and Flask that are uh, built on top of Python that uh, are used extensively for web development when it comes to something like artificial intelligence or machine learning, you have uh, distributions such as Anaconda, you have Pandas, and many other libraries like SciPy and NumPy that are used uh, extensively to sort of tackle problems in this domain. And similarly, Python finds use in most of the scientific work that goes on nowadays uh, because of, uh, again, some of the libraries that I have already mentioned, such as SciPy. Interestingly, if you are into game development or gaming in general, uh, you would see that Python actually has certain libraries and certain uh, technologies that facilitate game development very, very well. One very popular game, in, if in case you are into gaming, is a World of Tanks that is built on Python. Uh, some of the other applications are, of course, desktop, uh, creating desktop GUIs, image processing, graphic design applications, and uh, something that is very relevant to me and, of course, you as well, is uh, creation of education programs and training courses. Uh, there are many technologies in the environment of Python that um, were almost designed for the specific purpose of uh, being able to present certain concepts or to be able to uh, teach certain classes and... Uh, uh, I can't think of too many programs or too many environments outside of Python that are better to solve these uh, education and training course related um, problems and situations. Uh, so I will show you how to install Python on Windows since I have a Windows system. Uh, however, I will also point out uh, the way you, you would have to install Python on, a, on Mac OS or Linux or even on mobile. 
So uh, yeah, let's get started. So to install Python on your Windows computer, it's as simple as going to the website python.org and selecting the download section. When you do click on downloads, you get redirected to this website that, uh, this web page that I'm on, uh, out here. It, by default, it will ask you if you want to download Python 3.9, which is the latest version. But of course, if you, for whatever reason, if you needed a particular version of uh, Python, you can download that as well uh, by just scrolling down and choosing the option that you want. Now, it's important to note that whatever option you choose, of course, I would recommend the latest one. But no matter what option you choose, I would recommend you choose a version of Python 3 point something because uh, previous versions of Python, uh, namely Python 2.7 and uh, and basically every version of Python 2 point something has uh, it will not receive any more maintenance and updates uh, because uh, the developers have decided that python will they, they are trying to shift towards uh, maintaining and updating python 3 point whatever completely right now so yeah let's not delay this uh, any further and let's just download python 3.9 so once you uh, select the option out here uh, you'll be you'll get an installer all you have to do is click on that and it'll give you two options to customize installation or install now i would of course recommend just do install now since you're a beginner do not worry about what a custom installation is if you have multiple drives in your system by default the python will be downloaded into uh, the drive where your windows is actually installed your uh, your main drive so as you can see now that once my setup is done it should give me a pop-up soon so my setup is done for python and this is essentially how you would um, download Python on your Windows system. Uh, but what if you had Mac OS or if you were using Linux? Well, for Mac, it's a, it's actually almost as simple. You just go, uh, if you see out here uh, below this download button, Python option, you get the website asking you, are you looking for Python on a different OS? And it gives you the options of Linux, Mac, and even other OSs. But for Mac, if you wanted, you would just open this tab and just like the windows option you would so choose a version and you would choose an installer for that version so if i wanted say python the latest one i would just download uh, this installer and i would install it in my mac system now when it comes to linux i cannot show you exactly how you would install it there are certain commands that you have to execute but essentially again if you would just choose the linux option out here it would take you to a page with uh, different installers and uh, essentially packages for Linux systems in specific. Uh, what I would recommend to you if you are a Linux user and you need Python is to go over to the realpython.com website and uh, they have a very good uh, essentially instructions on how to install Python. And since I don't have a Linux system, I cannot directly show you how to install Python on Linux. So yeah, if you do have Linux, please head over to this website and uh, this should be of a lot of help to you. Now, uh, as I had mentioned, you can actually install Python on your mobile devices as well. So if you were, say, an iOS user, uh, you would go to the iOS app store and download an app called the Pythonista app for iOS. It essentially is like a full-fledged uh, Python environment where you can develop in Python on your iPhone or even iPad. Uh, and if you were an Android user, you could you would go and download an app called the PyDroid 3. Uh, there's a free version and a paid version for this app. And of course... The difference between the free and paid is that the paid supports uh, code analysis and code prediction. Uh, these are certain details you don't have to worry about right now. And uh, honestly, if uh, I wouldn't uh, worry too much about installing Python on your mobile devices currently, since uh, I am assuming most people would be learning programming and programming in Python on their PCs or laptops. Now that uh, we've mentioned how to install Python, what I had actually shown you was installing uh, what is called an implementation of Python on your system. An implementation is essentially a program or a software or an environment that allows you to actually work in Python. So what I showed you was how to install the by default or the most basic or reference implementation that has been created by the developers, which is actually called CPython. Uh, even though you would not, you would not have seen the word, the letter C or the prefix C. Uh, but yeah, that implementation that I had, I had downloaded myself and I had shown you to download, uh, is actually the C Python implementation, which is Python built on top of C, the, the C language essentially. Uh, there are other implementations such as Iron Python, which uses the .NET framework and JPython that uses Java virtual machines. Uh, 
uh, that you could use uh, if you were interested but again these are things that i would not worry about too much right now so now that we have tackled on how to install your implementation of python i want to introduce what is called a distribution to you uh, this distribution is called anaconda anaconda is a very important distribution especially if you are looking to use python in data science and machine learning and ai which i am assuming is the motivation for many of the people that are actually watching this video that they actually want to move into data science and they need to learn python as a foundation towards the moving towards data science and if if that is your goal or in any case whatever your goal may be i would recommend that uh, you install anaconda distribution now do not get confused between anaconda and python their anaconda is python with uh, in the form of a bundle and this bundle contains not only the basic uh, python implementation that i had shown you to download but it contains a lot of extra libraries and technologies and softwares as well so of course this means that would you need to download both of course not if you download a python you do not need anaconda to work on python and if you have already downloaded anaconda uh, which i will show you how to do it in some time uh, if you have already downloaded anaconda you don't need to download python separately so i'll just speak about anaconda a little briefly so as i said it's a distribution it 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 contains a bundle uh, which includes the basic python implementation and a lot of uh, technologies and softwares and applications that essentially help us to use python in 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 specifically managing the big data applications and uh, data science related projects so so now i will show you actually how to install python i mean anaconda on your system it's as simple it was, it's actually as simple as downloading just the, this thing so if i did a quick quick google of anaconda so the website that i'm looking for is anaconda.com and i'm looking at products and i'm looking at individual edition there are other editions as well like commercial team edition these are for uh, companies usually or uh, for more professional sort of projects so of course we are looking at the individual edition and if you selected this page you would be taken to uh, this particular web page where it will ask you uh, if you want to download and again there are options depending on which machine you are using if you are using a linux you would choose one of these two if you are using mac os you would use one of these two and since i am a windows user and i have a 64 bit system this is the option i would use so again it will it will first download an installer for you and as you can see my installer has been uh, downloaded so now upon opening it it will open up this installation thing you can you can just click next on most of these again if you want to specify your destination folder you can change it here mine will be with a default folder in the c drive and you can leave this unticked you can you can change these options much later so this is how you install anaconda on windows and it's pretty much the same on other systems as well now once it's done i will show you what exactly what are some of the things that anaconda contains that are not there if you uh, installed python like the way i had shown you earlier just the bare bones python implementation so as you can see here my installation is actually complete and uh, now i will open anaconda and i'll show you what how you can actually use this anaconda so if i search for anaconda in my system i would look for something called anaconda navigator to actually get started with this and when i open that it should open something like this so this is what opens when you click on the anaconda navigator and as you can see there are a bunch of applications you don't need to worry about what these mean uh, right now uh, just understand that this this is essentially a bundle of uh, different applications and technologies that come along with just the normal installation of python that you get when you install anaconda navigator now now that we have actually tackled where we've seen how to install and i'm hoping and i would recommend definitely that everyone is watching this video installs anaconda and not just the uh, normal python uh, installation or implementation uh, now that we have gotten all the introductions and the basics and the installations uh, regarding python aside uh, let's get right let's get down to actually creating our first script so now the question is uh, how do we actually start doing the task of creating our first python script how do we how do we realize uh, now that we've installed uh, python like uh, now let's how do we start doing something so the answer to that question is that typically when you're working on python 
the one of the most basic things that you can do is create a python script and execute a script a script is essentially a sequence of commands and instructions that you give for python to run and execute to give you a certain result so i will show you how you can create a python script now there are multiple ways of creating a python script you can create it directly from command line which is obviously something i would not recommend because it is not convenient and easy and it's not very useful for a beginner another way is using a text editor such as the one i have opened right now which is the notepad plus plus text editor now it's very important to not get confused uh, between notepad plus plus and the standard notepad that comes with your uh, windows uh, or wordpad for that matter in fact text editors such as notepad and wordpad um, that you are more familiar with create text and files in a form that is called rich text now rich text is something uh, is text that uh, contains formatting and fonts which is actually a hindrance when it comes to creating actual code so what we need is a text editor that creates or writes text in what we call as plain text uh, plain text is obviously text which does not contain these fonts and these formattings uh, and it only respects white spaces and indentations those two being actually useful towards uh, creating code uh, unlike fonts and formatting which are only a visual thing so Notepad++ is obviously a text editor that creates uh, plain text documents. Uh, that is very that was actually created with uh, programming in mind. Obviously, you can use a bunch of other text editors such as Vim and Atom, and you can Google for these. There are plenty of them. So, uh, without any further ado, let's create our first Python script. So, one of the most common, one of the most famous examples of it. A first program in any program for that matter, not just Python, is creating a print statement that gives us a statement saying "Hello world." So in in Python, this is how you would go about, it, or this is the syntax you would use to create the statement. All right. Now, where it is very important when you are saving your Python program that you use the .py prefix. So, so if I were to save this, I can choose whatever folder I am going to choose. Yeah, this folder seems fine. So now I give the file name over here as say I want to keep it as test. I need to prefix this with .py, and this uh, tells any uh, sort of interpreter or anytime we need to read the script to know that it's a Python script, we need to add a .py. Otherwise, it will not be treated as a Python script. It will be treated as some normal document sort of a thing. So now that I have stored it as .py. Uh, I have created my first Python script. Now, uh, obviously, the next question is: I need to see uh, what happens when I execute this line, when I run this script, essentially. So, to see that, um, there are multiple ways. The first way that I will show you is a command line method, which is obviously, again, before we get into it, it's not something that I will be using to teach you. It's not something I would recommend you to st immediately start using. Um, but for the sake of uh, showing. I will show you how to execute a script in command line. Well, to do this, you go, since I have installed Anaconda in my system and I will be using Anaconda to uh, work in Python, what I will look for is something called the Anaconda prompt. As you can see, this is the option that I get, Anaconda prompt. Uh, this will essentially open you a command line uh, under the environment of Anaconda or Python. So in this, now I am already in the folder, I believe, that had my script. So, uh, how do I call this script or how do I run this script? Well, the command is python space the name of my file, which was test. Of course, the prefix is very important. So I enter test.py. If you, if this was in a different folder, you would have to change your folders in command line, which is again something that I might uh, show you later. But since my file is already in the folder that I am in, in my command line, I would just have to enter this command right now. So if I execute this, as you can see, it's given me an output of hello world, which is, which is what I wanted. I wanted it to print this, uh, these two words. And of course, the command line is now waiting for the next command for me. So this is, uh, one of the most simple ways of, or the most rudimentary ways of executing a Python script. Now, another question would be, well, this isn't the most visually appealing or, uh, not the easy to read or easy to use way of, um, executing scripts. 
and I would agree. And that's why I'm going to introduce a another technology or a software called the IDE. So the IDE in Python or in any programming language stands for Integrated Development Environment. It's essentially a software that not only allows us to run scripts, but it allows us to create the scripts. It allows us to debug. It allows us to see outputs. It allows us to see intermediary outputs. Uh, it allows us to do a wide variety of tools and tasks. And uh, it comes with a bunch of robust features to enhance our Python programming experience. So let's let's see. So I will show you a an IDE called Spider, which comes bundled along with the Anaconda distribution that I had uh, mentioned earlier. So if I open the Anaconda Navigator, as you can see, the Anaconda Navigator shows me a bunch of technologies and options. And I'm looking for something called the Spider IDE, which is over here, as you can see here. It's a scientific Python development environment. Uh, this is exactly what I'm looking for. So I am looking to launch this. So now that I've launched it, you can see out here, this is what an IDE looks like. Now this looks very sophisticated and it's a, it's a one and any, almost any IDE is a wonderful software that where you can create your code, you can debug your code, you can check the results, you can make adjustments, changes, and you can do a wide variety of tasks and functions with relation to your programming. So this is the spider ID in particular, and this is how it looks. Don't worry about the exact details. Just know that on this left hand pane is our current script that is open out here. And out here we will get the results in this, this is what we call a console, a console essentially. So now that we have, we have already created our script in notepad plus plus and I want to open that script and I want to see uh, how an I how it would uh, the result of that script would look in an IDE. So let's just open it so we can browse for our file. And as I had uh, named it test, this is the file over here, I open this. And as you can see out here in the left hand pane, my script has opened and the command that I had given or I had written is out over here. Now if I want to run this application, I press this green button. And as you can see, the result of my, my execution essentially is over here. And it's in slightly small font, but as you can see over here, uh, it says hello world. And it's wait, and the next line is essentially it's, it's waiting for me to do another execution of the script and then it will give me new results. So let's actually give the system new results. So now that I have printed something called hello world, let's, let's change what's written over here. Let's say I will perform basic maths. All right. And let's actually perform the basic maths. Again, don't worry about the details, the syntax, uh, what I'm exactly doing. These are things that we will actually cover in the uh, in upcoming videos and modules. So let's create a variable called A. Let's store a, a number three. Let's create a variable B, store a number five. All right. Let's create another variable C, uh, which will store the result of what's in A and B, in the addition of A and B. All right. And Let's print the result or print what's in uh, this variable C or what's the result of A plus B. I will print a statement saying the result of the addition of three and five is all right. And I will put my result over here. As you can see, uh, I should get the result in this pane. So let's execute this and you can see uh, my first line is executed saying I will perform basic maths and the next line says the result of the addition of three and five is eight. So uh, this in this script, what I've done is I have performed uh, two print statements and I've performed a basic expression, some variable assignments, uh, all of these things we will be doing later. This is uh, what I'm, uh, what I'm essentially trying to show you is that uh, IDEs are a very convenient way of uh, not only creating the scripts, but actually seeing the results and then making adjustments as well. We can come, uh, we can create a completely new script. We don't need to create a script from some special file or text editor. Uh, I can just create a new file here and this is my new script essentially. So I can start working on with this new script right over here from the get go. So IDEs are very powerful. Spider IDE comes uh, bundled with Anaconda. There are uh, other IDEs such as the I idle IDE. Uh, it stands for, um, indicated uh, development and learning environment. So the IDLE uh, IDE comes uh, as part of the uh, basic Python implementation that I had shown you in the previous video, where you, if you just installed a basic uh, Python uh, implementation, it would come along with a basic IDE known as IDLE. 
or integrated development and learning environment. But of course, since we are using Python and this is what I would recommend, uh, it comes with a more robust IDE called Spider, uh, which is actually very, very helpful for scientific uh, and numeric applications um, and was designed specifically with that in mind. Now, uh, this is not the only way we can actually work with Python. There's another very interesting and uh, a very educative method of creating Python, let's say Python programs. And it's something that I will be using extensively throughout this course to explain different concepts. So this technology is called, or this software is called uh, Notebooks. Now, before I get into the details, I will state, I will just open note, uh, a basic notebook. So the notebook that comes as part of Anaconda is called the Jupyter Notebook. And when I open or when I launch the Jupyter Notebook, this is what I get. Now, a very important feature or a yeah, a feature of notebooks is that notebooks uh, are a web browser or a web-based application. So you, it's not something that you can use if you are offline or disconnected. Basically, if you're disconnected from the internet, it is something where which for which you would need an active uh, internet connection. Uh, however, it is way more robust and it has very very good uh, properties that allow it to be used in education or for presentations and such. So as you can see, this is my Jupyter Notebook. These are a bunch of folders. You don't need to worry about what these are right now. I will show you how to create a fresh notebook. So if you go here, now you go to new and you select under notebook, the Python 3 option. It will open you your first notebook. As you can see, um, this line is essentially waiting for me to enter some sort of a command or a statement that I would give in a normal Python thing. Now, if you would have noticed the diff uh, in uh, until now, everything that we were doing involved us uh, creating a script, which was the whole series of commands and functions. So if I go back to my spider IDE, as you can see, like this is a whole script and this script contains multiple different uh, tasks and functions that are individually uh, being performed. So this is a separate print function. This is a separate edition, another separate print function. And for longer uh, programs or larger programs, you like, you have multiple different tasks being uh, done. And if you were using a script, you can only see the result of something like this by executing the whole thing at once. You cannot see exactly like, uh, what is the result of just this print statement or just this? Uh, it's not typically uh, what an IDE is used for. And this is where notebooks come in super handy. Uh, if I had to break down my previous script essentially, where I first did a print statement, where I said some random thing, say hello. Yeah, so if I execute this particular line, you can see it gives me the result. Now I want to do what is five plus three. It should give me the result over here, eight. Now the next, another part of your program might be storing five and three into variables. So I can do this. And I can do this. So now this line will store the variables. Now I want to do the addition of what is five plus three, but I want to use the variables and I want to see what's the result. As you can see, a plus b means five plus three, which is eight. And I've essentially broken down various different parts of my previous script into, into its individual tasks. And I'm able to see what each part of that script does. And this is very good when it comes to uh, making presentations or uh, trying to teach a class. So, I will personally be using notebooks a lot to explain different, different concepts of, um, different concepts when it comes to Python. And I would recommend that you get used to, uh, notebooks in general because, uh, it's an amazing way to learn Python programming or programming in general, in fact. And again, as I had mentioned earlier, notebooks are something that it's an online uh, application. It's a web-based application. So I will have to need a active internet connection to be able to work on a notebook, which could be a disadvantage if you do not have a consistent internet connection. And in that case, you would probably use your IDEs or text editors, which you can be used offline as well. In this video, we will be introduced to the concept of variables and expressions. Let's start with expressions. Well, an expression in Python is anything that results in a value. Its difference Although the difference between an expression and a standard statement in Python is that a statement in Python is something that results in an action or an execution of a command. There is no calculation per se or any sort of uh, manipulation or 
as I said earlier, calculation resulting in between two different, say, numbers or other objects that results in a value. And this happens in the case of an expression. So, for example, if I were to add two numbers, say 5 plus 10, this is an expression which should where two objects 5 and 10 are being added and a result is being given to me, which is 15. Now, let's see an example of a statement. Well, a statement could be something like a print statement. So, when I ask Python to print something for me, it's not calculating anything, it's not evaluating anything, it's simply performing an action that I have, or a command that I have given the system, which is to print whatever I have entered over here, as you can see. So, this is a statement. Similarly, there are uh, another type of statement known as assignment statements, which we will learn actually right in the next section. Well, let's move on to variables right now. Now, earlier, you might have learned about objects in Python. So, objects are essentially data uh, that we can work with or manipulate in Python. Now, variables are a place to store these different objects. Um, usually, uh, it's much easier to store objects in Python instead of using the objects explicitly themselves because objects may be very compu complicated, whereas variables are very simple to use and very simply, uh, very, uh, are named in a very simple manner so that we can use them quite often in our programs. Now, it's important to note that in Python, we do not have to explicitly declare or define a variable to create them. In fact, variables are created in the same statement where we assign some object to that variable. In Python, the assignment of variables happens using the assignment operator, which is the equals to sign. So, if I were to if I wanted to assign a number, say 100, to a variable, say b, well, it would be as simple as doing this. Now, anytime I want to know what is stored in b, I just have to enter b, and I will get the value that is stored in it. And we can store different types of objects inside a, any variable. Let's say I store, I want to store this particular word in the form of a string. Now, this is stored in x, and if I want to know what is in x, I can just see what is here, and it's a string hello, which I had stored earlier. Now, it's very important that we follow certain naming rules when it comes to naming our variables in Python, or else we may be thrown errors or we might get some problems in our program. So, the first rule is that you cannot start your variable name with a number. So, if I were to give a variable name like for num is equal to something, say, the same string hello, this would be an illegal variable name and I will get an error when I try this. So, if I were to choose in num4 is equal to hello, this would be perfectly fine. I won't get an error. The second rule is we are not allowed to use any non-alphanumeric characters except the underscore character while naming our variable. So, for example, if I were to name my variable num underscore 4 and I say I said random, some random string, this is perfectly fine. However, if I change num underscore 4 to num hyphen 4, this will throw me an error, as you can see over here. Next, the third rule is that variable names are case sensitive. So, if, we, if I have a variable called num or say num, if this was one of my variables and I stored say the value 50, this is not the same as me writing num all in capitals and say storing some other value 60. These are two different variables. So, it's very important that when you name your variables, you are aware of what case you are writing them in because Python variables are case sensitive. Now, the final and probably one of the most important rules in Python is that you're not allowed to use what we call reserve words in Python. Now, Python has a bunch of reserve words. These words essentially are performed or they are used to perform certain special functions and are used as identifiers for certain special functions in Python that we that have a special purpose, like that particular word has a special purpose within the Python programming language and we cannot use them to name our variables. So, a list of them, as you can see over here, some of them are like false, def, if, uh, del, raise, and there are like, uh, there are around 33 of them. And uh, sometimes some of these words are taken out, sometimes there are more words added as Python gets updated. Now, let's, let's move on to a concept uh, where we Try to really understand well, what do we mean by storing data inside a variable. Now, when I say that we are storing something inside a variable, you get an image or you get an idea in your head that this variable is like a container where we store or we put a particular 
object inside it. So does this mean that variables have a place in the memory? Are they also an object that is placed in the memory where we can put other objects inside of? Well, I'll show you an example where this idea is kind of disproven or where I'll show you that the idea of variable is kind of different than what we understand by storing something inside a variable. Now, let's say I'm storing the same object. Uh, I will take this object as some random number, let's say 100, and I'm going to store it into two different variables. So I take x is equal to 100 over here, and in the next line, I will store 100 in y as well. Now, if objects were, I mean, if variables were objects that we placed in our system, then x and y should have two different IDs. But let's see what happens when I check the ID of X and the ID of Y. They should be different in case variables were their own objects. However, as you can see, the ID of X and the ID of Y are exactly the same. So, well, obviously we know that two different objects in Python cannot have the same ID. So does this, so what does this mean when it comes to the nature of a variable? Well, the, the fact is that variables are not actually objects in Python. In fact, variables are more like pointers or references to the actual object. So when I said x is equal to 100 and y is equal to 100, what I'm actually telling the system is that there is this variable name called x that I want to refer or point towards the actual object that is in my memory called 100. And I do the same thing with another, another variable y. So I am not exactly creating a, a different space in my system for these variables. These variables are more like placeholders or references that point to a particular place in the memory where this object is located. And that is what happens when I do ID of X and ID of Y. It's not giving me the ID of something called X or the ID of something called Y. It's giving me the ID of 100 each time because 100 is stored in X and Y. So as you can see, this is something like a visual representation of what I'm trying to say. And similarly, if, if I were to, so in this example on the left, as you can see, I've used the uh, value of 50 to explain my point. So as you can see, initially X and Y are pointing towards this value 50 because I have stored 50 and 50 in both X and Y. Now, what if I changed the object that is stored in X? Well, that means X is now pointing towards this new object and I've stored this new object called hello, the string called hello, as you can see here. So now X is pointing to a new object in the system and it's called hello. And uh, I haven't changed anything with respect to Y, so Y will point towards the same thing. And I can also make the pointer of Y different. Or what I'm trying to say is I can store something else in Y. See, I stored this list in Y, 50, 60, and 100. And when I do that, now Y is pointing towards a different object in Python. And X is also pointing towards something else. So what happens to this object 50? Well, now that there's no variable referring to this object 50, it becomes what we call an orphaned object. And we can actually see that when we do the ID of X, now let's go back to my example on the right where I stored X is equal to 100. So as you can see, it, it gives me some ID represented by this number. Now let's say I stored X, I stored something different in X, say 200. Now if I do the ID of X, it should give me a different ID because as you can see, the values are different. And this is because this object 200 is what is stored in X. And when I do the ID of X, I'm actually getting the ID of this new object now, 200. So as you can see, point, as you can see, variables are, they, they should be, and they are treated more like references or pointers uh, instead of containers for a particular object. In this video, you will be introduced to the concept of objects in Python. Now, what are objects in Python? Well, all the data that we manipulate or use in our operations in our code are represented as objects or relations between objects. So if you want an example, two numbers that you add in your code, well, both of them are objects and they're usually numeric type objects. Similarly, if you want to store someone's name or an address of your hometown in your code, you usually store it in a form of text. And that text is also an object, usually a string. Similarly, you might want to create a container of different smaller objects inside them. And that big container is also a type of an object. And one of those containers are called lists. And similarly, we have many different types of objects, which we will be covering during the duration of this course. The following pictorial representation 
gives us a broad classification of different Python data types and objects. As we can see, there are five broad classifications. Numeric, which contains integers, complex numbers, and floats. We have the dictionary data type. We have the Boolean, which essentially consists of objects that have only two valid values, true or false. Then we have sets, and we have sequence data types, such as strings, lists, and tuples. Every object in Python has three important properties that kind of define that particular object. They are its identity, its type, and its value. The identity of an object is, it can be considered as a place in the memory or its address in the memory where an object is stored. An object's identity does not change once it has been created. So for example, if I took an example of, say, a string called hello, I can use the id function, which is, this is how you use the id function, to find out the id of this object. And it should be, uh, the answer should be in the form of uh, a particular long integer. So as you can see, the id of hello is this integer, 23264766230024. Similarly, all objects in Python have an identity. We have another operation with uh, regarding the identity of an object is the is operator. And the is operator compares the identity of two objects. So if two objects have the same identity, it should give the answer true, otherwise false. Now the next property of objects is the type. The type of an object is essentially uh, what defines what kind of values and operations that that object can have. So for example, a numeric data type in Python, such as an integer, would allow us to do arithmetic operations. And similarly, string object type in Python will allow us to do concatenation operations. Much like its identity, the type of an object cannot be changed as well. Now let's see what's the type of that particular object that I had shown you above. As you can see, it should be string. str stands for string. Similarly, if I did a type for a number, say 50, it should give me int, as you can see. Now the third property of an object in Python is its value. Now the value is the actual data that is contained in the object. It's the thing that we use, that we display, that we can manipulate, and that we can perform operations on. So for example, if I were to talk about this string, this string is hello. So the value of the string is the word or the sequence of letters that spell out hello. And similarly, this particular object is a numeric object with the value 50. Let's see, in this, in this pictorial representation, I have shown you that you can assume this dark blue area as the memory of the system. Now within this memory, we have objects created called 50 and hello, and this list containing smaller objects called cat, pen, and 40. Now, what I'm trying to show you here is each of these objects have a type, an ID, and a value. And let's see what they are. So if I wanted to see, as we had already seen the type of 50, now let's find the ID of 50. As you can see, we get this unique ID for the object 50, which is obviously not the same as the ID of the object hello above. And the value of this object is the value of 50 itself. So that was a brief introduction into objects in Python. In this video, we will cover the topics of numeric object types and type conversions in Python. So let's get started. Numeric object types in Python are a broad classification of objects. Plenty of common real-life applications that we associate with numerals, such as arithmetic operations and calculus, are done in Python using numeric object data types. There are three main types of numerals or numeric data types in Python. They are integers, float, and complex. Integers, as the name suggests, represent all integer values in Python. These can be such as 100, minus 3, 305, and so on. Floats are used to represent numerals that contain decimal points, such as 100.3, 3.9, 4.8, minus 6.8, and so on. Then there is the complex object type, which is used to represent complex numbers in Python. And this is an example of a complex number, 3 plus 7j. This is a complex number 3 plus 7j, where the real component is 3, and the imaginary component is 7. All complex numbers have a real and an imaginary component, and this is how we denote them. Now it's important to note that this j is a very common symbol in maths and engineering used to denote the ima imaginary portion of a complex number. And it's the same in Python as well. So moving on, 
Let's talk about type conversion in Python. Type conversion refers to the conversion of an object from one data type to another, for example from string to an integer. And there are different types of conversions and let's go through some of them. First of all, let's consider the conversion of something to an integer. And more specifically, let's consider the example where we convert a string to an integer. So let's consider my example string to be some something called 145 and I'm storing this within a string for a reason because I want to convert a string to an integer. So as you can see I have stored this 145 within my uh, within a variable x and if I were to confirm that it is actually an integer I can use the type function and see that it is actually an integer str. Now let's convert this into an integer using the int function. So how would we use it is simply passing the int uh, sim by passing the variable that we want to convert into the int function. And as you can see, this is what I've done over here, but before this, I will also store it into another variable. All right, now let's see what's in y. Well, y gives us one, four, five, but are we sure that it's an int? We can just check it by using the type function. And as you can see, the type gives us uh, the answer int. That means that we've converted the string to an int. Interestingly, we can convert something and also specify what base we have to treat the number as. By default, when we pass something in the int function, the program or Python will treat whatever we have passed uh, within the string as something in base of decimal. But what if we were to pass something that is, well, not in a decimal? Well, we could do it like this. Now let's store y and in y, let's store. Let's do this and I will show you what this means x and I will give a comma and 8. What this tells Python is, well, I want to convert the string in x into an integer, but I want to treat whatever is in x as a number of base 8. So 145 is actually 145 in the base 8. Now when we see what's in y, we get 101, which is different to 145 because, well, 101 is actually the decimal equivalent of 145 in the base 8. Similarly, if we were to give it in the base 2, we would just replace 8 with 2 over here. Now next, let's talk about converting something to a float. Now as we know, float is just simply something that has a decimal point. So let's convert an integer into a float. How would we do that? Simply by using the float function. So if I gave 120 and I pass this integer through the float function, I should get 120.0. These two are not the same, though they may mean the same things to us, but in for Python, 120 is an integer and 120.0 is a different object, which is a float. And this is how we convert something to a float. Now, what if we wanted to convert an integer to a string? Well, we can use the str function. We can also use the hex and the oct function if we want to convert a particular number to a hexadecimal or an octal string, respectively. Let's look at all three examples. Say I have a number 688 and I want to convert this into a string. I just use the str function around this. So as we know, just to confirm, let's see what the type of 688 is. This is, this should be an int as we can see. But when we pass, when we, let's say uh, we convert it into a string 688 and let's store it into some variable. Let's call it a. All right. Now let's see what's an a. It gives us 688 in the form of a string, but we can confirm by checking the type of A. It is an str, so it is a string. Similarly, we can use hex if we wanted to convert an integer into its hexadecimal equivalent in the, in, 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 as an output of a string. As you can see, this comp, this sort of, this sort of complicated thing is actually telling us that we have converted 688 in terms of hexadecimals. Now, how do we read this output? This zero should not be treated as anything. It's more like a, an identifier, which says that the letter after this first zero is the base of this whole number. So it's saying that X, X stands for hexadecimal. So it's saying that 2B0 is to be treated as a hexadecimal number. And if you did basic maths, uh, you would find that the decimal equivalent of 2b0 is 688. 
Similarly, if I did oct, if I use the oct function for 688, it will give me the result something like this. So again, how to read this? The first zero is to be treated as an identifier and not part of the number. What it's saying is the letter after the first or after this zero is the base of the number following these two, uh, following these two characters. So as you can see, as you can see, what's this saying is that this whole number is an oct represented by this letter O and the number itself that we are dealing with is 1260. And 1260 in octal system is the equivalent of 688 in the decimal system. So this is how we've converted a, an integer in, uh, an integer into a hexadecimal or a, an octal string. Now what if we wanted to convert two, uh, numeric objects into a complex data object? Well, for that, we can use the complex function. As you can see here, if I passed complex 5 and say, um, say something like 3.1. Let's see what this gives us. As you can see, it gives us an, uh, a complex object where uh, our real part is 5 and our imaginary part is 3.1. So what this does is essentially, uh, you pass two numbers. The first one is the real component and the second is the uh, imaginary component. It combines to give you a complex number, as you can see here. Now let's look at some other type conversions. The next type we will be talking about is converting something to a tuple or a set or a list. So what if I wanted to convert a string into a tuple? I will use the tuple function. And uh, as you can see over here, so let's say I have a string called random. Let's call it random. All right. Now, if I want to convert this to a tuple, I will use the tuple function. As you can see over here, the output will give me tuples where each individual component of this tuple are the individual components or the individual characters of my string random. Similarly, if I wanted to convert the string to a list, I would use the list function. And this will give me a list of the individual characters of the word or the, uh, the string random. And I could do the same thing with the set function to create a set of individual characters of uh, the string random, as you can see here. So yeah, these were some of the basic Python uh, type conversions that I have shown you. As we learn about more complex data types and different object types in Python, we will learn different uh, type conversions and functions associated with them. In this video, you will be introduced to the concept of strings. Strings are an object type in Python used to store textual data. This textual data could be something like, for example, someone's name. It could be an address of a place, or it could be something like a word or a sentence. Now, strings in Python are an object type that is actually a subtype of a broader classification of objects called sequences. Sequences are objects in Python which contain components placed one after the other, where each component is given what we call an index, a numeric index. This numeric index identifies the component in the sequence and its position within the sequence. Now, since Python is a zero index based language, the first object of any sequence is always index zero. The second is index one, the third is index two and so on. Now let's move on to defining strings. How do we define them? Well, strings are defined using what we call delimiters and delimiters occur in pairs, an opening and a closing delimiter. In Python, these delimiters are pairs of single or double quotes. So for example, if I were to use single quotes to define a string, I could, I would do it like this. This is a string. As you can see, this is a string is printed over here. And this is delimited using single quotes. Similarly, if I were to define a string using double quotes, it's as simple as doing this. This is also a, as you can see. Now a valid question arises. What if I wanted to include a single quote within my string? Well, if I tried to, Let's see what happens if I try to print a statement with a single quote naturally inside it. So say I'm saying it's my birthday. All right. Let's see what happens if I try to print this statement. It says an invalid syntax. And this is because as I had mentioned in Python, single quotes and double quotes are delimiters. So they have a special function in Python and we cannot simply just use them within a string because Python will treat them specially for a special purpose. So what Python will do is it will pair this and this 
delimiter, so single quotes, and say, okay, this looks like a string to me. And it's not going to understand the rest of this. And then it'll find a random single quote and it won't find its pair. And it will basically throw us an error because of this. So one way or one workaround to introduce single quotes into a string is simply to delimit our string itself using the other type of delimiter or double quotes. So if I want to include a single quote, I will close my string using double quotes. So if I did this instead of what I had done earlier, this is a perfectly valid and legal way of defining my string. And I could, I would do the opposite if I had to introduce say double quotes within my string. I would use single quotes to close it. So if I were to write a speech statement, she said, I am hungry. All right. I have, I want these two double quotes to essentially show that this is a speech and I'm going to close the string using single quotes. And this is a valid way of doing it. As you can see, my string has this two double quotes. Now, I had mentioned that strings are sequences. Well, let's describe how are they sequences. So first of all, all sequences in Python are a, a um, it's a, essentially a sequence of smaller objects that form the sequence, right? So let's try to understand like how do, how are strings to be treated as sequences? Some sequences that we will learn later are like lists or tuples. And in all sequences, we can retrieve any particular object or component in that sequence using its index. And how do we use indexes in Python? Well, we enclose a numeric index within square brackets. Now let's see what I'm trying to talk about by this example. Now say I'm storing a particular string called say random within. Well, now my variable name here is test and I'm storing the string random within it. All right. And this is a way of retrieving a particular uh, index from test. I write the variable name and then next to it, I put the square brackets. Now I'm supposed to put um, a numeral within the square brackets to uh, tell Python like what uh, particular index I'm looking for. So let's try zero. Now, as I said, Python is zero index based language. So the zero index essentially means the first part of or the first component of a sequence. So let's see what happens when I ask Python to retrieve the first part of uh, what is stored in test. It gives me the string R. In fact, it's just one character R and it's a string. So as you can see, it has given me the first character of the string random, which is R. So what this shows is that this string random is essentially a collection or a sequence of one character strings. So this is, so random is essentially a collection of the string R, the string A, the string n and so on together combined to form the whole string that we call random. Similarly, if I wanted the character at the third position of this thing, I would use, well, since it's the third position and since we're working in Python, I would use the index two and it should give me the letter n. As you can see, it's given me the letter n. So this is how we can show that uh, strings are also sequences in Python. Well, now let's move on to um, certain string operations and functions that we can perform. Well, as you have seen already that we can retrieve any particular character within a, um, within a string using numeric indexes. Well, what if we wanted to know what index is a particular character at? And we can do it like this. We use the index function. So let's say my test and I want to know where or what position the character D is in my string random. So this is how I would use the index function index. And within the index, say I'm looking for the character D and now I, it should give me the answer zero, one, two. It should give me the answer three. So if I execute this, it gives me the index three. So this is, uh, the index function that we can use for our strings. Now, what if we want to, um, say slice a string into a, into its, uh, into a smaller part? We want to slice it and we want to retrieve only that particular slice. Well, here is an example. Say I'm going to, I'm going to use the same string called uh, random and it's stored in test, right? So let's, so one way of, uh, so the way of doing this is like this. Now let's see what this, let's just see what this does first. As you can see, it's given me a and D. And if I went to my string random, a and D is this particular slice. Now let's try to understand what I have done by entering one colon four. Well, what this has done is, it's retrieved a slice from 
the first position, uh, the first index, which is the character A, up until the fourth position, which is the character O, but it has not included O. So it's very important when I index like this, every, every time I put something to the right of this colon, I am not including this itself. All right. So it's essentially one, when I say, uh, one colon four, what I'm telling Python is give me the first, the second and the third character, but not the fourth one. So it's given me A, N and D. And it's, that's, this is how we do a slicing operation in Python. Similarly, if I were to say slice from the first, if I wanted only the first and the second character, I would do, and this is what I would do. If I wanted the first and the second character, I would do one, two, three. So this way it tells Python that I want the first, I want the second, but not the third of, so as you can see, I get A and N. Now, so this is a basic slicing. What if I wanted the portion of a string from a particular point all the way to the right or all the way to the left? Well, let's consider the example of where I want the portion of the string random from the say fourth character until the left. Well, the way I would do this is test. Now, since I want it all the way to the left, I don't enter any index to the left of my colon sign. And since I want everything to the left of the fourth character, I enter four here. So as you can see, it gives me A, R, A, N, D, which is everything from the fourth character of my string random to the left. Similarly, if I wanted something to the right of it, I would just do it like this. I would enter some index here and I would leave the portion to the right of the colon blank. So this will give me everything, including the third character, since this is how we treat the uh, indexing in Python, everything including the third character all the way to the right. So this is DOM, as you can see. Now another perfectly valid um, slicing is, say I want to slice or take out uh, different characters from the string, but I want to skip certain characters. Like I want this one, then I want to skip one, and I want to take the next one, and then I want to skip one. Well, in that case, we have to introduce a step. So one way of doing this is, now how do we read this? So as you can see, I've written zero colon six colon two. So what this is telling Python is, I want every character from my string test, uh, starting from the zeroth character up until the sixth, but not including the sixth after skipping or taking two at a time. Taking two at a time can also be assumed as, uh, skipping one at each step or skipping one character at each step. So what this will do is it will go to random. It will take the zeroth one. It will take R and then it will skip the next one. So it will not consider A and then it will pick N and then it will not consider D and then it will consider O up until the sixth character, whichever that may, whichever that may be. And if you see the output, it gives us R and O, which is exactly what we wanted. We wanted R, we wanted N, we wanted O, where we skipped uh, A and D or we skipped the every second character essentially. So this is a way of um, slicing strings while also skipping certain characters or skipping characters and steps. Now Python is also an, in, uh, there's another interesting technique that we can use in Python to uh, where we can start retrieving characters from the rightmost side of uh, a sequence or a string. Uh, we can use negative indexes. So if I were to, for example, show you, let's see what this, what this gives me test. What, what is a minus one index? It gives me the character M. Now remember a string is random. So minus one gave us the last character of the string, uh, random, which was M. So this is a way of using negative indexes. And similarly, if I used test minus two, it would give me the second last character, which should be the character O, as you can see here. Now there are some other important functions that uh, you may use in Python. So for that, let's create another, let's create another string. Let's call it upper, lower, all right. Now I'm sorting it again in the same variable test. Uh, let's see what happens when I use the upper function and what happens when I use the lower function. Now I'm gonna use the lower function for this. So these two functions will respectively give us or give us the result or give us our string in uppercase and lowercase respectively. So as you can see, the upper function created the first string in full uppercase and the second one created this, uh, this string in full lowercase. Now another important and probably one of the most important methods that we use for strings, especially when it comes to data science is the split function. So let's see what I mean by split function. Let me create another 
string let's call it hello world all right and i'm going to use a split function and i'm going to see what happens when i use this function essentially so what i'm doing in these in this these three lines is i'm creating the string hello world i am storing it in test and then i am using the split function on the test and whatever result i get i'm storing another variable called sliced and then i'm just going to show you what is in sliced as you can see what's happened to the string hello world is that i have broken it into its components or its component words if that makes any sense into hello and world and i've stored both of these into what we call a list now you might ask well how does python know that it has to separate at a blank space well the split function by default will uh, break up a string at its blank spaces but if we wanted we could break it up using or add every comma so for example if i wrote hello world using comma and if i put a comma inside over here and now if i try to execute this like for example uh, i am going to find i'm going to look for commas in the string and then i'm going to try to sp split it as you can see there's no splitting happening i have one list with my original string itself because it's not found a comma what if i introduced a comma over here now let's see what happens as you can see the splitting has happened it's found this comma and it's called a split between hello and world similarly if i in my string if i put a comma again and i put something else it should give me the split over there again so we can define our split using some whatever we put in between these uh, circle brackets after the split function it's just important to note that by default if in case we do not enter anything over here it will use blank spaces to do the splitting uh, another very important operation and very common operation in strings is what we call concatenation so if i have two strings first and say another string second and i want to join these together well the operator i would use to do this is called the plus symbol this is the concatenating operator when it comes to strings so what is the result of this let's see let's print this out let's print this whole thing and let's see what is the result as you can see what uh, this has done is it has combined the first string first and the string second into one string called first second so this is the concatenate concatenation operator now finally uh, the last topic in this lesson is the topic of escape sequences now escape sequences are special commands that tell python to either suppress special meaning of some character or symbol in a string or give or give the special or give some special meaning to an otherwise ordinary character um, in a string so let's look at the first example now remember my in my for earlier in this video where i was i was telling you like uh, what what is the way of writing or how do we introduce single quotes or double quotes into a string and i had told you the trick if i want to use a single quote in my string uh, i just close it using double quotes or if i want to use a double quote i close it using single well another way of doing this is using what we call an escape sequence and an escape sequence in python is the backslash character all right so let's see what happens when i use the backslash character where i want to introduce my single quote so if i use my previous example where i wanted to introduce a single quote and say uh, i am going to close it using single quotes as uh, uh, as well so i'm going to go back to my error example so as to speak now this would throw me an error right as you can see it has thrown me an error so what if i used the escape sequence that i mentioned the escape sequence is just the backslash character now this is the point of the string where i want my my single quote so i introduce a backslash now i have my single quote and i continue writing the rest of my statement let's close the string now will this work as you can see this has worked so what this has done is this backslash character has told python um to not treat this uh, special character or the single quote to not treat it specially and let it be as a part of the string so as you can see that's what's happened here now the next case or the other uh use case of escape sequences is when we want to give a particular character that is otherwise just ordinary some special meaning so um let's take the example of the character t and the character n we use the character t to introduce tab space um and we use the character n to introduce what we call line break well let's see by an example so normally the character t has no special function so the character t within a string will just uh, be outputted as the character t itself however as you can see here i'm going to introduce a backslash before this character t let's see what it does it introduces this 
thing that we call a tab space, which is a larger than normal space. Similarly, if I were to use the uh, backslash n combination, this would introduce what we call a line break. And if you were to see the output of this, you can see at the point of the string where I have this combination of backslash n, a line break has occurred. So uh, there are plenty of other escape sequences that you may choose to learn. And uh, these are just two of the probably the most common ones that are used. So yeah, this was an introduction into strings in Python. In this video, I will give you an introduction into lists and tuples. Starting off with lists, lists are a collection of ordered arbit arbitrary objects that are similar to what we call an array in other programming languages, but lists are way more flexible when it comes to Python. Python lists are a type of sequence and we might have, you might have seen what a sequence is when we were learning about strings. And much like in sequences or any other sequence, list objects are assigned a numerical index. And whenever we want to uh, manipulate an object in a list, we use its respective index. How do we define lists? The lists are defined using square brackets. So this is a simple way uh, or a simple list that I have just created and assigned to a variable a, which contains three objects, one, two, and three. Let's talk about some of the features of Python lists. Python lists are ordered. And what this means is that even if two lists contain the exact same elements, if they, if the elements are placed in a different order, the two lists are actually unique and different. And I can check that over here. I have created a list one, two, and three. And say if I create another list two and one and three, the same elements were in different order. I will use the is function to check whether these two lists are the same. And if they are the same, when I use is function, it should give me the value or the answer true. And if they're not the same, it should give me the value false. And as you can see, I get the value false because even though I have two lists with the same elements, they are in different orders. And so they are different. And that's what we mean by lists are ordered. The next property for lists are that they can be manipulated using their indexes or the elements and the objects inside a list can be manipulated using the indexes. And we will see that in the section where I show you list operations. The next property is lists are mutable. What this means is that once we create a list object, we can actually make changes and modify them without having to create a new list object. The next property is that lists are dynamic. And what this means is that as we are making or as we are programming, we can actually make changes to an already created list as we are uh, programming without having to go through a compilation stage. So if we had to say increase the or we had to add certain elements to an already created list, that original list grows in size to accommodate for these new elements. The next property is that lists can uh, contain any arbitrary objects. So if I created a list right now, where say if I want to store some numbers, say some floating point numbers now, and I can put strings as well into my list. All of these are valid uh, when it comes to objects that can be put inside a list. We have no such restrictions. So we can put any arbitrary objects inside our list. The final property that I want to talk about is that lists are, uh, they can be nested to any arbitrary depth. What this means is that I can put a list within a list and I can keep nesting it essentially by putting a as many lists I want within my list and I'm only essentially restricted by my system's memory. So if I created a list like this and within this, say I put another list and within this list, I put another list. I can keep going on to by uh, keep going on doing this and I'm only restricted by the memory of my system that I'm using. So moving on, let's move on and talk about some important list operations that we will be doing when it comes to lists. So let's create a basic list called A where I'm storing six numbers. So now say if I want to retrieve a particular element, say if I want to find out what's on the index three, this is how I would do it. If I wanted a slice of my original list and much like strings, I do it the same way. So what this does is it tells Python that I want all the elements of list A from index one to index four, but not including index four. So it'll give me one, two and three index uh, objects. So it should give me two, three, and four in this case, as you can see here, two, three, and four. I can do the same thing by considering elements, say two at a time. If I wanted to 
consider elements or consider every second element what i would do is this syntax i would use this syntax and when i give this command to python what it tells what it understands is i want every element from a from index 1 to index 4 but not including index 4 but i am going to consider two uh, every second uh, uh, element essentially so what it will do is it will go here and then it will skip one and then go here and then skip one and that's essentially what we uh, what it's essentially what we call st uh, uh, slicing by using strides so i'm taking strides i'm not considering elements consecutively but i'm skipping certain elements in between if i wanted to consider every third element i would change this to three and fourth element i would change this to four all right so let's see what happens when i take every second element it should give it should give me uh it will consider say from one to index three right so it should consider essentially this section but since it's going to skip one it's going to consider this skip this and then consider this it should give me two and four as you can see it has given me two and four and like in other uh, sequences we can use negative indexes as well negative indexing essentially starts uh, looking from the right hand side of the list so when i say a minus one it's essentially looking at the last element of the list so it gives me the sixth uh, or the last element which is the which is the object six if i did a minus two it gives me the second last element similarly another neat trick that we can use for sequences is the following syntax double colon and we give a minus one what this tells the what this tells the system is i want the list a but with all the elements reversed so as you can see i get my element uh my list a but the elements have been reversed right now let's move on to uh concatenation and replication well concatenation much like in strings is done by using the plus sign so as we know on either side of the plus sign should be two similar objects so if i'm doing a plus something a being a list on the other side it should be a list as well so let's add a list like this now let's see what's in a as you can see my original list has uh seven eight nine added to it and i can also add things to the beginning of a list similarly so if i wanted to add say zero you know at the beginning of a list i just do it like this and i get the element zero added to it it's very important to note that i i i actually added zero within a list because if i did zero like this it will throw me an error because like this zero is just an int object and it's not a list but when i put the square brackets i make it a list and then this concatenation becomes valid because a is also a list similarly if i did a star 2 this is essentially replication or a replication function where i'm repeating the values in a twice if i did a star 3 it's the same function uh, but now i'll have the elements repeated thrice as you can see here let's move on to modifying list values uh, this also shows the mutable property of lists that i had mentioned earlier so let's consider this example so I created a list with elements where there's the three strings, eggs, apples, and carrots, and I have uh, five int objects, one, two, three, four, and five. Now, if I wanted to change, say, the first element, all I have to do is take the zeroth index, and say if I want to replace eggs with, uh, say, mango, this is how I would do it. Now I've replaced eggs with mango. If I check what's in B, you can see the eggs have been replaced with the element mango. Similarly, I can use the slice syntax to replace uh, a particular slice from my list with uh, a slice essentially. So let's look at this. Um, I'm replacing, I want to replace the first three elements. I want to replace mango. I want to replace apple and carrot. So what I will do is I will consider this since this carrot is the second index. So I will consider zero to three because the third is not counted. Now I'm going to replace this with three different, um, let's see, kiwi and say sponge. Now let's check what's in B. You can see my three elements have been replaced. In fact, I don't have to replace like for like. If I want to replace, say, three elements with only one or two elements, that is also possible. So now if I want to replace the first three elements, kiwi, orange, and sponge, with um, just one element, this is how I'll do it. Let's say wine now let's check what's here as you can see three elements have been replaced with one mine i can do it vice versa as well i can replace smaller number of elements with a larger number of elements but here there is a 
slight caveat that I want to show you. So an obvious way of doing this would be, say if I wanted to replace the first element wine with three different elements, an obvious way would be just consider the, that elements index and then put whatever objects you want. Say I want to add instead of wine, I want to add beer, I want to add ball and say club. Yeah. Well, let's see what happens. Now, if I say B, check what's inside my, well, you can see my elements have been added, but they seem to have been added as is, you know, uh, I had entered a list over here and that whole list has been replaced, uh, or this wine has been replaced by this whole list in the first position. But that's not exactly what I wanted. I wanted the elements within this list to be individually placed into my list. And the way to do that is not this syntax, but actually what I'm going to show you now. If I want to replace one, if I want to replace the index or the object at index zero, I would give this statement a slice statement where I will give zero colon one. So when I do this, and if I, um, so let's create my old scenario again, where I had wine and I had one, two, three, four, and five. Now, if I do this B zero, but I give a slice, then this slice is essentially a single object slice. It's essentially the zeroth index again, but because of this uh, formatting or this, this type of syntax that I'm using, what Python will do is now when I say beer and ball and club, now what Python will do is it will not consider this whole list and add it to in place of uh, wine or whatever I want to replace. It will actually consider the elements inside of this individually and then replace. So if you see here, now if you see my list, I actually have the, uh, I've removed wine and in place of it, I've put beer, ball and club, but these three are actually individual objects within my list and not objects within a list that is then placed within my original list. So this is an important caveat that uh, you should take note of. So moving on, let's talk about certain methods associated to lists. Let's take a simple list now, one, two, and three. The first operation that I want to show you, or the first method is the append method. So when I do a append and say, if I want to append the list by one object called four, I just do it like this. Now let's see what's an A. I put, so as you can see, the append has put the object four into my original list. Now say if I wanted to append three different objects, I want to append five, six, and seven. Now let's see what append function does. Oh no, as you can see, it's done a similar operation to what we have seen earlier when we gave a single index or the single element replacement uh, that we saw earlier. It essentially put this whole list into this particular spot into the list. And this is not what I wanted. I wanted five, six, and seven to be individually placed. And we do have a way of doing that. And the way to do that is the extend function. That is what I'll show you next. Now, if I want to extend, say the original list by three different elements, eight, nine, 10, when I use the extend function, it will not put this whole thing. It will consider each object inside this thing individually and then add it to A. So if you see my result, this is exactly what I wanted. Now, the next method that I want to discuss is the remove method. So the remove method is uh, what you, how you use it is within the parenthesis, you put the object that is present in the list that you want removed. So you don't give an index over here, you give the object itself. So if I want the object eight, all right, this number, if I want eight itself removed, what I will do is put the value eight here and it will remove it from my list. So if I check my list A, as you can see, the value eight has, uh, it's gone. And next, uh, another similar function to remove is the pop function. Now the pop function by default will remove the rightmost value from the list. But unlike remove, the pop function actually outputs a value. Uh, and that value is what we have popped out of the list. So by default, it will pop out the right route, rightmost value of a list or rightmost element of a list. And in this case, that element is 10. So it should give me 10. But of course, if we want to pop out any particular object, in this case, we do not give that particular object, we give its index. So now say if I want to remove this, uh, this list object from my bigger list, um, as I can see, it's in index zero, one, two, three, fourth, it's the fourth index. 
So if I want to remove the list, which is at the fourth index, I give the index value inside the parenthesis and it pops that out for me, as you can see over here. So this was it for lists. Let's move on to tuples next. So tuples are another ordered collection of objects, much like lists, but they differ from lists in two key properties. First of all, the uh, tuples are defined using parentheses instead of square brackets. So this is how I would define a tuple with elements one, two, and three. And the next very important property that is different or that uh, differentiates tuples from lists is that tuples are immutable. And what this means is that once we create an object of type tuple, we cannot make any modifications to it. We would have to only create a new object if we wanted something different. And this is obviously a key difference between a tuple and a list. But apart from this, uh, every operation that we have done on lists are actually possible to do in the case of tuples as well. So any operation that we did to lists that did not modify the list or that does not do any modification, we can actually apply to tuples as well. So if I wanted the first element of this tuple, all I have to do is call it by the index zero. It should give me the value one, as you can see. If I wanted a slice, I can do that as well. It should give me two and three. And if I wanted to reverse my tuple, well, I can use my same neat trick technique that I've used for lists and that I can use for sequence, I mean strings as well. So it gives me my old tuple, but with the elements reversed. So now the natural question is, why do we use tuples over lists? Well, one important difference is that when we, con when we make a program execution where, or where we are manipulating a tuple, if we did the same thing, for the exact same objects in uh, that if, if it were present in a list, uh, it would be much faster in a tuple. Essentially, program execution is just faster on tuples when compared to an identical list. So use tuples over lists when we want to be efficient while we are creating an ordered list of objects. So whenever we create an order, ordered list of objects that we don't need to or we don't want to make any further modifications to, we don't need to create a list, we can create a tuple. And another very important area where we use tuples over list or why we need a tuple instead of a list is uh, when we are using dictionaries. Dictionaries, as we will see later, is a data type in Python that needs an immutable component uh, while we are creating the dictionary. So if we want to use uh, something that is like a list, but since lists are mutable, we can use a tuple instead and use that when we are creating our dictionary. And we will see like what, uh, what I mean by, uh, the, the immutable component for a dictionary when we actually, uh, learn about dictionaries. But yeah, these are some of the places where we would use a tuple over a list. Uh, a brief section on tuple unpacking and packing is what I would be doing right now. And what that means is that when I create, when I give this sort of a statement, you can assume this to be me packing this tuple into a object or a variable t. Now what's very interesting is, and this is something that's very key to tuples, is that I can unpack a tuple onto another tuple. So let me show you what I mean by that. So now that I have packed one, two, three, and four tuple into t, let's unpack it into another tuple. Let's call this Let's uh, put these elements into this tuple and I put this into T. All right. Now let's see what I mean by unpacking something onto something. Let's see what's the, what, what, what happens when I put A. If I just want to see what's in A, it actually gives me the value one. If I see what's in B, it gives me the value two. If I see what's in three, it gives me value three and D gives me value four. So essentially, if you think of it, what I have done is I have matched this tuple then put it into T and then put that tuple T into this tuple A, B, and C, D. So what it's, what, what has happened essentially is the element A has been, uh, or a better way to say this would be the element one has been packed onto or unpacked onto A, two has been unpacked onto B, three has been unpacked onto C, four has been unpacked onto D. To show you what I've done in a single line is essentially this. This is essentially what I've done. I have assigned one to A, two to B, three to C, four to D. I have matched these two tuples together like this. And this is a very neat feature of uh, tuples. 
The only only uh, important thing that you have to keep in mind is the elements on this tuple and the elements on this tuple uh, should be equal. So if there are four elements here, there should be four elements here. All right. I, in fact, another very important thing about or a neat feature is that we don't really need to mention the parentheses when we're doing this uh, unpacking or packing. So if I did X comma Y comma Z, if I did it like this, if I put say five and six and seven, this is also a valid way of packing and unpacking. So now if I see what's the value in X, it is actually five. If I see what's the value in Y, it is six. If I see what is the value of X and Z, it should give me a tuple containing five and seven as you can see over here. So this is a neat feature of tuples called packing and unpacking. So yeah, in this video, we will cover concepts surrounding dictionaries. Dictionaries are another type of composite data type in Python that are also a collection of objects, much like tuples and lists. And like lists, they are also mutable, dynamic, and can be nested. However, a key difference and property of dictionaries is that they are unordered. Items in dictionaries are paired using keys, unlike in lists and tuples where the objects are assigned numerical indexes. To define a dictionary, we use curly braces. Each key value pair in this dictionary in a dictionary is separated using commas, and the key and values themselves in a pair are separated using a colon. Let's look at an example. This is a dictionary where I have three key value pairs. As you can see, they have been separated by colons, and each of a pair themselves are separated by commas. And these are enclosed in curly braces to define the whole dictionary. In this uh, example, these are the keys, banana, apple, and grape. And their respective values are yellow, red, and green. So this is very important that in this particular uh, data type, we have what we call a key. And that key is assigned a value. And we can have multiple such pairings. And we have three such pairs in this particular example. Another example or the uh, or another type of way to define a dictionary is using the dict function. This is how we use it. As you can see, I have inputted two value or two object tuples. This is a tuple, this is a tuple, and this is a tuple. And when I use it in a dict function, uh, when I place it within a list, what Python will do is it will consider the first element of each tuple as a key and the second element of each tuple as its respective value. Now if I check what's in D, as you can see the key banana has a value yellow, the key apple has a value red, the key grape has a value green. So this is another way of defining dictionaries. An important note over here is that the, the objects that we use for keys have to be of an immutable data type. So we cannot use, for example, lists uh, as an example of keys. But we can use, say, integers or strings for our dictionary keys. Also, keys have to be unique when it comes to a dictionary. You cannot have two different keys with, uh, or should I say, the same key having two different values. You can have only one key, and that one key will have a unique value assigned to it. Duplicate keys are not allowed. However, when we speak about values, we have no such restrictions. You can have a mutable or an immutable data type as a value in a dictionary. And you can have duplicates as well. So if I created a dictionary with a key, say, banana, and if I gave, if I associated with it a value green, I cannot create another key banana and associate a value yellow. Let's see what happens when I actually do this. If you actually see what has happened here is, Python has considered the second case. So it's, it first looks at the first pair and goes, okay, so my dictionary has a key banana with a value green. But right after it, it sees another key banana with a value yellow. So it overwrites my first key banana with the second key. And it overwrites the first value green with the second value. And we essentially get one key banana with the second value yellow. So obviously, this is, uh, Python does this to avoid duplicacies. However, if I created a dictionary with a key banana again, if I created, I gave it a value yellow or say green, and if I created another key, and if I gave this also a value green, this is perfectly fine and this will not, nothing special will happen in this case because values do not have to follow such rules. 
let's speak or let's see certain dictionary op operations and functions now. So let's uh, bring back our original dictionary which we had created earlier with the three pairs. All right. So what if I wanted to, we can use keys to uh, essentially do these operations and functions. Let's see what happens when we, so much like how we use sequence, how we use indexes in example of sequences, we use keys when it comes to dictionary. So let's see what happens when we use a key over here. So we, as we know, banana is a key in this dictionary. Let's see what happens when we do, where we give this command. It actually gives the value associated with that key, which is yellow. What if we wanted to change a particular value associated to a particular key? I would give, I would do this. I would give the key and assign it uh, the value that I want to change it with. All right. Now, if I check my dictionary, you can see the key banana no more has yellow value, but the value gold. What if I wanted to add a new pair, you know, a new key with a new value completely. I would do it pretty much the same, same way as I did in the previous step. I would, um, essentially write my new key, whatever I wanted. Say if I wanted a new key called watermelon, I would assign it a value red. And now if I check my dictionary at the end of the dictionary, you will see that my, uh, new key pair key value pair has been added watermelon red, as you can see over here. Now, what if I wanted to remove, if I wanted to remove a key value pair from my dictionary, I can use the delete function, which is uh, called by using this, the del function. Now, how do I do it? Say if I want to remove the key value apple and red. So all I have to do is do del d and within square brackets, I have to only mention the key. I don't even need to mention the value, just the key. So you can probably draw parallels in how we use indexes when it comes to lists and tuples and even strings and how we use keys when it comes to dictionaries. They are quite similar. So if I did this and if I, um, oops, I think red is actually not a key. As you can see, red is a value. My key is apple actually. It's not red, it's apple as you can see. Now, if I see my dictionary, the key apple and its value red has been removed. So these are some of the operations that we can do for dictionaries using keys. What if we wanted to use certain inbuilt functions that are associated with dictionaries? Well, some of the examples are as follows. There is a get function. When we use the get function, all we have to do is uh, enter a key inside the parenthesis and it will get the value associated with that key. So if I gave the key grape, let's see what value is associated with it. As you can see, it's green. Uh, there is also a function called items that returns the key and value pairs in our dictionary as a list of two object tuples, where the first object is the uh, key and the second object is a tuple. So let's see what it does. As you can see, it gave me a uh, list. And in this list, the uh, objects inside the list are two object tuples, where the first object is always the key and the second is the value. And it's the same for each of the tuples. So this is what items function does. Let's see what uh, the next. So the next function is keys. Let's see what the keys function does. As you can see, it returns a list of all the unique keys within our list. I mean, within our dictionary. Similarly, we can, there is a function for values as well. And as you can see, it returns all of the different values that are present in our dictionary in the form of a list. Also, it's important to note that if we have a particular value that has occurred multiple times in a dictionary, it will appear as many times it has occurred in the dictionary or appeared in the dictionary in our list over here when we use the value function. So if say a particular value, say I had another key where its value was green again. So I would have the value green appear in this list once more, essentially. Our next function is pop item. What this does is much like the pop function in lists, it gives us the last entered um, key value pair that is present in our uh, dictionary. So the last entered pair was watermelon uh, key watermelon with the value red. And that's what has uh, popped out when we give this function. Another important function 
associated with dictionaries is the update function. And the update function is a very neat function that is used to merge two dictionaries together. So say if I had a dictionary, let's say I'm creating a dictionary using the dict function where I have say some key called kiwi. So as I had mentioned, I will use two object tuples in this case. And um, let's say I give this also a value green. All right. And another pair would be say mango and let's give it a value yellow. All right. So this is another dictionary that we have created. As you can see over here, we have created a dictionary with a key called kiwi with value green and another key mango with a value yellow. And I already have a dictionary D with uh, these values. All right. Now, if I want to merge these two dictionaries, I can use the update function. What I do is say if I want to merge D with X or X with D, uh, only the ordering will change. And that doesn't really matter when it comes to dictionaries. So if I want to merge D with X, I use D update and then inside it, I put my target dictionary. Now, when I check what's in D, I have the, the, the dictionary X and its key value pairs uh, merged inside my original dictionary D. As you can see, I have my original ones here and I have the merged ones over here. So this was the update function. In this uh, brief video, I will explain what we call the type hierarchy or the standard type hierarchy in Python. It, it's also known as the data model in Python and it probably has other names. So essentially in the, what we do or what we speak about in this is uh, how the different types that we use in Python are categorized and classified and what are their subtypes. So it's important to note before we continue further that there in future versions of Python, there might be new types that are introduced or the existing ones may be modified. But it's safe to say that what I will speak about in this video will still form the core of what we call Python standard type hierarchy. So let's begin. So the first type is the none type. Uh, it's accessed through the built-in name none. Its truth value is false. It's essentially used to denote um, functions or it's, it's returned as the value for functions that don't really return anything. So if you have an expression or a function that returns no particular value, you actually get a data type called none. That is how Python uh, interprets it. Uh, then there is the ellipses. Uh, ellipses is something that you might encounter later. Uh, it is accessed through the built-in name ellipses. Um, it is used to indicate the presence of this particular um, syntax, this particular symbol or expression uh, or syntax in a slice. Its truth value is true. Again, don't worry too much about ellipses right now. Next is numbers. And numbers is something that we are very familiar with. We have seen, we've worked with numbers a lot. They are an immutable type. They are created through numeric literals and they are the outputs of arithmetic expressions and built-in arithmetic functions. Its subtypes are integers, floating point numbers, and complex numbers. Um, within integers, you have plain integers that represent numbers in the range uh, this number and this number. So this, this number is basically the largest positive value that you can represent using 32-bit notation in two's complement. And this is the equivalent uh, for the, the negative, the negative side. Long integers, on the other hand, are used to represent numbers in an unlimited range that is only subject to the available memory of your system. So these are two types of integers. And as we know, floating point numbers represent machine level double precision floating point numbers or numbers with a decimal point and a component after that. Complex numbers are numbers that contain a floating point number that represents a real part and a floating point number that represents a an imaginary part. So these are the types of numbers. Then we have sequences. Sequences are finite ordered sets indexed uh, by natural numbers. So each element in a sequence has an index and that index is a natural number. The different types of sequences are based on the mutability, whether the objects can be changed or not is essentially what we mean by mutability, right? Once we create an object, whether we can modify it or not, uh, that is how we differentiate different types of sequences. So there are uh, mutable and there are immutable types. Now, the different types of immutable ones are strings. We know what strings are. They are sequences that contain characters. Unicode is the other immutable sequence. And then there are tuples. Uh, tuples are 
uh, collection of arbitrary Python objects and Unicodes are uh, sequences that contain Unicode characters. Then we have mutable sequences and uh, there is only one, currently there is only one built-in uh, mutable sequence in Python and that is lists. Uh, lists are also again collection of arbitrary Python objects. Finally we have, uh, well not finally, but next we have mappings and mappings are uh, again um, sets of uh, objects but these objects are now indexed using arbitrary index sets you know the difference between a mapping and a sequence you could consider um, sequences are ordered but mappings are not ordered and uh, the indexes given to the objects and sequences are always numbers they're natural numbers whereas in mappings they are not natural numbers but they are uh, certain arbitrary objects that we can set for ourselves Again, in Python, there is only one built-in uh, standard uh, mapping type, and that is the dictionary. Dictionaries are, they, are, they represent finite sets of objects indexed by nearly arbitrary values. The only condition is that these indexes must be of an immutable data type. So these, uh, so what I have mentioned until now, are probably the most common data types that we encounter, uh, or that we have encountered now. The next types are like, callable types such as user-defined functions, user-defined methods, built-in functions, built-in methods, classes and class instances. So again, callable types as a whole are uh, referenced using the call function and this is something that we will learn when we start learning about functions, when we learn about object-oriented programming uh, and methods and functions and such. The other type are modules. So modules are uh, module objects or modules essentially are referenced or called using the import function. Again, modules can be considered as these large libraries or larger pieces of code or applications that we, uh, that contain various different methods and functions and objects and classes within them. Um, again, modules are something that we will think about a little later. Files are data types that are called using the open function. So anytime we, and as we will during the course of this uh, tutorial, we, or during the course of this, uh, this this course essentially we will be working with a lot of files these some of these files are text files some of them are comma separated files so all of these files that we open using uh, the function open or some other certain uh, specific functions uh, where we create file objects out of these files these are what we call file data types uh, finally there are internal types that are used by python interpreter again this is something that uh, does not concern us right now but just know that uh, the interpreter for Python uh, uses these uh, data types for its functioning. So this was again, this was a very brief um, introduction or explanation into Python uh, type hierarchy. In this video, I will show you some of the categories of operations that are possible in Python. So let's start off. So the first category of operations are arithmetic operations. And as you can see in this table, there are different types such as addition, subtraction, multiplication. So let's go over them one by one. So a simple addition operation would be like five plus six, giving me the value 11. I can do five minus three, and that's subtraction. Similarly, I can do a multiplication using five, say five into two. There's division where I use the backslash so say I did division of 8 divided by 2. Now you might encounter another type of division which is called the floor division where we use a double backslash. And what this does is it returns us the largest whole number that is lesser than the result of our division. Uh, so the division difference between the float division and, and the normal floored and uh, the floor division or the single and the back, double backslash is this. Say I did 9 divided by 2 using a single backslash, it should give me, as you can see, 4.5, right? So this is the actual value. Now let's see what happens when I do 9 double backslash 2. It will give me 4, which is the largest number lesser than or equal to 4.5. That is also a whole number. So this is uh, what we call floor division, essentially. Finally, we also have, uh, if we want to raise something to the power of something. So if I want to do five, say 6 raised to the power 3, so I would use double asterisk, and this is how I would do it. It'll give me 216 as you can see uh, if I wanted remainder between the division between two different numbers I will use the percentage sign so if I wanted the remainder of the division between 7 and 3 this is how I would do it 
I get the answer 1 as you can see. So next category of operations are logical operations. The first one is the logical AND operation where we use the operator AND. Alright. So let's see uh, what we mean by this. I am creating. So as we know the AND operation returns a value true if both the operands are true. So let's actually let's actually do this for an example. Let's give this variable the value true. And this the value false. So it should be done like this. False. So now uh, think of it like 1 and 0. So 1 and 0 is obviously 0, right? So if I did A and B, I should get the answer false or 0. Because I'm doing true and false. So it's like doing 1 and 0. So if you see this, I should get the answer false. So if I change this to true as well. Now if I do this, I will get the answer true. As you can see. Uh, the next logical operation is the OR operation where, well, um, logical OR is if either of the operands are true, then we should get the uh, answer to our OR operation as true as well. So in this case, obviously, if I did OR over here, it will naturally give us true. If I change this to false, it should again give us true and it will only give us false if both are false. As you can see here, now it's false. The next operation is the logical not. Uh, it's done by using the not operator. So in this case, the value that we get uh, is true if the operand is false. So let's take a. As we know, a is false over here. So if I did not a, I should get the answer true. But if I change this to true, now if I do not a, I should get false as you can see. So this was the uh, logical operations. Let's move on to the next set of operations that is comparison operations. So there are a bunch of them. Let's go over them one by one. If I want to check if two operands are equal. So if I did x is say equal to 2 and now y is equal to 3. If I want to check if they are equal, I will use the double equals to sign. And if um, they are equal, I will get the value true. If they aren't, it will I'll get value false. As you can see, since x is 2 and y is 3. As you can see, x and y are not the same. So there's false. They are not equal. If I change this also to 2, now I will get the answer to another. The next uh, comparison is the uh, not equal to or where we use the exclamation sign. So over here, this is this um, the result of this is true if x and y are not actually it's the same. So I should get false over here as you can see. But if I change this to say 5, now I will get true because x is not equal to y in this case. The next one is greater than. So if I did x greater than y as we can see 2 is not greater than 5 i will get false over here similarly there's a lesser than if i did x lesser than y i should get true over here as you can see well, there's also a greater than or equal to and lesser than or equal to we simply add the equal to sign here so let's see now if i say x is lesser than or equal to 3 i should get true because x is 2 i sh and if i put 2 here i should also get true but what if I put 1 here? Since x is equal to 2 and 2 is not less than or equal to 1, this is a false statement. And I can do the same thing with like this using the greater than or equal to. Now it's true because 2 is actually greater than or equal to 1. And so this was comparison operations. The next set of operations that we can do in Python are assignment operations. We've already seen a whole bunch. We've already been assigning values to variables. We've been doing assignments throughout already. But let's go over them and see some of the assignment operations. So as we already know, the equal to operation is uh, assigning everything that is on the or the value on the right hand side of the equal to sign to what is on the left. So if I did a is equal to 5 plus 6, it will assign the value 5 plus 6 or 11 to a. Let's check what's in a. As you can see, it is 11. There is a plus equal to sign. And what this does is, so for example, if I did uh, say a now since a is 11 let's create another variable called b and call this 5 all right so now if i did a plus equal to b what this will do is it will add b to a and then store it in a so let's see what this does once i do this now let's check what's in a it should be 5 plus 11 as you can see 16 so this a plus this, so this plus equal to sign is essentially the same as doing a is equal to a plus b it's essentially the same thing they're both the same uh, there's a similar thing for this, the negative sim uh, or subtraction as well, minus equal to. So now that a is 16 and b is still 5, of course, if I did minus equal to b, 
Now I'm subtracting the value 5 from 16. So I should get a is equal to 11 again, as you can see here. And this is the equivalent of doing a minus b. a is equal to a minus b, I mean, as you can see. So uh, the next similar like assignment operation, let's create a is equal to say 6 in this case and say b is equal to, I will say 2. All right. Now if I do a star, star equal to b, what this does is it multiplies b to a and then assigns it back to a. So if I see what's in a now, it should be 12 as you can see here. Similarly, there is similar thing for subtraction as well. So if I did a is equal to 6 and b is equal to 2, and if I did a, sorry for division. So if I did a division symbol and the equal to sign and then if I give b, what it will do is it will divide a by b or 6 by 2 and it will assign that back to a. So my value in a should be 3. As you can see here, 3.0, obviously, this is a single uh, single backslash, so this is a float division. The resultant of a single backslash is always a float. I can do the same thing with a double backslash. So, let's see if I did a is equal to 7 now, and then b is equal to 3. Now, if I did a double backslash equal to b, now it will do the same division, but uh, it will do a floor function. So, it should give me 2 in this case. If I did the same thing, uh, with a single backslash to just to show you the difference between single backslash and double backslash division. In this case, it will give me um, the value around 2.3 or something, a float basically, 2.33 as you can see here. Then there is the modulus. You can use the modulus sign as well with this assignment. Um, say a is equal to say 5 now, b is equal to 2. Now if I do a percentage symbol equal to 2, I mean b it should give me, it will assign the, uh, it will take the modulus in both sides and then assign it to the left hand uh, operand. Now let's see what's in A. As you can see, it, it did uh, A divided by 2. The modulus symbol is basically the remainder of the division between two objects. So in this case, it will divide A by B and then give me the remainder and then put that remainder back in A. And as you can see, the remainder of 5 divided by 2 is 1. And we get that over here. Similarly, we can also do exponential. So if I have a is equal to say so 5, b is equal to 2, and I want to raise a by, if I want to raise the value of a by the value of b, and then store that back in a, this is how I would do it. So it should be 5 to the power 2, which is 25, as you can see here. So this is assignment operations. So finally, we move on to uh, two special sets of operators. One is the identity set, identity operators, and the other is the membership operators. Uh, let's look at the identity operators. So when we talk about identity operators, what we when what we mean is the is and the is not operator. So what the is operator does is it checks whether two operands uh, have the same location in their memory essentially. This does not mean that it does not check for whether two objects have the same value and this is very important. So let's look at this. If a is equal to 1001 and b is equal to 1000 plus 1. All right, if I did A is equal to 2, this is an equality check. Are they the same values? True. Now if I say A is B, let's see what happens. As you can see, it's false. This is because this object and this object are not the same. And this is what the is operation does. Uh, we can confirm this by checking the ID of A. The ID of A gives us some value like this. And the ID of B gives us as you can see, a different value. So the two objects are not located in the same place in the memory as we have seen using the id function and that is what we check uh, through the is operator. And the is not is essentially just the opposite of that. So, so that is the identity operator. Now the membership operator is used for checking whether something is present in a sequence or not. So let's create a sequence. I will create a list to show in this example. My list is one, Two and three. Basically, simple list with three integer objects, one, two, and three. I will check whether now say two in A. So is two in A? If it is, it will give me true, as you can see. Is five in A? It should give me false because five is not in A. And the not in operator is just the opposite of that. It checks the other condition essentially. So this is the membership operators in Python. In this video, I will be speaking about what precedence or what importance each operator has when you use multiple of them in a particular statement or a command. This is what we call operator precedence. So of course there's confusion 
when we don't know which operator has precedence over the other. And in Python, there is a strict precedence that is followed in such scenarios. So this table gives us the precedence. So as we can see, the, the uh, operators at the top are at the lowest precedence. And as we go down, we get operators with higher precedence over the ones above them. So the low of the operators that we have seen, the OR operator, the AND and the NOT have the lowest precedence. So OR, AND and NOT. And then we have comparisons and identity operators such as the equal to equal to sign, the, the exclamation equal to sign. So these operators come at the next level. Then you have addition and subtraction followed by multiplication division, modulus and floor division. And finally, the highest precedence of all the operators that we have seen till now is the exponentiation or the double asterisk. So let's see a couple of examples that explain this point a little more. So as we can see in this line, we have 20 plus, then there's a 5, an asterisk 3 minus 25. And we want to know like, okay, what is the precedence in this case? So as we know, we have the plus sign, we have the minus sign, and we have the asterisk sign. So we have addition, subtraction, and multiplication. So which one will take precedence over the other? Well, let's uh, refer to this table. As you can see, the addition and subtraction have lesser precedence over multiplication. So this multiplication will happen first. So we actually do 5 into 3 first. We get 15. After that, we do plus and minus. So we get 5 into 3, 15. Then we add it, or we can subtract it with 25. That does not matter. So we do 5 into 3, 15. And then we do 20 plus 15, which is 35 minus 25. So uh, we should get an answer 10. As you can see, we do get the answer 10. Another example would be uh, where we have this plus symbol, we have a double asterisk talking which shows uh, exponentiation and a subtraction and a division. So again, as we know, exponentiation has the highest precedence. So in this whole operation or this whole expression, we first do uh, the operation associated with the exponential. So we do 5 to the power 2 or 5 exponented, ex exponentiated by the power 2. So we have 5 to the power 2, which is 25. Now we look at, okay, once we have that, we still have a addition and we still have a subtraction and we still have a division symbol. And as we know, division takes precedence over addition and subtraction over here. So once we do this, we finally move on to this step where we do the division of 6 divided by 2, where we get 3. So we have 25 from this, 5 to the power 2, which is 25. And we have 3 over here. So now we do 20 plus 25 which is 45 minus 3, which is 42. And then as you can see, that is the answer over here. Let's look at um, the precedences when it comes to certain of the certain um, comparisons or uh, the logical operations or the comparison operations, so as to speak. So I've created a variable called season with the string summer. I have created the variable age with the value uh, with the string 10. So you don't need to put it in a string. So I have the int object 10. And I have the color, uh, a variable called color with the string pink. Now I'm going to see in this line, uh, I'm going to do an if and else statement. So if you don't know what an if and else statement is, just follow along with me. So what this does is, if this condition is met, I will print this statement. Otherwise, else, I will print this statement. Now what is this first condition? It is saying season equal to equal to summer whether this variable is equal to the string value or as we know about the or operation age is equal to this and color is equal to equal to pink so as we can see in our uh, comparisons and our lo uh, logical operations the precedence for or and and not is or is the lowest precedence uh, and is above that and then not is above that in this we have the or and we have the and so of course the first check is the AND function. So it's going to check whether this whole condition and this condition are, uh, it's going to come, it's going to do that operation. So it's going to do this and this. So is color pink? Color is indeed pink. Okay. So this, this part is true. Now let's see if this part is true as well. Now, once we're going to check whether this is true or not, what we need to see, see is, uh, this condition itself has an OR statement. So the first part of it is saying, is season summer season is indeed summer as you can see here next part is saying is 
age greater than zero. But this does not matter since the OR function just needs one of the operands to be true. And in this case, this is true. In this case, it is also true. So this is, this whole statement is true as well. So once we have this statement as true and then this statement as true, we can, we finally move on to, we come back to this AND statement and we say since both the operations or both the operands, I mean, are true, the resultant of this AND should also be true. And since this is true, this whole condition, we actually move into this section of our ins if else condition where we say, okay, we can uh, do this statement, this print statement, and we do not have to print this particular thing. So uh, our answer should be, our result should be the uh, printing of this string, this string, okay. And as you can see, the okay string is actually what is printed over here. So this is uh, an example on operator precedence. Of course, it's it always helps to, you know, try to fiddle around on your own, uh, create random expressions out of like out of the top of your head and see how exactly Python is uh, evaluating that and try to understand and break it, break it down on your own. And this is probably the best practice you can do to understand operator precedence. In this video, we will be looking at the math module in Python and we will look at some of the math functions that are associated with this module in Python. So starting off, what is this math module? Well, uh, the Python math module is an important library or a feature that is uh, designed to deal with mathematical operations. This math module is part of the basic Python installation, so you don't have to install this separately. Uh, you, to use this math module, all you have to do is import this uh, module, and this is how you would do it. You just do import math, and this will import your math module for you to use in your programming. And in this, in the course of this video, I will be showing you certain um, concepts surrounding the math module, such as what are the constants that come with the math module, some of the arithmetic functions, the logarithmetic functions, um, power functions, and even trigonometric functions that we can do using this math module and the functions inside the math module. So uh, starting off, let's uh, look at some of the constants that are part of this. So as you can see, the standard constants that are available uh, in this module are pi, there is tau, there is Euler's number, NAN, which is a special, it's a, it's a programming specific concept, and infinity. Uh, so let's look at these one by one. So starting off, uh, our first constant is pi. Um, Pi is, as you know, in maths, it's the ratio of the, of a circle's circumference to its diameter. And, uh, pi is an irrational number. Uh, you know, the value of pi is 3.14 something. Since it's an irrational number, it does not, we cannot, uh, define it in terms of a specific fraction, but it can be approximated to the fraction 22 by 7. So how do we access this, um, pi constant is as simple as this. Once you have imported maths, uh, the maths module, all you have to do is do maths.py and it will give you the value as you can see. So as you can see, the value returned to us is a float. This is important to note. And the number of, number of decimal digits, uh, the number of digits after the decimal point that we can see here are 15. And this is like a by default, uh, thing for Python that if you call the pi constant, it will give you the value of pi correct up to 15 decimal points. So an example of where we can use this thing is say we have the radius of a circle three it can be in any units three meters or whatever you want um, and you want to find out its uh, say circumference so as we know the circumference of a circle is two pi r so if i had to find the uh, circumference of a circle in my say in my code for some application with the radius three or all i would have to do is use the formula two pi r and uh, to call the value 2 pi r, instead of specifically writing 3.14 something, I can just use this function math dot pi over here. And then I can enter the r, as you can see, it will return me the radius, as you can see. So moving on, uh, the next constant that we will talk about is tau. Tau is uh, similar to pi. In fact, tau is the ratio of a uh, circle circumference to its radius. Pi is the ratio of a circle circumference to its diameter and tau is the ratio of a circle's circumference to its radius. It's uh, important to note this difference. So because of this definition, tau is always two times the value of pi. This is by definition. And uh, much like pi, if you call the tau constant in you from the math module, it will also return you a float number. And uh, to find that, this is the function that we use. Or this is the syntax. 
So as you can see, this is this is actually two times the value of pi, 6.283. And even this is returned correct up to 15 uh, places to the right of the decimal point, and this is by default. Uh, next constant is the Euler's number. Uh, the Euler's number is a, it's one of the most widespread constants used in the world of science, uh, in the scientific community, in the mathematical community. Um, you will be using the uh, Euler's number probably a lot as a, if, if you move into data science or AI or something like that. So what is the Euler's number? It is, uh, it is the base of the natural logarithm. If you know what the natural logarithm is, it is used to calculate rates of growth or rates of decay and as with numbers or constants like pi and tau even the Euler's number is an irrational number with infinite decimal places uh, the value of uh, the Euler's number uh, in short it's denoted by the small letter e uh, so this value of e is or, uh, usually approximated to around 2.718 so how do we call this uh, constant is simply as math dot e this is how we do it. So you get this value. Again, this is also a float and it's correct up to 15 decimal places. So the next concept that we will be talking about is infinity. Now infinity is a, it's more of a mathematical concept and this is very important to note because infinity doesn't, it's not really a number. There is no number called infinity. It is, it is used to define something that is infinitely large or infinitely small. So positive infinity is something that uh, is higher than any known number to us. And a negative infinity is lower than any known number to us. Um, so this is the concept of infinity. And how do we call this uh, function? Well, so let's see what happens when we call the math function math constant infinity. So this is how we do it. And as you can see, it will return us this. Um, it might look like a string to you, but this is actually a special type in Python, um, which is not a string. This is also a float. It's a type of a float. In fact, this uh, infinity value, it's, it's, a, it's like a special data type. It's a special data type that you can, you can consider as an equivalent to a float, but um, it's not, it's not a typical float that we know, like, you know, 3.14 or 2.71. The value of math.inf will give us um, inf. And this is, this inf is actually not a string. So we can, we can confirm that over here. As you can see, when I do a type, when I check the type, you see it's actually a float. In fact, this was recently added in Python 3.5, um, a special type known as uh, math.inf. Um, it returns this inf data type, um, which is equivalent to a float. And, uh, so this is, this is how we use infinity. If you wanted to get the uh, value of say minus infinity, all you would have to do is math.inf with a minus sign preceding this uh, constant and you will get minus inf. Now let's check if uh, the concepts or the properties of infinity are uh, maintained, you know, like every a positive infinity is greater than any number that we know and uh, negative infinity is greater than any number that we know. So let's just confirm this. Um, so I will take math.inf and I will do a check. Uh, is this greater than say some really large number, something that comes off the top of my head immediately. Okay. So let's see if it's, if this is true, then, uh, this is conceptually correct. And as you can see, it is true. In fact, I can change this number to anything as large as I want. This will be true because infinity is true, is larger than any number that we know. Uh, and similarly, if I did minus math dot in, uh, inf, uh, and I checked some very small number, you know, a very, very small negative number. So just consider some minus, uh, 10 to the power something, right? This should also be true. Uh, sorry. It should be in a smaller sense symbol. This should also be true because I'm checking minus infinity. It's smaller than any known number to us. And it is true as you can see. So uh, it's very, uh, also if you did a, if you did something like, so let's say if we do, uh, let's add something to this, you know, it's a number. So we should be able to do arithmetic on this. Let's actually see what happens when I add say 10 to positive infinity. It actually gives us the same value back infinity because uh, intuitively we know that infinity plus anything is still going to be infinity, right? And this is exactly what Python does for us. Even if we add a number to this uh, math.inf or the infinity constant in Python, it will still give us uh, the same value, the same data type of inf or infinity. Similarly, if we subtracted something from the negative of math.inf, you know, um, say minus, say again, let's say minus 100. So if you subtract something from minus infinity, we're technically still minus infinity itself. So this will again give us minus and minus inf, as you can see. And this is uh, absolutely what we need. And this is a very, very interesting feature in Python. Uh, finally, the last uh, 
constant that we will discuss is the NAN or the not a number constant. So this is not really a mathematical constant. Uh, there is no constant in maths called not a number. This is a computer science related concept that uh, it's, it's used to, sh it's used to de denote invalid inputs or in, uh, it's used to indicate a certain places where say a variable that should have a number um, it's been corrupted for whatever reason and it it now has a text or a symbol and our code throws an error then in these in these cases where uh, python expects a number from us or from your code and it does not get it it will throw you a nan um, value and this is usually used in cases where you have errors in your code so uh, again just to check like what this this constant like how to call it this is how you actually do it math.nan and it will give you a data type called nan also much like the infinity constant let's see what's the type of this um this constant again it might look like a string to you but of course this is not a string this is a, num a nu numerical concept and as you can see it's still a float so this is like um it's another special uh data type that was created for specifically this case where uh it's some it's the equivalent of a float but um, it's not really the typical float that we are uh, that we associate with. So this was uh, constants in the math module. So our next topic will be arithmetic functions that we can do in the uh, using the math module. So some of the common arithmetic functions that are available to us are factorials, um, the ceiling operation, floor operation. Uh, there's permutations, there's combinations. You can find the greatest common divisor or the GCD and the LCM or the least common multiple and you can truncate numbers. So let's look at them one by one. So starting off with the factorial operation, the factorial operation is done using the factorial function as you can see here. Actually it's defined like this, math.factorial. All right, so now what we pass in between the parentheses will be uh, what we calculate the factorial for. Uh, as you know, factorial is, so factorial is always for a positive integer and the factorial for say a number 10 would mean 10, times 9, times 8, times 7, so on, until the number 1. Obviously, factorial is only defined for positive integers. Uh, it is not defined for uh, negative values, or it's, uh, and it's also not defined for decimal values. So, uh, let's see, let's look at an example. So, as we know, um, so let's say we pass maths.factorial for 6, and let's see what's the value. So, uh, this is exactly what we expect. So, we expect the value of 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2, uh, that is actually 720. Let's see what happens when we pass 0. This should give us 1, since we know 0 factorial is 1. Now let's see an error case where we pass, say, minus 5. As you can see, this will throw us an error because factorials are not defined for negative numbers. Now moving on, let's, uh, so the next function that we'll talk about is the ceiling function. So the ceiling function is defined using math.seal, seal as you see here. So, again, we pass the number that we want the ceiling for in between the parentheses. So, what is the ceiling function? It gives you the largest, uh, sorry, excuse me. It gives you the smallest number that is uh, greater than or equal to what we pass over here. So, for an example, if I gave you 6.6 .6 and I asked you, okay, what is the ceiling function for 6.6? .6? It should give you 7 because 7 is the largest integr in integral value that is greater than 6.6 .6 or equal to it. Obviously, if you give the ceiling function for an integer, it will give you the integer itself. So let's look at an example, 7.8. So this should give me the value 8, as you can see here. Let's look at another negative number. So minus 12.3, uh, an integer that is greater than minus 12.3 uh, is minus 12, the smallest integer that is greater than minus 12.3, and this should give you 12, as you can, minus 12, as you can see here. Uh, a similar function is the floor function, which is defined like this. Again, the floor function, what it does, it gives you the greatest number that is smaller than um, whatever value we pass between the parentheses. So if I gave it 2.3, it should give me the value 2. Um, again, if we pass integers, it will uh, just give us the integer itself. Again, just to reiterate, this uh, ceiling and floor functions, uh, they give you inte in integer values. So the floor function will give you the largest integer that is smaller than what we pass over here. So let's look at 6.7. So the la largest integer that is smaller than 6.7 is 6. And as you can see, this is our answer over here. Uh, the next function that we will look at is the truncate function. Um, the truncate function is defined using this. Truncate is very similar. 
to what we have seen. This is how we define the truncate function. Uh, it is very similar to the ceiling and floor. Uh, in the truncate function, what we do is um, we pass a decimal value, a float number, to the between between the parentheses, and what we get back is the number without the decimal component. So only the integral component. So if I gave it 7.8, for example, it will give me only the 7 part. It will return me only the 7 part and it will chop away the 0.8 part. Um, if I gave it minus 12.3, uh, it will chop away the 0.3 part and give me only minus 12 back. So let's look at an example, 8.9. It should give me only 8, as you can see here. See, I did minus 8 uh, or minus 6.9. It should give me minus 6. So you can think of truncate function as it does the floor function for positive values and it does the ceiling function for negative values because it rounds down and rounds up respectively for positive and negative values. So now let's look at the next set of uh, arithmetic functions. Um, let's move on to permutations. Permutations are defined using this. As you know, so in between the parentheses, I have to pass two values, n and k. So I have to pass n, n and a k. The k has to be less than or equal to n because the permutation, as you know, is uh, the number of ways in which we can permute from n objects, k, tire, k different objects. Uh, so what this mathematically, what this is, is um, permutation of n and k is n factorial divided by n minus k factorial. So if I pass, say, 10 and 6, it will give me the permutation of 10 and 6. So let's look at what's the value. As you can see, it's a it's very large value, 15, 150, 1200. Similarly, there is a combination function. And this is uh, combinations and permutations are used a lot in probability. So if you're going to move into that sphere, which you will encounter a lot in um, machine learning AI, you will be using these functions quite a bit. Um, so the combination function, again, you pass an n and a k. Again, the n should be greater than or equal to this k. What this evaluates is n factorial divided by n minus k factorial times k factorial. So again, this is a mathematical concept. So let's look at the permutation, uh, sorry, the combination of 10 and 6. So as you can see, it gives me 210, which is the combination of 10 and 6. In the arithmetic function section, um, are GCD and LCM. As we know, GCD is the greatest common divisor. LCM is least common multiple. So as of the newest version of Python in 3. Python 3.9, the math module gets these two new functions that were uh, very lately added, actually. Um, since uh, I cannot show you that because I don't have the absolute latest version of Python on my system. But using the math.gcd function, this is the function. And in between this, we would what we would do if we had the latest version is we would pass two numbers or as many numbers, in fact. And it, what this function would do is find the common divisor amongst them. So if I gave these, say, for example, if I gave these numbers, it would give me the value 10. Similarly, the LCM function, again, added in the Python 3.9, finds the common multiple amongst whatever we pass over here. So if I passed, say, 20 and 30, this will give me uh, the value of 60, which is the LCM of 20 and 30. So uh, again, these are, uh, it's uh, something neat that if you say you have Python 3.9 or uh, uh, if you have Python 3.9 or after that, uh, you will have access to these functions as well if you, uh, when you import the math module. So that was for the arithmetic uh, functions. Let's move on to the next section, which are power and logarithmic, uh, logarithmic functions. So let's start off with the power function. Um, there are two, there are uh, multiple ways you, know, you can actually do a power function in math, uh, in Python. So you can do something like this, which is the equivalent of two to the power three, or you can use the inbuilt uh, module math, and you can use the POW or the power function, which is, this is how you do it. And uh, if I had to do same two to the power three, I would just pass two and three as arguments like this, and it should give me the value as you can see eight over here. What if, uh, so there's actually one more function, which is simply the POW function. And this is uh, not part of the math module. It's a function not part of the math module, but it's still part of the uh, base Python. You can use this as well, and you can do the same thing. POW, two and three, it should give you the value eight again. The Now you might ask, what's the difference between these two functions? Well, it's not much. For at least in a beginner standpoint, it's not that much. Uh, just note that the, the math dot uh, power function is slightly computationally faster than the simple power function. So yeah, uh, moving on there, next topic would be the next function that we'll discuss is the exponential function, which is defined like this. 
Again, exponential function is again e to the power something. So if I did exponential of 3, uh, this would give me e to the power 3. So as you can see, oh, of course, I did not define the module beforehand. So math.exp, now when I do this, it should, it will give me some value, which is basically Euler's number or e to the power 3. So this was the exponential function. And let's look at uh, an example. So we will look at the example of rate of decay and we will use the uh, this function in that example. So the exponential rate of decay um, uh, for uh, is used to calculate the amount of radioactive uh, elements that is present in a substance after a certain amount of time. So the 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 the, the expression is uh, something like the initial amount of uh, radioactive elements that were present uh, right at the beginning times the exponent of minus six nine three times t uh, t for time divided by the time period the half life time. Uh, so let's just write it down to make it simple. So again, as you can see, the uh, so this will give me the remaining amount of radioactive elements, right? So let's uh, let's write down remaining. Let's assign this to a variable remaining. So the initial again, um, initial is the initial amount of radioactive elements. So let's give it some value, say 100. Um, the time, let's assume it's 10 years, uh, and let's say the half life um half-life is around i don't know this gives some value say three or something again this is uh the details are not important so this will uh i'm using the math dot exponential function over here as you can see and for these values uh now when i check what's the value of remaining after i calculated it it's something uh so this is it's basically what this tells me is that i started off with 100 units of some radioactive element um and in 10 years is this is what is left so yeah so this is how we would use say the uh, ex exponential function in a particular example of ours so next uh, next uh, type of again functions are logarithmic functions so let's look at some of the logarithmic functions that are part of the math module so a basic log function would be written like this math.log in between this i would pass the number that i want the log for by default if i just pass one number it will it will calculate the log of 8 to the base of e as we know e is the euler's number so let's see what it does in this case it gives me some value what if i wanted to specify a particular base well i would pass a second argument in this case i want to find the log of 8 to the base 2 and this should be the value 3 as you can see over here uh, there are two specific functions that are also provided in this math module that is log 2 uh, what this will do is again it will again i have to just pass one argument and this will automatically find the value of the log of 8 to the base 2 as you can see here uh, similarly there is a math dot log 10 function if i gave if i did this i will find the value of uh, something here to the base 10 as you can see so this was a uh, logarithmic functions then you have the finally you have the square root function so how would we use the math uh, the square root function is math dot sqrt again we pass the what we want over here uh, if we want the square root of say 49, this should give me the value 7, as you can see. Finally, maybe move on to the final set of functions that we can do using this math module. Uh, they are trigonometric functions and they are hyperbolic functions. So uh, let's start off with some of the trigonometric functions. As we know, um, we can do sine, we can do cosine and tan, uh, some of the basic functions. Um, the way we would do it is math dot sine. Um, in between this, what we this is to calculate the sine of a particular uh, angle and this angle must be passed in radians uh, this is very important to note we do not pass it in degrees but in radians so if i say passed sine of 3.14 as we know 3.14 is an approximation of the value pi uh, sine pi is uh, supposed to be uh, in fact it's supposed to be zero so let's see uh, we get something close to zero again since this is an approximation it won't give us the exact value uh, similarly we can use math dot cos to find the value of a particular angle um, if you want to find uh, if you want to find the value of the uh, sorry the cos of a particular angle uh, we can use the tan function in case uh, we wanted to find the tan similarly uh, we have the next set for arc sine and the arc cosines of uh, uh, certain uh, of uh, angles so to use to find the arc sine for example we would use a dot sign i mean sorry a sign uh, for arc cosine we would use this and for arc tan we would use this the next set would be hyperbolic functions again hyperbolic functions are 
uh, are basically the sine and the cosine and the tine calculated not circles but on hyperbolas. Uh, again, the details don't have to be, you don't have to know the details. You just should, uh, you should know that if you wanted to say, for example, find out the, uh, hyperbolic sine of an, a, of an angle, we would use math dot sine h and we would pass what we want in between this. Similarly, if you wanted to find the cosine, it would be cos h, uh, tan, it would be tan h. And if we wanted to find the inverse of, uh, the hyperbolic inverse, we, what we would do is, what we would do is use a. So we would use a tan h. If we wanted to find the hyperbolic inverse uh, of sine, we would use a sine h. And similarly for cos, it would be cos uh, a cos h. So this concludes our video on the math module in Python and some of the math functions surrounding this. In this video, we will learn about conditional statements. Uh, and we will learn about uh, how do we create these control structures uh, where we have these conditional statements. Uh, we will learn about the keywords that we use in Python to create a conditional statement block, the if uh, keyword, the elif keyword, and the else keyword. Uh, we will also learn about indentation and its importance in Python. So let's get started. So the basic uh, syntax, if you will, for a if statement in Python consists of the keyword if followed by an expression, as you can see, from this uh, pictorial, uh, it, it, there's an if statement, there is a expression, uh, there is this uh, block of code, which if you can actually see is slightly indented to the rest of the code. Uh, and then we have the rest of the rest of our code after that. So what we're looking at is this. So this is our if statement block. Um, now let's let's break this down. So what is this expression that we're speaking of? Uh, an expression in this context is a Boolean expression, which evaluates to a true or false statement. So when we are speaking about the if statement, we have an expression. And if this expression evaluates to true, then we ex execute everything below the if statement. Otherwise, we skip that portion. As you can see, if the statement is true, we execute this statement or these statement blocks. Uh, otherwise, if it's false, we move on to the next the next statement block or the beginning of a new statement. Uh, so let's look at an example to uh, further understand this. Let's take this if statement over here. As you can see in this if statement, I have this expression 50 greater than 30. So what Python is going to do now is it's going to check whether 50 is greater than 30 and it's going to check it in a Boolean context. If this is true, then we can move on to the next portion, which is this. But if it is false, then we will skip this. So let's see what this, uh, what happens over here. So since we know that 50 is indeed greater than 30, this is a true expression. We move on to this block of code, which is saying that print 50 is indeed a larger number than 30. So let's see if this actually gets printed. So as you can see, we get this, uh, the result, which is, this is a true statement and we get our print statement getting executed. What if we gave a false expression over here? So let's look at uh, what happens if I gave a false expression. Now I'm checking if 50 is lesser than 30, which is a false statement. So if it's a false statement, we do not move on to this portion of our if statement block and we, we directly, in fact, we directly skip. So if I have to execute this, you will see nothing gets executed. And in fact, my print statement is just not executed because we never entered this because our expression over here was indeed false. So yeah, this is how a basic if statement block looks like in Python. And this is how the, uh, how we move on to, uh, how we check for the true, the truth, truthfulness or the falseness of a particular expression in the if statement. So moving on, um, let's move on to the topic of indentation in, um, in Python. So as you can see, this, uh, this if statement is an example of a control structure. So without moving, without defining a, uh, what a control, control structure is, uh, in detail, Control structures consists of these uh, conditionals or loops or uh, iterations, if you will. Uh, so all of these control structures involve heavy indentation. So what does an indentation mean? Well, what if I gave you an example? Say I gave you some variable called age and I wrote 20 over here. Now, if I gave you an if statement saying if age is greater than 10, now uh, it's very important to note that when I'm defining an if statement, I need this colon. Otherwise, this if statement is not defined. So this uh, colon is important. Uh, anyways, so now I'm checking this expression if age is greater than 10. Now, what is this? What happens if age is greater than 10? Now, what if I want Python to do something only if age is greater than 10? Well, 
how do I tell Python that there is a piece of code uh, or a section of code that I want executed only if this condition is met? Well, this is where indentation comes into play. So if I want, say if I want this line, this person is an adult. Again, this is some random line where I'm assuming age is pertaining to this adult, all right, or this person. So if I have uh, this variable age where I write this uh, number 20, which denotes the age of some, some person, and I'm doing a check if age is greater than 10. Actually, let's be specific here. Well, the adult age for most people is 18 in most countries. So let's see if age is greater than 18. Now, if I'm doing this check, uh, I want to print this statement only if this person is a uh, person's age is above 20, uh, above 18. So how do I tell Python that I only want this statement to be uh, executed only during this, if this condition is met? Well, this is where indentation comes into play. And uh, as you can see, uh, exactly as you can see, uh, this part, this portion of the code is slightly indented compared to the if statement. So when this condition is met, then only do we move on to this. If this condition is not met, we move on to whatever the next section of code will be, like whatever whatever uh, code that we have after this if statement. So let's see. So this since this condition is actually met, as you can see, this uh, print statement is actually executed. So this is the importance of indentation. Now we will see uh, in as we move as we learn more about if statements and else statements and elif statements how indentation plays a key role in defining what we want as an output when a certain condition is met. All right. So for now, it's very important to understand that uh, this is how indentation is used in Python. In other languages, we might use, uh, we, we probably don't use indentation. In fact, popular language, the C language, uh, does not use indentation at all. But some languages and Python in probably the trademark language for uh, indentation in programming. So you might say that, uh, so different people have different opinions on indentation. The general consensus is that indentation helps make the code look very presentable and very readable. And this actually is one of the facets of Python programming is the indentation and the easy readability of it. Anyways, moving on. So what if we have um, multiple conditions in our code or if in our if statement block that we want to see? So let's create this um, list or let's actually just copy this example that I have written over here. As you can see, what I'm doing in this piece of code is I have a list X where I have this integer 50. I have two strings, cat and apple. Now I want to check a bunch of things. So I want to check if 60 is an X and I also want to check if the string cat is an X. Uh, and I want a final sort of like if none of these conditions are met, I want something to happen. So how do we do that? Well, we start off our state, our if statement block with the standard if keyword. All right. Now, if we have uh, one more condition that we want met, then we can use the L if, which uh, is kind of a short form for else if. Uh, so we use the L if keyword. So it, so what this Python, uh, what Python reads is it checks this condition, then it will check this condition. And then finally, we have this else keyword. And else is a keyword used in our block to tell Python that if none of our earlier expressions have been true, then do uh, what is in the, uh, the uh, that is within the else uh, keyword that is indented within the else keyword. So again, we don't pass an expression for else because else is uh, only, we only reach this else statement in case all of the other earlier conditions have not been met or have uh, come to be false and not true. So let's look at uh, this particular code example. So we have a list of 50 cat and apple and I'm my first expression that I'm checking is, uh, is 60 in X. So this is how we check actually. So if 60 and X should be read as is 60 in the list X. So is this 60 in the list, list X? Well, actually, no, we don't have the object 60. So this part is not executed. We move on to the next condition. Is the string cat in X? Well, actually it is. Uh, the string cat is indeed in X. So we move on to this statement block, which is within the uh, condition that is met, which is print cat is in list X. And you will see that uh, none of the other statement blocks will be executed because we have met our condition over here. So if I execute this, as you can see that uh, the print statement cat is in list X is what is actually executed. And we do not uh, execute this obviously because it is false and we do not even check or we do not even move on to the statement because well, we have a condition met over here. 
So it's a one thing that is important to note is that we can use as many elif statements to check for as many conditions that we we want to check for. Um, but it's very important that we only use and if we are using that we only use one else statement and only at the end of our block. Okay, so moving on. Now I'm going to show you a very neat example about how Python actually does its uh, these these condition checkings. So it's very important to note that once a condition is met none of the other conditions are even checked for. So um, we do not even consider the next statements and we directly leave this uh, if statement block. So let's look at this example over here. Now in this example that I have over here is where I've stored the string cat in x. Now I have three, uh, I have three conditions that I'm checking. I'm checking is 50 greater than 60. I am checking if the value of x is indeed cat and I'm checking I'm some random expression one divided by zero. This is not even a check. This is literally just checking if one divided by zero is true or false. And as we know, we cannot divide anything by zero. So let's see what happens when I execute this statement. Now, typically, if I wrote one divided by zero, Python will throw me an error because one cannot be divided by zero. That is an error, error in a statement. So let's see what happens when I do this. Actually, as you can see, I have a statement being printed, but I have no error, even though I gave a wrong uh, I gave an error in a statement in one divided by zero. Well, now you might ask, why is that so? Well, it's simply because I have actually never reached this condition. I have not even, uh, Python is not bothered looking at this because if you actually see, there is a condition previous to this, uh, over here, which is met and which is true. So we move on to this block, we execute this block and we forget about the rest of the code. So we don't actually get to, uh, this error in a statement, which is an interesting thing and which is an example that I have shown. Uh, to, to show you that once a condition is met in an if statement block, we do not look at any of the further conditions that are being checked. Okay, so finally, um, I have one, uh, one small topic that I would like to share with you is the conditional expressions or the Python's ter ternary uh, operator. Now, this is slightly different to the if statement that we have talked about up until now, uh, in the sense that it is not a control structure. So what this actually is, is more of an operator that defines some expression. So let's see what I am trying to say over here. So as you can see over here, highlighted is the uh, syntax for what I'm trying to talk about, this ternary operator. So let's look at this example and let's see what I'm trying to do over here. So I have this variable age, all right, and this age is 26. Now x, now just, just read this uh, statement. X is equal to adult if age is greater than 18, else child. Now I could have done an elaborate control structure with an if statement, then an indentation within that if statement. And then um, I could have written else and then another indentation and I would have written another statement over there. But instead of that, I've used this uh, operator to assign a particular value to the variable X. And this uh, what value I'm assigning to X depends on if this condition is true or false. So uh, as you can see, the condition says is age 18, uh, greater than 18. So if this is true, then I assign this particular string. If it is false, then I go on to the else statement and I assign this. So since age is 26 is greater than 18, I should assign the string adult to X. And as you can see, if I execute this and check what is an X, you can see adult is indeed an X. So this is a very neat, a very needable, readable, and a very, um, it, it, it's a, it's probably a more, it's a, it's a better looking way, uh, to perform simple else, uh, sim, simple if and else statements where you don't want to create a whole, um, if stay, if, if else statement control structure block. So yeah, this was the ternary operator. Finally, we let's, uh, we, we make a short note on the pass statement, uh, in Python. So the pass statement or the pass keyword is a, a place where it is, is, is a placeholder of sorts. So what if I had an if statement and I'm writing a piece of code, but I don't know what to do with this if statement. So if, if a statement is correct, if a statement is true, um, but I don't know what to do if this statement was true, how, how do I tell Python? Well, Let's just keep it a hold for now. And I might uh, put something into this uh, block later in the future. Well, I would use the past statement. So if I had this, uh, say this some condition again, if I'm checking age is greater than 18, but I don't know what to do with this. I would just simply use this past statement. And uh, this basically does nothing. Uh, it, it It's a way to, it's, it's like a way to create a placeholder where maybe in the future I might have I might write some sort of a, say a print statement or some sort of a uh, different function or something else 
within this indentation. So, but in the meantime, like currently, I don't have anything to place over here. So I just leave it with a pass statement. So this is uh, a way where you can use a pass statement in um, if and else statements or uh, if and else control structures. So yeah, this was a uh, basic or the, an introduction into conditional statements and uh, the control structure uh, of if and else statements in Python. In this video, we will be doing a small exercise on if statements. Just to drive home the point or the purpose of an if statement, we will be doing a small exercise. So let's first revise some of the concepts of an if statement. So a basic if statement can be something like this. We have a small condition where we're checking if a variable x is greater than 5 or not. And if it is greater than x, we print a statement over here. So if this condition is met, we print this statement. Else, we move to this statement block. Now our variable x has the value 5. Now since x is not greater than 5, what this will do is, it will check this statement and since this will be false, we skip this statement block and move on to this statement. So as you can see here. Similarly, we can do something uh, where we are checking multiple statements. We use the elif statement in such a case. So now in this block, we are checking in one of the, one of the conditions we're checking is if x is equal to 5 or if x is greater than 5. And then finally, if both of these conditions are not met, we say else and we print whatever or we do whatever is in this particular statement block, which is a simple print statement. So as you can see, x is indeed get, is equal to 5. So this is the block that will get executed, as you can see here. Now another example are nested if statements. So nested if else statements are if else statements within if else statements. So let's look at an example. As you can see here, we have a string stored in a variable called orange quality and the string is fresh. Now we have an integer or a float in this case 4.0 stored in orange price. Now our first statement is checking whether orange quality, the variable orange quality, is it equal to the string fresh. Now within that, if the statement or if this condition is met, we do another check where we're checking what is the price? Is it lesser than 5? If it is, we do this block, else we execute this block. Finally, if our initial uh, statement, our initial condition is not met, we move on to this else block. Now when I execute this, what should happen is, I will enter this block because this is true. And finally, I will enter this block because this condition is also true. So I should have this printed. I will buy five dozens, as you can see here. Now let's move on to our main exercise for this video. So this was all just a revision. Now we're going to use some or all of these concepts in a sample project or a sample exercise uh, to for your further practice. So in this exercise, what we're going to do is we're going to request the user to enter a number between 1 and 20. And our, uh, our code is going to check whether this number entered is an even number or an odd number. So as you can see, there are two sets of checks that we're going to do in this code. The first check is going to be whether the number that is entered is between 1 and 20 or not. And if it is not, we have to say it's an invalid number. But if it is entered between 1 and 20, we have to move on to the further checks, which is whether it is an even or an odd number. So let's see how we do that. So in this piece of code, what we start with is a print statement saying, please enter a number between 1 and 20. And then we add an input command. This input command will open a box where we can enter whatever number that we want to enter. Now we use this int keyword to make sure that whatever we have entered into the input box is stored as a int data type in the enter num variable. Once we do that, our first if statement is going to check whether the entered number is greater than or equal to 1 or less than or equal to 20. Uh, sorry, and less than or equal to 20. So both of these conditions have to be met. If this condition is true, then we have a valid input and this statement is printed that we have entered a valid number. And then we move on to the rest of the statement block within this if statement, which is another set of if and else if statements. If our number is not between 1 and 20, we move to this block and this block prints that we have entered an invalid number. Now, once we have, say, entered a valid number, we move on to this block, this if and uh, if else, uh, if elif statement block. Now, what this block is checking is whether the entered number is an even number or not. Now, as we know, an even number is divisible by 2 and leaves the remainder 0 when divided by 2. So, this is what this check is doing. If this check is true, that means our number is 
even and we get printed that our number is even. The other, ch other check or the other uh, if statement is checking whether it's an odd number and that means when we divide by 2, we should get the remainder 1 as you can see here and we get printed your number is odd. So let's execute this and see what happens when we enter a number. Now it's asking me to enter a number. Let's say I enter 17. Now that I have entered 17, as you can see, it's a valid number that I have entered and the code is telling me that my number is indeed odd. Let's look at some other, what if I entered something else here? Let's say if I enter 16 now, since it's an even number. As you can see, 16 is also a valid number as it's between 1 and 20 and my number is even. And the code checks for that. Let's see if I, what happens when I enter an invalid number. Let's say 25. Now when I enter 25, as you can see, it says I have entered an invalid number. And in this case, what has happened is, this condition itself is not met and I have moved on to this statement block. So to give you a breakdown as to how our code has executed this, let me show you an example for the number, say 9. When I enter 9, the first check that happens, of course, is this check, whether it's a valid number or not. And since it is between 1 and 20, we move on to this block. And in this block is checking whether our number is divisible by 2 or not. And since it is not, it will remain, it will leave a remainder 1 and we execute this block, which says our print, our number is odd, as you can see here. So this was a brief recap into the if statement and if else statements, nested if else statements. We also saw an exercise where we used nested if else statements. In this video, we will be, uh, I will introduce you to the concept of iterations in Python and we will be speaking in specific about the indefinite iteration in Python, otherwise known as the while loop. So let's uh, look at what an iteration means. An iteration is uh, uh, executing the same block of code over and over, potentially many times. A programming structure that implements an iteration is called a loop. Now in programming, we have two types of iterations, definite and indefinite iterations. And in this example, we will be speaking about indefinite iterations. Indefinite iterations in Python is the while loop where we use the while keyword to define an indefinite iteration. So uh, let's look at the basic syntax. As you can see, this is the basic syntax where we have the while keyword followed by an expression and uh, again the colon and below that is something indented. Again, we encounter indentations just like in if-else statements, uh, a set of statements where um, what happens here is following the while keyword, we have this expression where um, this expression is evaluated in a boolean context. Again, we check if this expression evaluates true or false. And if it is true, we uh, execute all the statements or the statement block that is indented below this while statement. Uh, this is another example of control structure, much like uh, if and else statement blocks where we use a lot of indentation. So let's look at a basic example now of uh, while loop. So let's copy this example and let's see what this does. So I have a variable n where I am assigning it a value 0. This is called an initializing process. And it's very important to note that most while loops consist of an expression which contains a variable, a control variable, uh, which uh, is usually initialized prior to starting the loop. And then this control variable is uh, typically very uh, modified somewhere within the uh, main loop body. So in this case, my control variable is n and I am initializing it by assigning it the value 0. So let's uh, move into the loop now. So the loop has this while keyword as you can see, followed by a uh, an expression n less than or equal to 5. Now what this is, is an expression which is going to check if it's true or false. Is n less than or equal to 5? And as long as this expression is true, we will continue doing whatever is indented below this while statement. And what is below this while statement is a print statement, first of all, which says value of n is and it basically prints the value of n in that particular iteration. And as you can see, this uh, compound assignment where we add the value of n uh, by 1 and we assign it back to n. So what this is, uh, let's see what this does actually. Let's execute this and see what this does. Uh, important to note, the value of n again is initialized at 0. So this while loop will keep going on until the value of n remains lesser than or equal to 5. So as you can see, I have the execution of this uh, particular block of code or this while loop where I get the uh, multiple different iterations of this print statement that you can see here. The first iteration, it says value of n is 0. Then it says value of n is 1. What I'm doing is I am writing, I am assigned, I'm writing uh, the value of n multiple times uh, and each time the value of n 
is uh, written over here based on what iteration it is. So what is happening actually is uh, that initially the value of n is 0 and I print the statement value of n is 0. Now I add uh, the value of uh, what is in n by 1. So now what is the value of n? So again we do this check. So after this first iteration we come back or like once this whole uh, code block of code is executed we again come back to this expression and we again check if this statement is true. So now that the value of n is actually 1, it, this uh, statement is still true. So again we execute this and uh, that you can see over here, value of n is 1. Now again we add the value of n by 1 and again we go back here once this, uh, this block is executed and we check if uh, this statement is true again. And as you can see the value of n when it's 2 is still uh, making sure that this expression is true. And this keeps happening until the value of n is greater than 5. So once the value of n becomes 6, this condition is no longer met and finally we do not execute this statement because this expression evaluates to false and we do not do this anymore and we finally leave our while loop. So let's check what the value of n is just to confirm this. As you can see the value of n is indeed 6 and that is why we have left this while loop over here. So this is an example of a basic while loop where we check for this uh, an expression if it evaluates to true we evaluate everything within it. Once this is done, we go back and we evaluate this expression again. If it is again true, we again go back and do whatever is indented within it. And we keep doing this until the expression gives us false. And interestingly, we don't, uh, we don't necessarily have to define these control variables always. We can actually use uh, iterables and we will learn about iterables actually in a future video. But uh, we can use iterables and an example of an iterable is uh, the list. So let's look at this list. Uh, and let's look at this whole block, alright? So I created this list A, which contains five objects, one, two, three, four, and five, all integer objects. And I have another variable a X, where I store the integer one. Now, I'm, this while statement, now it might look confusing. Now it's, it says, it says while A. Now, what is A? Well, A is not, uh, your typical expression where you're making sure if some condition is being met or not. But this, uh, the way you read this is while A exists. So in the context of a list, as long as A, which is a list, contains objects within it, A is true. If it does not have any objects within it, A is false. So while A basically, what it means is, while A has objects within it. And if it does have objects within it, or as long as it does, we continue executing whatever is indented within this while statement. And this while statement is a print statement. Again, we uh, do like we we have this value x where we um, we're doing this this we're printing this is iteration number and uh, we pass x. So the first iteration will obviously pass x is equal to one, and then we add x by one, and then the second iteration should pass this is iteration number two, and then so on. And finally, we have another statement within this block called the a called the uh, pop statement where we're popping the elements of a. Now, as if you would have seen the list the video on lists. The pop statement removes the rightmost value uh, from a list. So if I do a dot pop initially, it will remove five from this list and I will have the rest of them. And again, if I do pop, it will remove four from this list and then you will have the rest of these. So let's actually see. We'll actually check what's left in this list each time we do this pop statement. So I'll also print the list a each uh, during each iteration and let's see what happens over here. As you can see, what is happening out here is while a or while a has elements, we are going to continue doing this while statement, whatever is within it. So in the first iteration, obviously we have all of it, uh, and it is iteration number one. And as you can see, the list contains everything. Then I pop it. Then iteration number two, it again has elements, but it has lost its uh, most rightmost element. And this keeps on happening until the list finally has no elements left. And once the element, or uh, once the list has no elements left, we this expression while a evaluates to false and we do not execute this anymore and we leave the while loop. And again, let's check what is in A. A should have no elements. As you can see, it's an empty list. When I check what's in A, it's an empty list. And that is why while A returned me a false and we did not print any further. So this is an example of using a while statement using lists. Uh, and of course, uh, the next topic would be discussing nested while loops. And um, this is a broad topic. What I mean by this is that when, when I'm saying nested while loops, I'm actually talking about nested control structures. So we can have while loops within while loops. Not only that, we can have if and else statements within while loops. We can have while loops within if and else statements. And 
we can have if and else statements within if and else statements. So if you think of all of these loops, uh, and we will even speak about for loops in the in the in in a in another video. For loops again are a type of control structure. So all of these are control structures. While loops are control structures, for loops are control structures, if and else statements are control structures. All of these are control structures and nesting can happen within them and it does not matter uh, which is the like the parent of the nest and then the child of the nest. You can have a while loop within an if and else statement. You can have for loops within a while loop. All of this is valid in Python and uh, it's one of the one of the great features of Python that is very flexible in this way. So let's look at an example where I have a while loop within another while loop. So I'm copying this piece of code where I have this list one, two, three, four, five and another list first and second. Now my first while loop I print, I print what is popped from A. So I take A, then I pop the zeroth index. So basically from the left hand side and I print what is that, all right? And then I have another while loop where I have this list B and I'm doing the same thing. But this while loop is within the first while loop and let's see what happens out here. So as you can see, my first, uh, my first iteration of this parent while loop causes me to pop what is the first element, which is one. Then I do these while loops and this is completely executed and only then do I go back to this first one and then I come back and do all of this again. Then I go back to this one and then I come back and do all of this again. And that's why you can see this repetition. So I have this first iteration and then I do uh, the second while loop. Then I have the second iteration and then I do the second while loop and I keep doing this. And this is an example of a nested while loop. Okay, so our next topic in uh, this second, this video would be break and continue statements. Now break and continue statements are ways to abruptly end iterations uh, in, in a particular loop. Now you can use break and continue statements not only in uh, while loop, but you can use it in also in for loops. So let's look at how, how we use it in while loops. And let's look at what we mean by break and continue statements first of all. Well, the break statement terminates the loop entirely. So once the break statement is found, the, the complete while loop that we are using is completely terminated. And the continue statement, on the other hand, terminates only the current loop iteration and it goes back to the beginning or the expression and it checks whether uh, the expression or the uh, the controlling expression is again reevaluated and it is checked whether uh, the loop will execute again or terminate. This pictorial that you can see here actually emphasizes or it shows the difference between break and continue. So I have this while loop and I have an expression. All right. I have a bunch of statements and I have a break command over here and I have a continue command over here. So if I encounter the break command, it will not execute any of this. In fact, it will not execute this while statement at all and it will move on to the next piece of code that we have. But a continuous statement, if a, a continuous statement is encountered in a while loop, will not completely break away, but it will not, uh, it will not execute the, the rest of the statements in that iteration, only these two, but it will go back here. It will check this expression again and again we will do this all over again. So this is this small, uh, difference between the break and continue statements, but both are used to abruptly end an iteration in a loop. So let's look at an example of how we use the break statement. So I will use this example where I have, again, I have initialized some controlling variable n to zero. Uh, my first loop will check whether n is less than or equal to five. If this is true, then I will print this statement. And then I will, what I'm doing over here is I am incrementing it by one. Now in my previous, in my earlier example using a similar, uh, using the similar example, uh, I had no, like this, this part was not there. So what you got was I was printing the value of n. So it was printing as like value of n is one, I mean zero and then one and then two and then three, four and five. But over here I've included a small, I've nested an if statement and within that I put a break statement. And this if statement is checking if, if n is equal to equal to two. So once n is two, I move on to this and I do the break statement. So let's see what happens now. As you can see, once, so when I've executed this, I don't get the whole value of n is zero and then one and then two, three, four, five. I, I stop at one and that is because once n is equal to two, I actually do not execute this uh, while loop again. I do not go back and uh, execute print value of n is two now. In fact, I break from this whole while loop and uh, my while loop terminates right then and there. And that's why you only get these two iterations, value of n is zero and then value of n is one. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you a neat example of what happens or what is the difference between a break and a continuous statement. Okay, 
So let's uh, go back to our initial example where we're printing this value of n is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. But I've added one more statement where I print hello at each iteration. So let's see what happens when I do this. As you can see, it will print hello after each of whatever I was doing already. Now let's introduce our break statement first of all. So when I do break, well, let's go back to this if statement. If is, if we check this condition, then we break. Let's see what happens now. As you can see, something interesting has happened where we have this first iteration completely being executed, but the second iteration kind of stops where there's no hello. And that is because we have broken from this while loop before the second iteration's hello was printed. Let's see the difference between a break and continue now. So now I have this continue statement instead of a break. Let's see what happens here. As you can see, it seems familiar to our first example where we did not have any break or continue, but there is a small difference that I want you to catch and that is very important about this continue uh, statement. So as you can see, the first iteration has value of n is zero and then hello. Then value of n is one, but there is no hello. And this is because, and this is because once this condition is actually met, we do not move on to this statement, but we go back to this expression and we will evaluate this expression. And then once we evaluate this expression again and it's found to be correct, we do everything the same again where we print hello. But except for that one step where this if statement was met and we did continue and this following statement was not executed. And that happens only for one iteration and that is when n is equal to equal to 2. And as you can see, that is what happens over here. In one of the iterations, we miss a hello. And that is the difference of the continue statement between, uh, that is the difference of the continue statement with the break statement. So this concludes it for uh, our video on indefinite iterations. In this video, we will be looking at three examples where we are using while loops along with other stuff like say if and else statements. So our first example will be where we calculate the factorial of a number. In this example, as you can see here, we are first going to ask the user to enter a particular number for us. Now this number is supposed to be an integer. Once we have this integer, we store it to a variable called number. Now we have this, you can say this uh, variable called FAC, which stores one and you, we will see how we are using it later. Now we know that the factorial of zero is one. And that's how it's just defined. So we have an if statement checking whether our entered number is zero. And if it is zero, we say that the result is one or the factorial is one. However, if we enter a number that is greater than zero, we must calculate the factorial for this number. And that is what we are going to do in this else statement block over here. Now in this else statement block, we have a while loop. In this while loop, the condition is checking while number is greater than or equal to one. So as long as this condition is true, everything within that while loop will be executed. So as long as number is greater than or equal to one, we are going to execute these two lines. Now, what do these two lines do? Let us see. So the first line takes the variable FAC where we had the number one stored and we're going to store FAC times number into it. Number being the number that we have inputted. So in case, for example, we, st uh, we entered eight, then what this will do, this line will do is one into eight and it will store that back into FAC. Now, once that is done, we move on to the next line where we are decrementing the number variable by one. So if we have stored eight or we have entered eight into our input, it will become seven. Now, as we know, seven is still greater than or equal to one. So this condition is still being met. And then we do this process again, where we are going to multiply FAC. This time FAC stores the value eight and we multiply it times the new number, which is seven now. So we do eight into seven. And then again, we decrement this. Uh, also, once we do eight into seven, we store it back into FAC. And we keep doing this where we keep multiplying eight times seven and then we decrement the number variable uh, by one and then we check this condition again. So what ends up happening is we are going to keep doing eight into seven into six into five into four into three into two into one. And once we are at one, again, when we do this decrement operation, the number variable will store the value zero and then this condition will no longer be met. So number will be zero and this condition will be false and we can move out of this while loop. And then finally, we store the result into a variable called result, which stores the result of eight into seven into six into five into four into three into two into one. This is of course, if we did enter eight when we were asked to give an input. So let's see this um, in real time once we execute this.
So I'm executing this. The first thing it asks me is to enter a number. So let's say I enter my number 8 as I was speaking about 8. Alright, now that I have entered 8, as you can see, the result that it gives me is factorial of 8 is 40320, which is correct and you can check this for yourself where it will show you um, 8 times 7 or 8 factorial is basically this, this number. Okay, so now in our next example, we will be looking at how we can generate Fibonacci numbers. For this example, we will be using bunch of if and else if statements along with a while loop. So let's look at this piece of code where we are actually doing this. So as you can see, the first part of the code is basically an input statement asking us how many Fibonacci numbers we would like to generate. And then the user would be asked to give an input which is stored as an int into a variable count. Now in this uh, if else statement, the first uh, if statement checks whether what we have entered is zero in which case we just store an empty array in the variable called fib. Next, if our uh, entered integer is 1, we just store the value 1 in this array called fib. If our entered number is 2, we store 1 and 1 in the array fib. All of these are different sets of Fibonacci sequences. This obviously an empty, an empty array shows that well there is no numbers to be generated in this sequence. If we have 1, we just print the first number of the Fibonacci sequence, which is 1 itself. If it is 2, we print the first two numbers, which is 1 and 1. Now, the actual calculations happen when we say we want a Fibonacci sequence for more than two numbers. Now, in that case, we move on to this block. In this statement block, we initialize the fib variable with the first two Fibonacci numbers, 1 and 1, and we store it in this, vari in this array. Now, we are going to do a while loop within this and in this while loop uh, we are going to keep executing this statement block as long as this condition is met or this condition is true. And what this condition is, is it's checking this variable i which we have initialized as 1 over here and we are going to check whether that is lesser than count minus 1, count being the number that we have been asked to input. If the statement is true and as long as this statement is true, we will be executing this statement block which is basically us appending this expression into the array fib. Now what this expression is, is basically it's going to keep adding uh, each subsequent numbers and we are going to store each subsequent numbers back into the uh, array fib. So in this case if you see the, what the first step will do is it will take the uh, value at the first position of the array fib and it will add it to the value at the 0th position of the array fib. And both of these values, since they are 1 and 1, when we add them, we get 2 and we append that to fib. So now our fib will look like 1, 1, 2. Then we increment this by 1 and what we do is we uh, do the same process again. So in the next step, what, would we, what we would do is we would do 2 plus 1. So we would get 3. Now this would keep going on until this condition is met or basically until uh, the numbers that we actually want to generate in our sequence. So let's like, let's, let's uh, execute this and uh, let's see an example of what happens. So it asks me how many Fibonacci numbers I would like to generate and I will say I want the first, let's say six Fibonacci numbers. So I execute this, as you can see, this gives me the first six numbers in the sequence, which is one and one and then 2 which is basically 1 plus 1 and then 3 which is 1 plus 2 and then 5 which is 2 plus 3, 8 which is 3 plus 5. So if we wanted more numbers we would just enter over here like say if we wanted the first 10 numbers it would give us the first 10 numbers in the sequence as you can see here. Now in our next example what we are going to do is we are going to write a program which takes two digits that represent the dimensions of an array. For example, if we want a 3 by 3 array, we will enter 3 comma 3 and we are going to generate a two-dimensional array in which each of the elements of the array are basically the row times the column position of um, that particular element. And what I mean by this is, say we have a position i comma j on the array, the value of the uh, element at that position would be i times j. So for example, if I'm looking at something at the third row and the fifth column, or say the third row and the third column, for example, the value of the element would be 3 times 3. And if I'm looking at something at the second row and the fourth column, I am going to do 2 times 4. 
So let's, uh, let's see how we can do this using code. So if you look to the right over here, I have a piece of code where I'm going to, uh, in where it asks me to input two numbers, two integers to represent the dimensions of my, uh, example, uh, my sample array. Now, once we have done this, we are going to store these, um, these, uh, uh dimensions in the inputs, uh, in, in a variable called input string. So obviously when we enter say 5 comma 5 that will be stored as an int in this particular string or this variable. What we want is we want uh, 5 say we enter 5 comma 5 we want 5 as a separate integer and the other 5 as another separate integer and that is what we do in this particular statement where we're going to split up our input string uh, based on the comma separator and we're going to store the first part of that string into the zeroth position of dimensions which is an array and the uh, next dimension in the first position in this uh, particular array now we are going to store the number of uh, rows as row number and that is the zeroth position of this array and we're going to store the number of columns as the first position of dimensions or whatever we've mentioned in the input so now we uh, we have this um, our results array called multi list which is basically uh, what what our final array is going to look like and we're going to store into multi list and uh, in this example we will be using for loops to uh, do this or to create this particular array so as you can see here our first uh, we have initialized our multi list saying that um, we're going to have only zeros in our sample array so initially once we have initialized this array all multi list will contain is a say for example we have inputted a 5 by 5 array it will have basically a 5 by 5 array with all elements as zero and that's what this line does once we have uh, done this we are going to move on to the for loop portion where we are actually going to create our uh, array that we want so as you can see we are our first for loop is going to say for row in range row number so obviously uh, range will generate a uh, an iterator which can be iterated over um, and since it says range row number and say our the number of rows that we entered were five what it's going to do is it's going to create an iterator containing the value 0 1 2 3 and 4 so for row and range it will basically basically row will take the value 0 1 2 3 and 4 and a similar thing is going to happen in this nested for loop which is within this where we're going to again uh, create a, an iterator using this range function and for the column number. Once we have this, we're going to do the simple process of um, multiplying the uh, the value of the element based on its position. So if it's at the position 3, 4, we're going to store the value 3 times 4 into that particular position of the array. And we're going to do this for every position, which is what happens in these two for loops. We're going to first go by uh, each row and then within that we're going to check each column and we're going to do, perform these calculations and finally we print our result so let's look at an example now i'm going to say i want a three by let's say a two by four matrix so let's see what the results will be when i give this as a so what i'm saying is i want two rows and four columns now as you can see here it might not be very clear to you right now but what you can see here is this is the first row and this is the second row and each row contains four columns. So these are the, this is the, my final array that I get. So what you can see here is this is the zeroth position and the, uh, or you can say this is the first row, first column, first row, second column. And, uh, since Python is zero based, so this is actually the zeroth row and this is the first row. So as you can see, uh, this, this value basically is zero times one. This value is zero times two, zero times three, zero times four. And over here it is one times zero, one times one. 1 times 2, 1 times 3. So similarly, if I did, for example, a 5 by 5 matrix, what you will get is 5 rows now, 5 rows and 5 columns. And for example, like this particular value is uh, 1, 2, 3, or 0, 1, 2, 3. So 0, 1, 2, 3 and the first column. So this is 3 times 1. Um, if I took this value, this is like the fourth row, for example fourth row times the um, 0, 1, 2, 3, third column. So this would be 4 times 3, which is 12. So, and uh, each value of this has been generated in the similar process. So this is an example of how we can use for loops um, for a particular exercise that I have shown you right now. So this was it for um, these particular examples into while and for loops. Uh, I hope you found the two examples on while loops and this one example on for loops uh, helpful to you. 
and um, I hope it gave you further insight into how we can use uh, these types of loops in uh, say different projects. In this video, we will be covering the topic of definite iterations uh, using for loops in Python. So starting off, we know that there are two types of iterations in programming, uh, definite and indefinite. We have already covered indefinite iterations in the form of while loops. Definite iterations, on the other hand, are done using the keyword for. Uh, and the basic syntax or the standard syntax for a basic for loop in Python is as you can see over here. We have this for keyword, we have some variable, we have the in keyword, and we have this iterable. And uh, we, of course, define this control structure with the colon and then indented. We have this uh, statement block. So once this for loop has started, we execute all of these uh, statements within the statement block as part of the for loop iteration. So yeah, let's uh, now let's to understand like how for loops work uh, exactly. Let's uh, look at the concept or meaning behind what we call iterables and iterators. So so think of it in a stepwise manner. All right. So we in Python we have different objects that can be used as iterables and. An iterable is basically some object that uh, it's it's a collection of other objects. So you know, think of your lists, uh, think of dictionaries and sets. So all of these are essentially collections of objects. So once we have these collection of objects, uh, we can create an iterator out of it. Uh, how do we do that? Is we use the iter function. So for example, if I passed this list a, if I pass this list a through the iter function and I store it in some variable iter underscore a um, and I see what is iter underscore a it is actually a list iterator at some random memory location which we don't really care about. Similarly if I gave a tuple and I did the same thing I will create a tuple iterator and uh, in the left if you can see over here I've done the exact same uh, functions with sets and dictionaries as well. So I'm creating iterators out of these uh, iterables so as to speak. Uh, now, what is an iterator? Well, an iterator is an object that yields values successively. So if my list contained five values or five objects, an iterator of this list will yield these values uh, one after the other. And that is kind of how or that is the basis for which we do, uh, we create loops. Let's see what we exactly mean using this uh using another function that we call the next function. So the next function keeps moving from object to object within an iterator. So since I've created this list iterator, let's just do it once again. So as you can see, I've created this list iterator iter underscore a. Now with this iter underscore a, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this next function. What next function does is starting from the leftmost object within this iterator, I will keep yielding or I keep producing the values. So let's, let's just see what happens when I do next iter, uh, when I do next for this particular variable. It gives me this object first. Now let's see what happens when I do it again. Now it gives me the object second. What if I did it again? It gives me third. Now, if I kept doing this, it will keep giving me the different objects that were initially stored in A. That is first and then second, third, fourth and fifth, one after the other. So let's actually perform that. Now I get fourth, now I get fifth. Now a natural question is, now that I've exhausted all of these values, what will happen if I perform the next function again? Well, let's see what happens. I get a uh, an error, or uh, and this error is the stop iteration function error, which basically is telling me, uh, look, you have uh, exhausted all of the objects that were initially present in this list A, and you cannot you cannot keep doing the next uh, next function anymore. You cannot go keep going further. So yeah, so this is uh, what the next function does when it comes to the concept of iterators. All right. So now we've learned two things. What is an iterator and what is the, how do we create an iterator out of different collections of objects like a list or a tuple. And we've also learned how to use the next function. Now let's uh, move or let's come back to our for loop that we uh, started off this uh, video with. So our for loop again, let's consider our for loop over here. As you can see, some for loop with the objects again, one, two, three, four, and five. All right. This is a list. Now I'm going to do for x in a print x and let's try to see what happens when we do this. Okay. As you can see, when I have executed this, it gives me one, two, three, four, and five. So I have, first of all, let's look at this for loop. I, in this for loop, I define a new variable x and then I say for x in a print x. And what's happening? Well, in each iteration, I'm printing whatever the value of x is uh, at present. So in the first iteration, it is the first object one. 
In the second iteration, it is the second object two, then three, four, five. And then finally, uh, on its own, like, uh, this for loop knows that, okay, now once I have exhausted all of the objects within my iterator, I can stop doing this for loop and I can move on with the rest of the code. All right. So think of it like a three step process, uh, a for loop in Python. The first step is it calls an iter function to obtain an iterator for whatever we pass over here, this iterable. Second step, it calls the next function repeatedly in each iteration. All right. To keep getting the next item from the iterator. So it gets one, and then it calls next, then it gets two, and then it calls next and it gets three and then four and then five and so on. And then finally, the third step is the termination step is when after we do the final next, where we get this uh, error, as you can see, the stop iteration error or exception. Finally, this tells the for loop function or the for loop that, um, okay, we have reached the end of our definite iteration or the de end of our definite for loop. And this is where we must terminate our loop and then continue with the rest of the code. All right. So this is how a for loop works in Python. Now it's very important to note that whatever we have discussed when it came to while loops, such as nesting of while loops, and nesting of other control structures is also applicable in the case of for loops. So if I had a for loop within another for loop, that is perfectly fine. If I had a while within a for loop, that is perfectly fine. So all of these are valid statement blocks that we can do. Uh, and again, a for loop is another control structure. And so we must follow the concept of uh, indentation when it comes to writing our statement blocks within a for, for loop. Okay. So now I'm going to speak about in specific, I'm going to speak about the, this, uh, something called the range function. That is, uh, quite, you could say it's used, definitely it's used in uh, other areas of programming, but it's widely used in Python. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean the for loop in Python. Uh, w what I mean by this is that, um, range, this range function is very important for the for loop and we will see why. Okay. So let's look at, um, one of the examples of using the range function. So what does the range function do is if I give range five, let's see what it does. It gives me range zero to five. What this basically tells me is that this will create an iterator that contains uh, integers from zero to five. So it will contain the object zero, one, two, three, four, and five. And we can use this as an iterator. So let's, let's look at this. Uh, I have range five. Uh, let's store this in X. Okay. Now let's do a type just to see what happens when we do type X, it should give me the type of range as you can see. And this is a type of an iterator in Python. Now let's see what happens when I do for I in X print I. Okay. Let's see what happens. As you can see, it prints the number zero, one, two, three, four. An important caveat when it comes to the range function is when we say range five, it creates an iterator from zero to five, but it contains the objects zero, one, two, three, and four only. It does not contain the object five itself. Okay. This is something that is very important too. So, uh, once again, I created, uh, I use this range function to create an iterator from uh, if iterator of five objects from zero to four, zero, one, two, three, and four. Uh, I use that in my for loop and uh, that's what, that is what you are seeing here. Now let's use this range function in the context of something else. For example, let's see. So I had my earlier list A, right? Look at my list A here. Oops. So you can see list A contains these one, two, three, four, five, five objects. Okay. Let's see what length of A is. Length of A is five. Okay. Uh, let's use the range function on top of the length of this list A. And this is, uh, like I can't show you an example right now without any context, but this, uh, this form of using a for loop is used, is widely used in uh, Python programming. You will use it so much in data science. You will use so much in machine learning and uh, AI. Uh, I cannot tell you. Uh, this is so, this is a very important like sort of uh, for loop expression. So you have for, let's say I in range len A. Let's see what's going on here. First I create, uh, first I do length of A. That gives me five. Then I do range of five. That creates an iterator between uh, zero and four, right? When you do range five, it gives you an iterator of zero, one, two, three, and four, as we saw earlier. And this is what we're doing over here. We have created an iterator out of the length of a list. Now, when I do print I, it should give me again, one, two, three, four, zero, one, two, three, four, of course. So as you can see here, 
it will give me 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And this is a very neat way of using the range function on top of the length of a particular collection of objects. In this case, we're using the list A. This is something that you will use a lot. So I, I, I would recommend that you get used to this form of creating a for loop as well using the range function. Also, of course, um, there are, uh, the, you can use break and continue statements as you have in the case of while loops. Uh, exactly this, it works exactly the same in the case of for loops wherein the break statement will abruptly stop the for loop completely and we will move on to the next piece of code. Whereas the continue statement will break that particular iteration and then we will uh, resume with the next iteration. So yeah, that was break and continue statements and for loops. Uh, finally, I would like to show you something about uh, how to use dictionaries as an iterator or as an iterable when it comes to for loops. So let's create our dictionary. Let's go. We have a dictionary already here. In fact, let's create this dictionary again, we'll store it in A. Okay. So I created this dictionary A. All right. So I have dictionary A. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it through the iter function, as you can see. And now I'm going to just for the sake of showing you, it will show, I'll show you that it is actually an iterator of type uh, of a specific dict key iterator type. All right. So now let's, uh, Let's do something on this. So as you can see in the dictionary, I have the key first that has the value one. I have the key second that has the value two. I have the key third that has the value three and then fourth for four, fifth for five. Now, a good question would be when I do iteration or when I do a for loop on top of this A, well, what is it going to pick up? Is it going to pick up first? Uh, is it going to pick up the keys like these or is it going to pick up the values? Or is it going to go one by one key and then value and then key and the subsequent value? Uh, let's see what actually happens. So let's do for i in uh, iter underscore a print i. Let's see what what is the iterations happening upon using this. So as you can see, we're using the keys. So by default, when we do this, when we perform, when we create an iterator out of a dictionary, we use only the keys as our uh, uh, iterator elements or at iterator values. But of course, like if you wanted to use values, all you would have to do is pass a dot values over here. And if you remember from a dictionary video, this uh, a dot values gives us a, a list of, or it, it, it gives us the essentially a list of the values in our dictionary. So when we pass this to the iterator, uh, iter function, and we create an iterator out of it, let's see what happens over here. Now let's see what is iter underscore a. You can actually see it's now the dict value iterator at a particular memory location. So it's not the dict key as we saw earlier, it's a dict value iterator. So now that we have this dict dictionary value iterator, now let's print what are our iterator elements. And as you can see, now we are printing values and not um, the keys. So this is how to, this, this, this is basically two different ways of uh, iterating through a dictionary, one through keys and one through values. So this concludes it for our video on definite iterations in Python. I hope in this video you understood and you learned about the concept of iterables and iterators and the different functions associated with it and how exactly the for loop function works uh, in Python. In this video, we're going to learn about the topic called file handling. Now file handling is basically needed because so most of the times when we're handling large and different types of data in Python or uh, in general, we cannot store everything into a variable and we will have to use files. Now there are two types of files that we are going to deal with. They are binary and text files. So binary files are some of the files that we, uh, most of the files that we commonly encounter like uh, document files, image files, video files, etc. Now all binary files are encoded in a particular format and they cannot be read by a normal text editor. And we would be needing certain uh, specific softwares for specific files. Text files, on the other hand, do not have any specific encoding and they can be opened in the normal text editor itself. And they are like um, XML, CSS, HTML files, and so on. Now, there are four main operations that we can do on uh, Py in Python on files. They are open, read, write, and close. Um, there are certain other operations as well, though, like uh, rename, delete. So some of the most basic operation that we can do is obviously creating and opening a file. And the syntax is as you can see here, where we store, where we use the open command and we give a file name and we give a mode and we store that in a particular variable. Now a mode is uh, 
basically telling Python how to handle this opening. So we can have a read-only mode which is done by this letter R, a write-only mode which is done by letter W, and for there are a bunch of other modes such as read or write mode which is done by R+. And we are going to see them as we encounter them. Now the, it's important to note that what I just mentioned is for text files. If we are going to do uh, for binary files, we're going to do this file handling. Then we would be using the letter B in front of whatever we were using in the case of text files. So if we were doing a read only mode for opening a binary file, um, we would be using RB. And if we were doing read and write mode, uh, read or write only mode for a binary file, we would be using RB plus. Um, so basically just adding the B in the case of binary files. Let's look at a basic example. Um, when we want to open a particular file, we are going to open, like in this example, I'm going to open some file called filehandling.txt in a read and write mode, read or write mode, and I'm going to store it in FO. So this is as simple as it gets. Similarly, if I wanted to do it for the binary file, since I'm using a binary file, I will use the letter B as well in the mode. And uh, that's how you do it here. Now let's look at different ways in which we can read from a file. And there are three commands that we can use. We can use the read command followed by an optional number of characters. We can use the read line command followed by an optional number of characters and the read lines command. So this uh, optional number of characters is denoted by n over here um, and basically it's telling us how many characters we want to print. So let's look at a simple example of um, where I'm going to print something called. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to do a print on top of this. So I have done first, I've opened it and I've stored it in my file and then I'm going to do a, uh, a method or a function called read and I'm going to say like in this example, just read the whole thing. So as you can see, my file that I have opened has all of these lines. This is like the whole file basically. But now what if I wanted to open only the first five characters of this file, which is basically this. Well, in that case, let's open this once again. Now let's do the same read command, except we will give the character number, which is five. As you can see, it's only printed five. Now let's do a print read command and uh, try to read the whole thing again. And you will notice something very interesting. Now when I do the read command, you can see it's kind of picked up from where we left off in our from our previous command. And that is the nature of how um, Python handles files. So if I wanted to again take the cursor back in such an example, I will have to open this again. And then I use this uh, read command once again to get back to where I started from as you can see here. Now another command that we can use is the read line command. So let's uh, once again open this over here and now we're going to use the read line command on over here. So what read line command is going to do is going to each time we use this command it's going to go one by one and read each particular line from this file. So in first case it will take artificial intelligence then data science big data and so on. So as you can see if I execute this it first takes artificial intelligence. Now if I did this command again, it will say data science. Next time if I do it, it should say big data as you can see here. Okay. So this is the read line command. Now within the read line command also we can enter uh, characters and that will tell us basically um, that we want these number of characters from the next line. So if I want the first six characters of the next line, uh, I will say six, I will enter six here and it will give me the first six characters of this particular line, which is the next line that is to come as you can see here. Now another way in which we can um, print uh, whatever is there in our file line by line is by using a for loop. So again, I'm going to open this file. I'm going to store it here. Now I'm going to use a for loop saying that, well, uh, for line in my file. And what this does is basically at each, each iteration, it's going to take each line and store it in this variable that we enter over here, which is called line itself. And we're going to print that. At the end of the loop, what we'll have is all of the lines have been printed one by one. And another thing that we can do right now is um, say we want to read a particular line. Say I wanted to read the uh, fifth line of my file. I can use this technique where um, I just say, okay, I'm going to store five in this variable called line number. And I have this um, another variable called current line, which I'm going to initialize with one. And I'm going to, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same loop where I'm going to say four line in my line. But I'm going to add a condition saying that only if current line, when it's equal to line number, am I going to print the line and then I'm going to break out of this whole thing. Uh, and at the end of each uh, loop, I'm going to say current line is going to be incremented by one until basically these two variables are equal. So when I do this, I get my result, which is uh, machine learning, which is the fifth line of um, my, which is the fifth line of uh, whatever file I had. 
Now we're going to move on to the topic of um, image file handling. So we we saw how we handled or, and we we saw certain operations around um, text files. Um, and text files are obviously something that we're going to use a lot. Um, but we are also going to be using files uh, such as images a lot. And we're, let's uh, look at certain examples and certain um, use cases around image file handling. So my first step is going to be importing a bunch of uh, modules and packages. Now the details of these modules and these packages are not important as of right now because they will be covered in a future video. Uh, but just keep a note of some of these packages such as um, they say NumPy and uh, image the image uh, package. So once I've done this, let's move on to my example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to store certain file locations in two variables. So it's basically two strings. Uh, I've attached the uh, this prefix R to say that this is a read only uh, sort of a prefix. So the next topic that we're going to be handling is image file handling. Now we have already seen many examples pertaining to text files. So text files are obviously something that we're going to be using a lot. But uh, image file handling is something uh, very important as well. And we're going to see certain uh, operations that we can do around image file handling. So starting off, I'm going to import a bunch of um, packages and modules. Uh, what these packages exactly are and what these modules exactly are are right now not of that important of not are not that important to you right now but it's something that will be covered in a future or in future videos uh, it's important to just keep note of what these are such as numpy and image so once i've done that what i'm going to store is uh, i'm going to store two particular file locations in two variables location one and location two and i've prefixed them with r just to say that uh, these are raw strings so once i've done that i'm going to use the image uh, from the image package. I'm going to say open and I'm going to say open from uh, this particular location and this particular location. And I'm going to store these image images in IM1 and IM2 over here. Very similar to a normal text file opening. Now, once we've done this, uh, we can access certain properties of this image using say format, which tells us the uh, format of the file. Um, it attributes the, it identifies the source of an image. And if the image is not read from a file, it is set to none. We can also see the size of the file using the size attribute and we can see the mode, which basically defines the number and names of the bands in the image and also contains the pixel type and depth. Uh, certain common modes are like L for luminescence, RGB for true color images and uh, CMYK for pre-press images. So let's look at them. So when I uh, access this, you can see my first file is of JPEG of this size and an RGB format image. And my second image, is another JPEG, slightly bigger image, and again RGB. Now we uh, can also, of course, display these images. And to do that, we can use the PLT. Um, again, PLT is, the, is supposed to stand for a matplotlib.py plot. It's a particular for a particular package um, that again, you don't need to know the details of right now, but this is how we would um, do this. So I'm going to use a bunch of um, commands and methods such as figure and subplot and then I am show. So once I have done this, as you can see, both of my images with this being I am one, this being I am two have uh, been produced on the screen. As you can see, I can also use display this display function followed by the name of the file. And this will simply display my image as you can see here. Now um, I can obviously save a particular uh, image using the save function, which is as simple as just doing this. So I'm going to save the image as uh, I am underscore save dot JPG over here. Now, if I wanted to crop an image, I can do that as well. So I initially I stored the dimensions that I want uh, cropped in the form of a tuple, as you can see here, and I'm going to pass that tuple to the crop function. And I'm going to apply that on top of I am one and I'm going to store that to region. Once I've done that, as you can see, so basically what I've done is I've cropped this image based on whatever I've passed here and I've stored it into region. And now if I wanted to see what was um, actually in that crop, I can just uh, do the I am show function and I'm going to pass the particular cropped image, which is denoted by region, as you can see here. And you can see my uh, cropped image is basically uh, a certain a left portion of this whole image has been cropped out and I have produced it over here. Now I can also use the copy function using it's a simple basically copy. Basically, you use the copy function and it copies an image onto another um, variable that you have assigned. And then I use the I am show function, I'm going to show you the copied image, which is basically the same. Now we can do the transpose operation as well. So let's see some of the uh, let's see what we've done here. 
So in this transpose operation, so in this, uh, basically I've done a bunch of, um, operations such as rotating by 90 degrees, rotating by 180, rotating by 7, 270. And finally, once I'm done with all of these multiple operations, I'm going to show you the final output, which is basically a certain transposed image like this, which is basically the result of whatever I have done before this. So this is it for this video on uh, file handling. Uh, I have shown you two slightly more comprehensive examples on um, text files and uh, even certain examples on image files. However, we can use uh, file handling and different libraries uh, pertaining to file handling for audio files and even for like stuff like PDF files. And uh, this is like, this is just only the beginning. And I'm sure you will encounter a lot of um, different use cases, different examples as you continue learning um, Python programming. This video is going to be the first of a part of a series on object-oriented programming. So to start off with, let's try to understand and get an introduction into what is object-oriented programming. Well, as the name suggests, object-oriented programming is all about creating objects. An object is a group of interrelated variables and functions. Variables can be referred to as the properties of the object, whereas the functions can be referred to as the behavior of an object. So if we were to treat, say, for example, a car, as an object, its properties would be its color, its model, its price, and its brand. Whereas its behavior or functions for that matter would be like accelerating, gear change, braking. Similarly, if I gave you an example of a dog as an object, we could consider the properties of the dog as its weight or its name, its breed, its color. Whereas its functions could be say barking, playing, eating, walking, etc. Objects provide a better and a clear structure for a program. Now let's move on to what is a class and an instance. Now a class is like a blueprint or a template of certain functions and entities. Whereas an instance is a particular realization of a class. Classes are used to create user-defined data structures and define certain functions called methods within the class. Whereas instances are realizations of these classes. And uh, when we are speaking of classes and instances, classes don't contain any real data. They are just merely templates. Instances, on the other hand, contain real data. To think of an example of the difference between a class and an instance, think of a class like a empty form or a questionnaire. Now, an empty form of a questionnaire does not have any information, but it does have a template to it. It tells you to fill in certain information and based on who is filling in the information, that information or the data on a particular form will be different. So an instance is like a filled out form with its own uh, unique set of information. That is one way of uh, treating or understanding what is a class and an instance. Now, for our first example on classes, I will be taking you through a class where I've defined based on the circle object. So this class is going to define basically information about your uh, general circle, such as its radius and its area. So let's go through it. Now, obviously, to define a class, we need a keyword. Well, in the case of classes, we use the class keyword, followed by a name for that class. So in this case, my name is circle. Now, after the uh, colon, every every information that is part of the class has to be obviously indented as is typical for Python. Now, you can see over here a bunch of def keywords followed by so something that you might not be familiar with. And I will try to get you through this. So if you see here, you have a def keyword followed by init. And this init is uh, prefixed by a double underscore and it's suffixed by a double underscore. And you can see the same thing for str and repr. Well, this double underscore is called a dunder and any method, um, these are of course methods. This is a method. This is a method. This is a method. This is a method. Now, any method that is prefixed and suffixed by double underscores are called dunder methods. Um, these dunder methods are or can be thought of like predefined or built in methods for a, any class that you define. So these we have like uh, three dunder methods over here and uh, we have one user defined method that we will get to. So this first method that you see here is the init method or the initialization method. And this is invoked or called uh, whenever we create an instance of this class circle. And what we do here is basically we pass um, when we create this instance circle, uh, we are what what happens is that we are we get an option to pass an a, a value for a what what is this uh, keyword or variable radius 
So if I pass, so you will see me uh, later on creating an instance where um, I will be passing a value and that value is basically stored as the radius. And by default, the radius that will be passed when we create an instance for this uh, class is one. Um, the str method is basically used to return a descriptive string for the uh, the instance of um, class. Um, repr is not something that you have to bother with right now. And uh, now get area is something that you should follow because if you see here, I have not used any double underscores. So this is a user de user defined method. Um, user defined methods are so, so methods that we define, and these are like tasks that we define on our own. So in my user defined method called get area, I will be returning the area of the circle based on the radius that I pass to it. Now, if you notice here, the before every, um, in every method, I have the self keyword before any other attribute. So like this has self, this has self, even the get area has self. Now what this means, um, self is like an optional keyword that is used to improve readability of a program, first of all. And it's also the function of the self keyword is basically um, telling Python that, uh, well, any of the methods that we are invoking in this class or the instance of this class has to refer to attributes and variables within that instance of that class. So if I'm going to use get area function, I'm going to get values and attribute values and variable values based on only the current instance of um, that particular class. Self is obviously uh, optional, we don't really need it, but basically the first attribute of any method is, is basically the, is basically what the met, is the, is the instance that, um, the method is invoked upon. So if I say self, I'm telling, uh, this particular function that, okay, all the value that you're going to get for, uh, performing whatever task you want is going to be found in that particular instance where you have been invoked itself. Now, don't worry if all this is very confusing. Um, it, this might be in the beginning, but just try to understand that uh, this is something that we do for good practice and uh, you will understand uh, when, when to use self or when not to use self as you learn about object oriented programming. So if you see here, my get area function is supposed to return the value radius times radius. Self dot radius is basically telling um, whatever value I've passed for radius for that particular instance. You can read this as radius times radius times pi as well. So uh, obviously this is pi r squared, which is the area of a particular circle. Now let me show you an example where I'm going to perform some of these functions. So if you see this first line, I have created an instance of the class circle where I've passed 2.1 for the radius of the circle. So now the value of the variable radius in this particular instance is going to be stored as 2.1. And this particular instance is going to be stored in the variable c1. Now the print c1 function invokes the str self-defined or predefined function. Now if you remember str was, it's basically used to return a particular string that describes like what the class will do. And this is something that we define on our own. In our example, str will return the uh, the string saying this is a circle with radius of and then it will return the radius that we passed. So in this case, it should say this is the circle of radius 2.1 as you can see over here. So if I execute this, you can notice this line. This is a circle with radius 2.1 and this is invoked by the print function. The print basically invokes the dunder str function, which uh, does all of this. Now in the next line, we say print c1 dot get area. So this is going to print the value of the or what what gets returned when we invoke the method get area for this particular instance c1. So obviously in this particular instance, our radius is 2.1. So the get area function should do pi times 2.1 square. And the value is, as you can see here, is uh, some 13.85. So that is the area that we got. Now, if we want to print a particular radius, um, we just say print c1 dot radius. So this will print the value of what is, uh, what is stored in radius for the particular instance c1. Now you might notice me using a dot whenever it comes to defining a certain function or a keyword. Well, any time that we want to invoke or use a method of a particular class, we have to use the dot keyword. So we use the instance name c1 dot followed by whatever method that we want to use. So if we want to use the get area function, we say c1 dot get area. If we want to find out what is there in the radius uh, key uh, radius variable of a particular instance, we say c1 dot radius. Now, before we move on, let's talk about some of the naming conventions. Class names are initial capitalized. So if our class name is, um, for example, um, 
like for example if it's camel case well each word that is part of this class has its first letter capitalized variables and method names are in lower class so if my class was called circle we say class circle with c being in capital now moving on let's talk about how we initialize or define instance variables now instance variables are declared within the init method if you remember from the earlier example of circle init is a dunder method it's followed and it's preceded by double underscore as you can see here now if you see in this particular uh, case i have again used the self keyword and as i, I mentioned earlier the self keyword is the first parameter of all member methods um and it this basically binds that particular method to the particular instance itself during invocation so every time a new circle object is created the dot init function sets the initial state of the object by assigning the values of the object's properties so the init function basically initializes each and every new instance of um whatever of of our class so we can give in it any number of parameters but the first parameter must always be a variable called self now when a new class instance is created the instance is automatically passed to the self parameter in init so that new attributes can be defined on the object inside the init method the self dot radius basically means that we want the value of radius based on the current instance itself so as you can see radius defines an instance variable radius and we're going to use the particular instance and its value uh, of for radius in our variable radius now instance uh, the init i mean the init function is not a constructor but it is an initializer to create instance variables the init function also will never return a value and it is optional and can be omitted if there are no instance variables now let's move on to um class variables so now as we mentioned earlier all the attributes that are created inside the init function are instance specific attributes and the instance uh, attributes are obviously specific to a particular instance of the class for example all dog objects now if we have a class called dog then all dog objects have a name and age but the values for the name and age will vary depending on which dog we are topic talking about or basically which instance of the dog are we talking about now class attributes are attributes that have the same value for all class instances and we define a class attribute by assigning a value a value to a variable outside of the init function so if you look at this example over here we have created another class called circle and we have this initializer again where we have a class specific variable called radius uh, which whose value will change depending on whatever we pass for that particular instance however if you look before the init the init um init function or the initializer function If you see here we have another variable called shape object which stores the uh, string circle and this variable is going to be the same and constant for every instance of uh, the class circle and unlike the uh, variable radius we will not have different values depending on a particular instance okay now let's talk about instantiating an object and let's see what happens when we create two different instances of the same class So as you can see here I've created an instance C1 for class circle and I'm going to check its ID. Well, if you see the ID is something like this. Now if I create it in another instance over here called C2 and if I check its ID, well it's something different now. So if you see each instance basically has a different memory location in our uh memory um and each instance is this is how each instance is different each time we create it and they are created in different memory locations. Finally before we conclude this topic on um the introduction into OOP let's talk about class methods instance methods and static methods now class methods are um usually declared are, are actually declared with the um at class method operator or decorator as you can see here it accepts the class as its first argument so in this case i am going to say i'm going to define a class called my class i'm going to use this at class method decorator to say that whatever follows here is going to be a class method and i've defined a class method called hello that takes in a um that uses again self and a name uh, attribute so what this does is it prints um whatever i have uh, passed to it in the form of hello from uh self dot name now what this would this is going to do is basically it's going to give out a string saying hello from uh name of the whatever class we have and um whatever we pass in the attribute name so oh in this my particular in this case i'm going to invoke this method using the class name itself i'm not going to use an instance name because i have no instance um in this particular example and since this is a class method it can be invoked using the class name itself so i'm going to pass rakesh and let's see what happens when we do this 
as you can see, the first print will basically um, give us the information of the class itself. It's saying that the class is um, called my class and the second print statement is basically a string saying hello from uh, the string name my class with a uh, comma and then whatever we passed initially which was Rakesh. Next is then instance methods and these are the most common types of methods. Um, these are invoked by an instance object. So we have to create an instance to actually use an instance method and it takes the instance or the keyword self as its first argument. So if I say class or class, uh, if I define a class, my class in this example, um, and I'm going to define another function called hello. As you can see, I have not used any decorator like at uh, class method. So this is going to be an instance method and it's going to be invoked by the particular instance. So in this case, it's going to print uh, hello from and it's going to basically say the name of the class again. So I create my instance called my instance one and it's an instance of this class. And then I'm going to invoke the instance method by using this dot, dot operator and the instance name. And the result will be basically this string over here, as you can see. Now, finally, we have another type of method called the static method, which is declared using the add static method decorator. So a static method does not know its class and is just attached to the class for convenience. It does not depend on the state of the object and could be from a separate function of a module. A static method can be invoked via a class object or an instance object. So if you look at this example over here, I have defined a static method. Um, I've defined hello and it basically says print hello world. So it's going to basically just print this. So if you can see here, I've created my instance and I'm going to say dot hello. It should basically pre print print hello world. That's all. So um, the, guys, this was um, this was it for the introduction on OOP. In this video, we will continue our discussion on object oriented programming. In an earlier video, you might have gone through the introduction into OOP. In this video, we will continue that discussion on OOP with inheritance. Inheritance is used to describe the relationship between two classes, wherein one class takes the methods and properties from another class. In this relationship, we have something called the base class or the parent class from which we will derive all or some of the properties and methods and the class which actually derives these properties and methods is known as the derived class. So you can think of the derived class as a specialized version of a base class. To explain what inheritance is in a basic way, I will show you uh, an example where I'm creating a cylinder class, which is going to be a subclass of the circle class that you might have encountered in the earlier video on OOP. So what we're going to do is create a cylinder class that is a subclass of circle, where we're going to get the attributes radius and get area from circle class. And we're going to add the attributes height and get volume to the cylinder. So right off the start, you can see we have our class circle that you might have seen in the earlier video. So this class circle has the familiar initialization where we are supposed to enter a value for a radius that gets stored in self dot radius. Now we also have a description string, which basically is a uh, dunder method that uh, returns a string when we invoke the print command on a particular instance. And we have the get area method as well. Now if we move on to the cylinder class, you can see that I'm defining this class with the class keyword with the cylinder name, but you can see that I have added a parenthesis and within it, I have mentioned the name of the super class that I want the cylinder class to be a subclass of. So this is how we actually define a subclass in uh, the most basic way. You enter the name that you want and you enter the name of the super class that you want the subclass to be a, a subclass of in parenthesis right after the name. Now, next, if you move on to the dunder initialization, um, the initialization is very familiar, familiar, except now we have another attribute for height, which has a de default value of one, just like the radius. So this basically means that we have an option of entering two different attributes for our cylinder instances. Now, if you see here, there's a line which says super dot init. Now, this is like, um, this is a command which we use to invoke the super classes initializer. So anytime we create an instance for cylinder, we also want an initialization for the circle method as well as a part of our cylinder instance. Next, you can see that um, much like how we stored self, uh, I mean the radius attribute in self dot radius, uh, we're also storing the height attribute in self dot height. Now, even this uh, cylinder class has an str uh, method to return a particular string if we use this uh, print function. And uh, finally, we get on to uh, a more uh, a new method that we have defined only for the cylinder class called get volume. Now, um, if you see the get volume, it returns as basically the volume of um, the cylinder that is being described in the particular instance for which we enter the height and the radius. 
So if you can see here, uh, what we've basically added extra is an, a height attribute and another method called get volume. And the other parts of um, the circle superclass, such as radius and get area, are also going to be a part of cylinder, even though you do not explicitly see them anywhere here. And we will see how in, a, in the form of an example that's coming up. So let me just execute these classes now that that's done. I'm going to create an instance for cylinder. I'm going to store it in CY1 and I'm going to pass 1.1 for the radius and 2.2 for the height. And once that is done, let's just print um, to invoke the str method. And as you can see, the str method basically tells us the information that it's a cylinder with radius 1.1 and height 2.2. So now let's print what is the value we get when uh, we use the get area method. Now it's important to note get area was not explicitly defined in the cylinder subclass, but it's a method that is a part of the circle superclass. And we can see that we can actually access methods that are part of the superclass simply by um, accessing any other method. So if you use a dot get area, you can see that we get a value for the area of uh, so the cylinder. So this basic, this area is uh, basically the area of the circle face of the cylinder, uh, the top or the bottom. Now let's use, now let's invoke uh, the subclass specific method, which is the get volume method in a similar manner. As you can see, just by uh, doing invoking this method, we get the volume as well. Now, um, if we want to see what is the radius and the height, we can just do a simple print statement followed by cy1.radius cy1.height and it gives us both of these values as you can see here. Now over here, what I'm going to do is create another instance of cylinder, but I'm not going to pass anything for radius or height. So basically, it's going to take the default values for radius and height, which was 1 and 1 respectively. So once I print, um, this is this statement is basically going to print the str method or whatever we stored in the str which is basically the description of the object followed by what is its radius and height uh, this method will give us the area and this method will give us the volume so once i execute this as you can see here this is what we get and uh, this is what we expect as well so uh, now in this example what i'm going to show you is uh, now i'm going to go back and I am going to create another instance for circle now. This is the super class, of course, and I'm going to give it, and since the super class has only one option, uh, one attribute that we can enter, which is for the radius. So I pass 3.3 and I'm going to print what, what happens when I just print, uh, this instance. It's going to basically give us whatever was, uh, a part of the str method. Uh, after that, I'm going to print is instance. This, this is basically a check on whether C1 is an instance of this class circle. And next I'm going to check if C1 is an instance of its subclass cylinder. Now when I execute this, you can see that, uh, well, this is what we, uh, this is the str method that gets printed. But if you see here, um, you can see that it says C1 is indeed a, an instance of circle when it says true over here. But when we look at the next line, is C1 an instance of cylinder? It says false. And this is obviously because um, a superclass object is never uh, an instance of a subclass object. Well, as, whereas vice versa, it would be true. Now, in the next part of this video, what we're going to do is look at the different types of inheritances in Python. So there are basically five types of inheritance in Python. There is the single inheritance, there's multiple inheritance, multi-level inheritance, hierarchical, hierarchical and uh, hybrid in inheritance. So we will go one by one and see each of these examples. Starting off, we have the single inheritance. This is simply where we have one base class and one derived class from that base class. So this is a simple uh, single inheritance. And in this example, you can see I have a class called country where I have a method that I have defined called show country, which is basically going to say print uh, this is India. It's basically going to go print this every time we invoke this show country method. Then we have a class called state, um, which derives uh, from the super class called country where we have a method called show state which is going to say print this is state every time so you can see i created an instance of the class state and uh, um, through that instance i can access the super class and the uh, subclass methods over here next we have the multi-level uh, sorry multiple inheritance and this is when uh, a derived class contains more than one base class so uh, let's look at an example to understand this so if you can see here i have a class called student with uh, two methods defined called uh, method one and method two. In method one, we can pass uh, two attributes, SN, SNO, or I think it is, this is supposed to be like uh, an ID, I guess, like SN number, and we have S name. So this is basically two attributes we can pass um, that are probably descriptors for a student. And um, in the next method, you have uh, basically uh, two print statements, which says student number, and then they will print the student number, and uh, it will also print the student name. 
Um, next, we have a class called marks. This is also, um, so these, these two classes are basically what our super classes are going to be. And we're going to derive a third class from these two. So this uh, second class is a class called marks. And we have two uh, methods. Again, one method is called set marks, which has um, the option of putting in two attributes, M1 and M2, both uh, representative of the two marks. And we store them in self.mark1, self.mark2. The second method is uh, put marks which is uh, going to print the marks, um, namely mark one, and then it's going to tell us how much uh, marks are there in the first uh, subject, for example, and another print statement doing the same thing for um, the second subject or mark two. Finally, we have a third class called a uh, result, which derives from two classes, marks and student. As you can see here in my parenthesis, I've passed in marks and student. Both are super classes and uh, our uh, class result is going to derive from both of them. This is an example of multiple inheritance. And within this class result, I have uh, two methods uh, specific to this uh, derived class called calc, uh, wherein I'm going to basically calculate the two, the total marks of um, uh, the uh, the total marks, which is basically the addition of mark one plus mark two, and I'm then I'm going to have another method called uh, put total, which is going to print me what is the total. So if you can see here, I have created an instance of this derived class called uh, result. I am storing it in R. Then I'm going to access uh, method one, which is obviously a method from the first super class called student. Um, and I'm going to store okay. So this is uh, name is I guess lucky, and he has sixty marks. Uh, secondly, then I'm going to do our set marks, which is the method from the second super class, which is going to set the marks, uh, respectively. So you have lucky student and his ID is 60 and he has got 50 and 60 marks respectively, um, in say the first two subjects. And, uh, finally, I'm going to access the uh, derived class method called calc. So this is going to do the sum. Uh, finally, I'm going to also do our method two, which is, um, going to print our student number and his student name. Next, we're going to have put marks, which is going to tell us the, um, what are the individual marks, uh, for mark one and mark two. And then finally, we're going to, to print the total marks with the put total. So once I execute this, you can see here it says student number 60, student name lucky. Marks one is 50, as I had written here. Marks two is 60, as I passed here. And then total is 110, which is basically 50 plus 60. Our next type of inheritance is called multi-level inheritance. Now, multi-level inheritance can be assumed as where you take a super class, let's call it A, and you derive a class B from that class A. Now, what if we derived a class C from B and we kept doing this? So uh, until say a class E. Now each of these steps is uh, in its own an inheritance, but this whole relationship can be described as a multi-level inheritance. So um, let's take an example again. So I've, this, this time I've defined a class uh, called student where I have defined two methods called set stud and uh, put stud, or you can uh, call it set student and put student. In my first method, I have two options of adding two attributes. Again, this is the student number, this is the student name. In my second uh, method, I am going to print what is the student number and what is the student name. Finally, uh, so sorry, next we have another class called marks, which derives from the first uh, class called student. Uh, this has two methods called set marks where I'm going to again get the option of adding two um, integers for M1 and M2, um, which is going to represent mark one and mark two. And finally, I have put marks, the method which is going to print mark one and mark two. Um, finally, I have another class called result. And this, if you see, um, this derives from marks. Now, if you see this relationship, you'll notice result derives from marks, whereas marks itself derives from student. And this is an example of multi-level hierarchy. And uh, even as a part of this third class, we have its own uh, methods called calc and put total. Um, calc will calculate the total as we had seen earlier and put total will basically print that total. And we're going to do a very similar operation. We're going to create an instance of this third class uh, result and store it in R. Um, then we're going to do basically, we're going to set the student details, uh, his uh, student number and his name. We're going to give him his marks 50 and 60. We're going to calculate what are the total we're going to say, okay, now put the details of um, what is the student's number and name. We're going to also store, enter, I mean, display his marks, mark one and mark two. And finally, we're going to display the total marks. So let's execute this. And if you see, um, it's basically the similar operation that we did earlier. But the only difference is in the earlier example, our, uh, our third class result was derived from marks and student together. Um, so this was an example of multiple inheritance. Whereas in this example, the result class 
derives from Marx and Marx itself derives from students. So this is an example of multi-level inheritance. Finally, we have, um, sorry, not finally, uh, penultimately, we have um, as our fourth example of uh, inheritance called a uh, hierarchical inheritance. Uh, pardon my mispronunciation, it's hierarchical inheritance. So in this case, a base class basically will contain more than one derived class. So let's uh, look at an example of what we mean here. So I have a class called one where I have defined a method called display where what I'm going to do is I'm going to store self.x is equal to uh, 1000 and self.y is equal to 2000. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to print a statement saying this is the method in class 1 and I'm going to say uh, after that I'm going to print another statement saying value of x is uh, self.x which is going to be 1000. Uh, then I'm going to have another print statement saying value of y is self.y which is going to be 2000. Finally, um, I mean, next I have another class called two. This, this is going to derive from class one, as you can see here. And in this class two, I have defined another method called add. And in this method add, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first print a statement saying this is the method in class two. And then I'm going to actually uh, print the result of x plus y, which is 1000 plus 2000. Finally, I have another class called uh, three. And this is also deriving from one. So if you notice, we have one parent class called one. And from this one uh, parent class, we're going to derive two different subclasses called two and three. So this is an example of hierarchical inheritance. Now in this uh, class three, what I've done is I've defined a multiplication method. And what I'm going to do is print, first of all, I'm going to print this uh, when I invoke this method that this is the method in class three. Finally, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to print the result of X times Y, which is 1000 times 2000. So if you see, I am going to create an instance of two and I'm going to create an instance of three and I'm going to store them in T1 and T2. Now since uh, T2, I mean T1 is an instance of two, so I can access its methods add and I can access its methods display. So I'm going to use T1.display and even in two, uh, T2 I mean, since it's a class uh, it's an instance of class three and this also derives from class one. I can also access its method display, but now I cannot access add, but I can access multiply. So if you see here, I access add through T1 instance since add is a part of class two, whereas multiply is a, uh, uh, is, is a method in class three. So I access it in its respective instance, which is T2. So if you see here, now once I execute this, what you will get is basically, um, the results. So first of all, it will basically display the method from uh, class one, which is a display method, it will display the values of X and Y. And since I've done this twice from two different instances, uh, it will basically show a repetition over here. Finally, I've done the addition. And since this is a, a method in class two, it is going to say as much that this is a method in class two. And then it's going to say X plus Y is 3000. And now multiply is a method in the third class. So it's going to say this is a uh, method in class three, and it's going to tell me what is the multiplication result. Finally, we have what is called hybrid inheritance. And this is a combination of multiple plus multi-level inheritance that you saw earlier. So um, let's again understand this through this example. So we have a class called student where we have a method called set student. Um, again, two attributes we can pass here for student number and student name. Next, we have a another method part of the class student called put student. So this will print us the student number and student name. Next, we have a class called marks and this marks inherits from student. So uh, we have a method in uh, class marks called uh, cell set marks where we can pass two attributes for mark one and mark two respectively. And uh, as we had saw, seen earlier, we also have a put marks which will display the marks for marks one and marks two. We have a class called practical. Uh, this practical is basically a another super class. If you see here, since this does not derive from anything, it is a super class on its own. And what it does is it, uh, it has two methods, get practical, um, and we can, uh, pass an attribute for P1 here, and we store that in self.p1. And then we have an attribute for, uh, put practical, um, which will print us the practical mark, whatever we passed for this attribute in P1. Finally, if you see, we have a class called result. Now in this result, we have, we are going to derive from marks and practical. But if you notice here, marks itself is a subclass of student. So this is an example of multi-level inheritance. Whereas since result uh, derives from marks and practical both, it is also an example of multiple inheritance. So if you see, notice here, uh, this is an example of multiple and multiple level inheritance, which is basically what we call hybrid inheritance. And as uh, we had seen earlier, this result class will have a calc method to um, do a total of the marks. Um, in this case, mark one plus mark two plus the practical mark P1. 
and we have a put total method which is basically going to print us the total. So now we're going to create an instance of this result and uh, through this instance of result we're going to first invoke the parent class method called set student which is the the second level parent basically the student uh, the student class um, set student method. So we're going to set student here and we're going to say 60 is a student ID and name is Ash. Then we have set marks, which is again the, the, the second level parent, which is a student class, um, where we set the marks. Finally, we access this get practical. Now, if you notice, get practical is part of, um, the practical, uh, super class. So in this, we store the third subject of the, the practical marks 100. Then we calculate the total and we put, uh, first the student details, then we put the individual marks, then we put the practical marks, and finally we enter what is the total. So let's execute this. And if you notice, you will see here student number is 60, student name and all the basically whatever details we wanted um, is shown over here. So this was it guys for um, our video on inheritance. In this video, we will continue our discussion on object oriented programming with the topic of polymorphism. Now the term polymorphism in OOP refers to the ability of an object to adapt the code to the type of data it is processing. Polymorphism is one of the key concepts of Python and it is also a built-in feature of Python. An example to get us started on polymorphism would be how we use the plus operator. We use the plus operator not only for arithmetic additions but we also use the plus operator for stuff like string concatenations or joining two lists together. This example where we are able to use the plus operator for different, uh, different operations is an example of polymorphism. To show you what I mean, I have basically done a simple addition operation here, where I'm adding two variables, number one and number two. When I do it on integers, it basically adds one plus two. Now when I use it on two strings, str1 and str2, which contains Python and programming, two separate uh, strings, and when I use the plus operator on these, you can see what it does here. It forms um, one string containing both of these individual strings. So this is basically the plus operator showing polymorphism, and is one of the simplest occurrences and, and yet most most common occurrences of polymorphism in Python. Another example of polymorphism would be through the lens function. The lens function in Python is something that we use a lot and over multiple data types. Depending on the data type that we use the length function for, we get a different value or a different um, sort of information from the length function. Now if you see here from this diagram, when we use the length function on a string, it gives us the length of the string. When we use the length function on a list, it gives us the number of items. Whereas if we use the length function on a dictionary, it gives us the number of keys. So this is, well, another example of how we have polymorphism in a function. Now what we're going to do is look at the different techniques through which we can enable polymorphisms in our code. Our first example that we are going to look at is through method overloading. Now method overloading in its traditional sense where we can have a method with the same name, uh, more than one method with the same name in the same class is um, not exactly possible in Python. So if we have multiple methods with the same name in a class in Python, which uh, may differ in, uh, in types and number of arguments are not allowed and not supported in Python. In fact, if we did something like this, where we created a method with um, different uh, with different say types and number and arguments but having the same name um, in the same class then what python will do is it will only recognize the the last defined method and uh, it will um, not recognize any of the earlier methods with the same name but we can simulate polymorphism through method more over overloading by using default arguments in a method now for example what i'm going to show you here is an example where i have a method called sum. Now by default, uh, it has three attributes that you can pass through this uh, method. A uh, does not have a default value. B does not have a default value. But if you notice, C has a default value zero. So this is a, a simple example where I'm going to show you that the sum method is um, going to be used in two different cases. In one case, we're going to simply add two digits, uh, I mean two numbers. And in another case, we're going to use the sum method to add three different numbers. So we have this class overload demo within it a method sum and I have three attributes a and b are uh uh, have uh, are supposed to be given by the user since they don't have any since they do not have any default values whereas c has a default value zero so if you see here in my first case i have uh, i first of all created a, an instance called over uh, an, uh, an instance called od for the class overload demo and uh, i have 
uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to store the value of the sum of 7 and 8 in the variable sum. Now if you see here, I have not passed a third argument. So what this uh, method is going to do is it's going to take the value of c as 0 by default. So it's basically going to do uh, 7 plus 8 and it's going to give us the sum for 7 plus 8. And in the next instance, I'm going to give three ad arguments, 7, 8 and 9. So now c will be replaced by 9 instead of 0 and then I'm going to get the sum of 7, 8 and 9. So in this, this is a not a very used and uh, not a very commonly used thing uh, but it's basically a method just to show you that we can actually simulate method overloading in python uh, by using default arguments so i've basically shown you how the same uh, how the same method sum has been used to uh, do the addition of two digits and then in in another instance is doing the addition of three digits it might look very similar but it, you'll basically notice that by having this uh, third attribute c i have a default value of zero i have induced some form of polymorphism through method overloading now the next way that we can induce polymorphism is through inheritance which is called method overriding as well now method overriding gives us the ability to change the way or the change the implementation of a method in a child class which is defined already um, in one of its super classes. Now if there is a method in a super class, the method having the same name and same number of arguments in a child class, uh, then the child class method is going to override the method in the parent class. So what we do is when a method is called with the parent class object, the method of the parent class will be executed. Whereas if we call the method using the child class object, the method of the child class will be executed, executed and it will override the method in the parent class. So the appropriate overridden method is called, uh, is called based on the object type, which is an example of polymorphism. So let's look at an example to understand this. So we have a class called person and we have defined, uh, what we're going to define the initializer is two attributes which we have to pass called name and age and we're going to store them in self.name and self.age. Now we have a user defined method called display data where we are going to print if this display data has been called through the parent called person, um, if it's going to be called through the parent class object then we're going to print uh, in parent class display method and then we're going to print the name and age that we have entered now we have another uh, class called employee which is going to be a derived class on person so it's going to um, so it's also going to have an ini an initializer and this constructor will basically um, what what this in initializer will have is it'll have an uh, constructor for the super class where we're going to do this uh, the same initialization that we do in the super class but we're also going to store another attribute called id in self dot employee id and if you see here we also have another method called display data which is the same named method from person but now if you see in display data i have every i have all the same almost the same information i'm going to print the name i'm going to print the age but if you see the first statement i'm going to say uh, if i'm going to call this method from the employee object then i'm going to say in child class display data method instead of in parent class display data method to say that basically I'm invoking this method from the child class object and I'm also going to print on top of the whatever I'm printing before I'm also going to print the employee ID so if you see here I have created an object called person um, which is uh, an object of the class person with the information of name John and age 40 and then I'm going to display this now next I'm going to create an object called emp which is the child class employee object which is going to sh uh, now have the same information of John for the name and age 40 but now it's going to have an employee ID and then I'm going to store this uh, in emp and I'm going to display the data for this child class object and we will see the difference in how the display data is uh, differing from the earlier uh, earlier case. So when I execute this you see the f in the first case it says in parent class display data method so this uh, display data has been called through the parent class object and I'm only going to show the information of name and age whereas when I invoke this method from the employee class object it's going to say uh, it's going to specifically say that it's a in child class display method and then I'm going to say the name age and also the employee ID over here so this is the difference between how display data has been used in its parent and its child class and this is basically the example of method overriding now our next example of polymorphism uh, is going to be through operator overloading. An operator overloading is the ability to overload the operator to provide extra functionality in additional to its um, real or core operation. 
And operator overloading is also an example of polymorphism as the same operator can perform different actions. The earlier example of where we use the plus operator for different operations is an example of operator overloading polymorphism. Now when, um, when, when is operator overloading required? Well, um, anytime you want an operator to perform a different function for you in your custom objects, you would basically do operator overloading. Now an example of this would be what I'm going to show you below. So if you see this class called point, it has an initializer where I'm going to store two attributes x and y in self dot x and y and self dot, uh, in self dot x and self dot y. Now I'm going to create one object called p1 where I'm going to create point uh, one and two. So you can think of this object as basically like a coordinate x coordinate one, y coordinate two. This is one point and another point called uh, uh, x coordinate three, x coordinate four. I'm going to call that p2. Now I want to print p1 plus p2. All right. Now, if I try to execute this, you will notice an error. It says unsupported operand types for plus, point and point. This basically means that plus does not know what to do when it's given an object of this type. It has no idea what to do. Whereas, what we want it to do is add the, the, the x coordinate from this point and the x coordinate from this point. So we want it to do a 1 plus 3. And we also want it to do this y coordinate plus this y coordinate or 2 plus 4. And then we want to print basically like something like 4, comma six or the addition of the two points uh, or the the vector addition of these two points. So this is what we want this plus operator to do. But the uh, Python does not have any inbuilt feature for the plus operator. And we are going to have to basically do some operator overloading to create a polymorphism on this. So let's see how we can do that. So to do that, first of all, we have to understand that all operators in Python have internally defined methods to provide functionality for these operators. The operator or the uh, special method to uh, provide functionality for the plus operator in Python is the add method. And whenever the plus operator is used, we are basically internally, uh, internally invoking the add method. So uh, these, these sort of internal methods that provide functionality for the operators are part of a big, a bigger class of methods known as magic methods. And these magic methods are automatically invoked whenever its corresponding operators are used. So we want to change um, the, uh, the operation for um, the plus operator in this example, we are going to have to use the, the add method in this case. And since it's a magic method, uh, magic methods are also are, are basically what we saw earlier in the, in the form of dunder methods. So magic methods are going to be invoked using uh, double underscore uh, a prefix and suffix to it. So similarly to how we defined an init of uh, an init method or an str method, we are going to also invoke the add method using the same double underscore before and after its name. So now let's see how we're going to do this. So if you see this class, I have now my class point and I have the same uh, initializer when I'm going to store x and y. Now I am going to define on uh, these, this add magic method, I'm going to override the, no the normal functionality of plus and I'm going to give it a very specific function where I'm going to say um, for two, two different objects, you're going to add its uh, the first part, the first part or its so-called x coordinate with the other x coordinate and it, the y coordinate with the other y coordinate and you need to return, return this to me in the form of a similar object. So now when I pass one and two and three and four, it should return me four and six. As you can see here, I have basically done what I wanted to do by operator overloading. I have changed or I have overloaded this add this plus operator using this add magic method. And I have created a new functionality for this add function for these two points, one and two, three and four. Now I'm able to add one comma two, three comma four in the way I wanted to. So now that you saw how we did our operator overloading, I'm just going to show you um, a list of uh, similar magic methods for different operators that we are familiar with. So the plus operator already we've seen has uh, the add method. Then we have the minus operator with the sub method. And similarly, we have for all of these operations such as multiplication division, we have its respective magic methods. These magic methods are again prefixed with uh, two underscores and suffix with two underscores and they are basically they are also called uh, dunders in python so this is how we would do operator overloading in python for whatever operator we want uh, similarly we can do this for like comparison operators and for unary operators as well so look at this example now where i'm going to overload the uh, multiplication or the uh, asterisk operator so i have again defined a point uh, i mean a class called point i'm going to define an initializer where i'm going to store some attribute x in self.x now what I'm going to do is I'm going to overload the multiplication operator where I'm going to basically allow the uh, this asterisk operator to multiply two objects 
uh, from like for example 12 and 5. Usually I can just do a normal 12 times 5 but in this case my object is slightly different. My 12 is being passed through an object uh, of a class called point and 5 as well in another uh, instance of the same class. Now when I want to multiply these class instances like the the multiplication operator does not perceive these class instances to be integers. So by default it would not be able to multiply what we want to multiply but when we define um, or we overload the multiplication operator within our class, it's now able to understand what to do um, using the attributes of these classes in its respective uh, class instances. So it's able to say, okay, so I want this attribute from this particular instance p1, 12, and I'm going to multiply it with the attribute 5 from instance p2, whenever I say p1 times p2 or p1 asterisk p2. So when I execute it, it will give me 12 times 5. Similarly, I can also do this for the greater than operator over here. So I have a class called person where I'm going to define an initializer where I'm going to pass name and salary and store them in self.name, self.salary. The um, GT method is basically the greater than method, uh, magic method, and it's going to, uh, we're going to use this to overload the greater than operator. And now again, uh, using this greater than operator, I'm able to uh, basically say object one greater than object two, and I'm, I'm basically able to check through this. And if object one is greater than object two, it will basically tell us if it is true or false or uh, basically whatever like we want to know. So basically the, the print statement will check for uh, object one dot name and it will say earns more than object two dot name if in case object one is indeed greater than object two. So when I execute this, you can see here, uh, my first information says John has is earning 4,500 of some units. Natasha is earning 6,000 of some units. So it will say uh, John earns more than Natasha. Well, it's false because object one is not greater than object two. So uh, since 4,500 is not actually greater than 6,000. And this is the check that I'm doing by overloading the GT operator over here, where I'm, so, where I'm returning the Boolean value of uh, what is greater self dot salary or other dot salary self being the first uh, object in any comparison so in the if i'm basically any comparison if i'm doing say if i'm doing five greater than five greater than six so what the gt will do is this will be the self object and this will be the other object so this is what i'm doing over here i'm checking self dot salary with other dot salary in in the form of these objects and it's basically the same same way that we we are able to do 5 plus 5 through these class instance objects that you saw earlier or 12 times 5 that you saw earlier so this is all examples of operator overloading in python well this was it for polymorphism in this video we will be learning about exceptions exceptions are errors that are raised during the execution of a program um, when an, an error occurs python generates this exception that can be handled uh, which avoids our program from crashing. Python has many built-in exceptions. Uh, however, we can create many uh, user-defined errors or exceptions as well to catch whatever errors we're looking for in our program. So when an error occurs, Python interpreter raises an exception and stops the current process and uh, it passes it to a calling process until the exception is handled. And if this is not handled, the program will crash. Um, some of the uh, built-in exceptions are like uh, IO error in the case when a file cannot be opened or import error, Python cannot find the particular module being imported. And uh, there are so many similar, uh, so many uh, exceptions that are built in in Python for the appropriate cases. Now, before we move on and see how we raise these exceptions, um, let's look at the difference between an exception and a syntax error. So for that, I will be using an example where I will be dividing something by the number zero. Of course, this is not possible. So let's see how Python handles this pro particular problem. Well, it raises something that it raises what we call a zero division error. And this is an exception that is built in in Python whenever we try to divide something by zero. Now let's look at the difference between this exception and a syntax error. So this is the same statement, except I'm going to add this extra bracket which does not make sense syntactically in this. Now, if I try to execute this, as you can see, we get a different type of error known as the syntax error. Um, and it says the unmatched closing bracket. So this is uh, what a syntax error looks like, like an extra bracket or a comma uh, that basically makes the line unreadable to the interpreter in the first place. So the, the interpreter doesn't even get to the point where it, it needs to figure out uh, that there's something being divided by zero. It doesn't even get to that point because it finds this extra bracket and it uh, cannot execute this line at all. So that is like the difference between an, uh, an exception and a syntax error. All right. Now for our first case of how we raise or how we handle exceptions, let's look at the, uh, the keyword raise. 
So for this example, what I will be doing is um, I'm going to take this uh, variable x, all right, and I'm going to store a value 10. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to check for a condition. If x is greater than 5, then I'm going to raise this exception using the raise keyword like this. And in case this condition is met, if x is actually greater than 5, I want this particular message to play out in my uh, exception. So let's see what happens when I execute this. As you can see, the exception is raised because x is indeed greater than 5, its value is 10. And the error message says as so that x should not exceed 5, the value of x was 10. So this is an example of how we can raise an exception. And as you can see, when a condition was met, the program comes to a halt and an exception was raised. Now let's look at another type of uh, handling exception where we use the assert statement. So when we use the raise command, we waited until an error occurred and our program crashed midway, right? What if we want to check if a condition is met? And if this condition is met, then the, then the program can continue. But if the condition turns out to be false, then we want a particular error, namely the assertion error exception to be thrown to us. So we can use the assert command in such a case. So in our example, we will be checking um, whether the system that we are working on is actually Linux or Windows 32. So let's see. First of all, let's import a library called sys. This is the, uh, it's a library which where we can access system information. One of the modules in that is uh, one of the functions in that is the platform. It basically tells us like, what system are we working on. So we're working on a Win32 system. Okay. So um, let's now let's use the assert keyword. All right. Now we're going to check if Linux is what we are working on. And in case it is not, then we want an error message and this will be the error the error will obviously be an assertion uh, error because we are using the assert keyword so this is uh, how we use the assert statement and if we execute this as you can see we get the assertion error because sysstar platform contains win32 and not linux and so we got this assertion error so if we change this to check for windows system we won't have any error when we execute this as you can see so this is uh, the example where we use the assert statement Another way of handling exceptions is by using the try and accept block. So this is probably one of the most common ways of handling exceptions in Python, um, where we um, use a try keyword and an accept keyword. Now within the try keyword, as you can see here, we have a chunk of code, um, which we're going to check. And if everything is fine in the try keyword, then this is perfect. So we don't need to move on to what we call the accept part of the uh, try and accept block. But if say there was an error in the try block, then we move on to the uh, accept block where uh, we're going to run the pa part of the code in the case we find an error in the try block. So first we check the chunk, uh, the part of the code that is under the try block. And if, if there is an error, we move on to the accept block. And we run that part of the code over there and where we and in the accept block where we that is where we handle our whatever error that might get thrown our way in the try block okay let's look at an example at how to uh, use this technique so i have a basic function out here all right it's um, defining a function called linux interaction what this is uh, basically doing is that when i call this function i want to do an assert check i'm going to check if linux is the system i'm working on and if it is not then I want this error to be thrown okay and um, so yeah let's see what happens in the case and if if this uh, search statement is actually passed then we will move on to this statement so you could look at it like this if when I, I mean when I call this function it will first check for this assert statement in case something wrong happens and we get an assert error then we do not move on to this line so we only get this printed but if this assert statement passes then we move on to this line and we get print doing something okay so let's see now i'm going to call this function out here let's see what happens here as you can see i get an assertion error because obviously this is a windows system and not a linux system and i get this message okay now let's see what happens when we use it in a try and accept block all right so now i have a try block over here in which i am going to try the same this function linux underscore interaction if in case i find an error i immediately jump from the try block into the accept block now you see the slight difference in how we handle this like what happens so as you can see when we use the function explicitly we directly went to what we called an assertion error but when we use a try and accept block we will not use the assertion error because we are leaving the try block immediately and we're going to go into the accept block where oh, the only thing we're doing is printing the statement as you can see we are not on linux found some error okay now what if we wanted to catch the error within uh, this function itself which was the assertion error and we can do that explicitly like this so now what I'm doing is I'm going to try 
all right and it's going to catch an error in this right so now in the accept block i'm going to say the assertion error that we found in this function in the try block we're going to use that in our accept block so as you can see we're going to print that assertion error it will basically print this statement function can only run on linux systems as you can see here function can only run on linux systems function can only run on linux systems and uh, the next part of the thing was the linux interaction function was not executed okay so this is um, a very this is like um, this is a key there's a key uh, something very important happening here when we use this assert statement the whole program is actually getting executed right uh, but when we're using a try and accept block we are immediately jumping on like the moment we catch an error we are immediately jumping on to the accept statement and uh, however and all the handling of the exception is done in the accept block and not in the try block anymore so we have to uh, think of it like this that the try block is only to check if a particular piece of code is uh, like does it have any errors or not and in case it does then every uh, like all the handling that we do is uh, in the accept block of this uh, particular statement now let's look at another example in this example i'm going to try opening a particular file now this file does not exist so i will be i will get a file not found error and this is a built in exception and i'm going to catch that and i'm going to print that error uh, over here in the accept block all right so as you can see file not found and whatever like error i have i printed over here all right so this is another like this is uh, a file not found error that we are going to that we we caught in our try block and we're handling it in the accept block now let's use now let's combine both of the examples where we use this linux interaction and we also try to uh, open a particular file and we try to do both things in the try block and since both of these contain errors let's see what happens when we try to what happens when we have like multiple errors in a try block so as you can see in my try block i'm not only doing this linux interaction i'm also trying to uh, open a particular file that does not exist obviously so now you might think will i get two exceptions well let's see what happens when we try to uh, execute this so uh, it's important to note that in our accept we have an accept for uh, catching a file not found error and we also have an accept for finding um, uh, the assertion error that uh, that is part of this linux interaction function so so since both of these uh, are erroneous statements or uh, they will throw exceptions so now the question is will we get both of these accept blocks or will we get both of these exceptions will we get only one of them will we get the first one so let's see what happens so as you can see my error statement is is very much like the assertion error that i had that we had done as part of this linux underscore interaction function function can only run on linux systems the linux function was not executed so as you can see that that is the one that has been caught and for some reason the file not found error has not been caught and this is because this is a very important feature of the try block the moment we find the first error in our try block we immediately leave and we do not execute any of the further statements and we jump into the exceptions and we handle it using the accept blocks so the moment an error was found in this function we do not execute this part of the statement and we directly jumped into the respective exception that was the assertion error exception so this is a key takeaway so some of the some of the other key takeaways when it comes to exceptions is a try clause is executed up until the point where the first exception is encountered and in the accept clause or the exception handler we determine how the program responds to this uh, exception we can have multiple exceptions and we can differentiate how the program uh, responds to each of these and it's also very important to not use uh, accept clause on its own it's uh, very important not to use a bare accept clause now finally before we conclude this uh, topic of exceptions let's look at the else and the finally clause so the else clause is used when we want to execute a particular piece of code uh, in the case uh, where we have no exceptions or no errors found so let's look at this just like we had the linux interaction function i'm going to define a win underscore, underscore interaction and this is going to check whether our system is windows or not in case it is not then we get this error message all right and in case it is a windows uh, uh it is a windows system we print this in the case of uh, when we call this function so let's again use our try and accept statement only in this case we will be using an extra else clause so we first try this function in case there's an error we catch it as an assertion error and we print that error but if there is no uh, exception then we move on to the else statement and we print this so as you can see our uh, 
we have actually moved on to the else statement and we print this line executing the else clause and that is because we have found no exceptions over here so again it's key to remember that the else clause is used whenever we want to execute a particular statement in the case where we do not find any exceptions in the try block the finally clause is used when we want to execute something regardless of um, whether we have an error or an exception or not so no matter if an exception happens i mean is raised or if it's not raised we want this finally block to always get executed and let's look at uh, how it's let's look at an example of it being used so i have this block uh, where i'm doing a lot of things so the first thing that i'm doing is i'm going to check for this linux interaction function which is going to check of course whether it's a linux a system or not this is i'm doing the try block now if i catch an error that I want to be, uh, I want to handle it by simply printing the error over here. And in the event that uh, there is no error, then I will move on to the else statement and I will try uh, this particular block of my statement, which is again that uh, where I'm trying to read a particular file that does not exist. And it's very, uh, it's, it's very important uh, that you note that within the else block, I have another try and accept block and this is perfectly legal and it's perfectly valid in our program. We can do this. So think of it like this. I'm first trying this. If I have an error, then I do this and I don't uh, execute this. But if I don't have an error, then I execute this whole statement, which contains its own try and accept block. All right. But regardless of whether I get an error here or not, um, I will always execute this portion of my statement uh, or under the finally clause. So let's execute this. As you can see, of course, the error uh, is raised in this try, this try block. So we move on to the exception and that is what is printed over here. And uh, after the exception is done, we move on to the finally. We, of course, skip this else block because the exception was actually raised. So after that is done, we move on to the finally block where uh, we print this uh, particular statement. Well, that was it for an introduction into um, exceptions in Python. I hope you learned something from this. And um, of course, this is just the beginning. Exceptions are something that you will be, uh, that you would probably encounter a lot, especially when you're beginning. And it's something that you will uh, learn to extensively work with. And that will also help you improve in your uh, programming. In this video, we will be taking a brief introduction into what is a function. So a function in Python is a group of related statements that performs a specific task or tasks. Now functions help break our program into smaller and modular pieces of code. And it's very good and very uh, convenient to use functions to make uh, our code organized and manageable, especially as our overall program grows larger. It also helps us to avoid repetition and makes the code reusable. So let's look at the basic way of defining a function. So this is a basic function that I'm calling fun underscore name. All right. Now the rest of the function or whatever the task is going to be performed by this function will be written over here with an indent, of course, as a standard when it comes to Python. So I'm going to define this one, uh, something in triple, uh, double quotes. So don't worry about what this is right now. This is a doc string. Don't worry about uh, what this means. And I'll explain it to you just in a short bit. All right. Now, now the rest of the statement, the rest of it, uh, will obviously be what this uh, function will do. Let's include a simple print statement. All right. Let's, uh, it's done here. And let's call this. So of course, now once you define the statement, uh, a function to call the function, you just have to use its name like this. This is how you call a function. So as you can see, when I call this function, it should print the statement. Hello. Now let's go. Let's, uh, look at some of the, uh, like what happened over here. So we've used the keyword def to define a function. We give it a unique name which makes it, uh, which, with which we uh, uniquely identify this function. Um, and also once we've done this, we, um, we can give it, uh, we can give this function a particular header. Uh, it's called a doc string. So what this doc string is basically something that we include in triple quotes over here, just after the div, the def keyword. And, um, this is like a brief, we can use this to give a brief, uh, Inf give brief information into what our function is doing. So we can say this is, uh, this function performs addition, this performs, um, subtraction or whatever, like some basic information as to what our function does. So we can use a doc string for that. Um, of course, this is an optional thing. This does not have to be, we don't have to include this as well. All right. But for the sake of this, let's just keep it here. After that, of course, rest of the function, uh, will contain whatever tasks we want to do with it. And that will be indented. Um, finally, we can also include a return keyword and what the return keyword does is, um, at any point you find the return keyword in a function, you immediately leave the function and you go back to where this uh, function was called. Okay. So 
now let's see um now there's also one more important uh component of defining a function and that's parameter now if you noticed over here within these parentheses i did not include anything this is like an empty parenthesis opening and closing what if i said a if i included some a and b over here so what this means is whenever i call this function i need to pass two parameters a and b these can be like strings or numbers or whatever um but now it becomes almost mandatory that i pass these two things for my function to uh to work so let's define a function where i'm going to add a and b so instead of this print statement let's do this i create a variable c and in that i'm storing a plus b all right and then i return c so you can use a return and you can you, you can return certain like uh, variables along with the return statement so i'm saying not only return from this function but also give an output or return an output called c which is the addition of a and b now how do we use this well now instead of just uh, calling the function like this i'm going to add para i'm going to include parameters so i'm saying pass 2 and 3 to function name where 2 will take the place of a and 3 will take the place of b all right what will happen now is addition will take place and we will get return the result so let's see what happens now as you can see 2 plus 3 and i got the return the addition of 2 plus 3 and it it returned me 5 so yeah this was like a basic uh, usage of a function and parameters so of course uh, we can if you want to know like what a what the doc string of a particular function does or or says uh, you can use this uh, particular you can use this like um, statement so let's say if, uh, so uh, it's very important to like just keep a, a note in your uh, while you're going through this or while you're learning that uh, whenever we use some sort of a function which has double uh, underscore right this is like a built in a built in command provided by python um within the python library itself so these are like built in commands to check certain details so i want to check what is a doc string and this is how i do it so let's do print let's print what is a doc string over here this is a doc string so this is basically what i wrote over here i can change this to this like this does addition for example all right now this will say this does addition when i execute this line so this is the way to check what is a doc string anyways so now that you have seen uh, a basic um, basic function or two basic functions that i defined for you and how we use them what a parameter is let's look at uh, another concept that we call uh, scope and lifetime of variables so scope of a variable is the portion of the program where the variable is recognized all right now a parameter and a variable that are um defined inside a function are not visible from outside the function this is a very key thing uh, so if we define something within the function we can only use it within this function and we cannot like we cannot use it once the function has already been executed so as to speak um these variables and these parameters uh, have what we call as local scope since they are only um recognized within a particular function now the lifetime of a variable is the period throughout which the variable exists in the memory itself and um, it's very important to note that lifetime of variables that are defined inside a function um are as long as the function executes um once we return from a function uh whatever we have defined within it are destroyed so when uh, we use a function um it will not remember the values of a variable from a a previous iteration of a function call so let's uh, try to understand this example or this concept using certain examples so out here i have defined a function where i'm going to create a variable my underscore var my variable and i am going to store the value 10 in this and then i'm going to print so whenever i call this function i will always create this variable i will store 10 and i will print the value of this all right now what i'm going to do is I'm not only going to create this my var inside this function. I'm also going to create a variable outside. So you see there now you you might be confused as to okay how is the behavior going to be because outside the function I have created my var with a value 20 but inside the function I will always define my var as 10. Okay? Now I'm going to print. So my first what I'm going to first do is I'm going to execute this function that I created initially where I stored the value of 10 in my var and then I'm going to print print the value of my var that was present outside the function let's see what happens you can see two different things happening so when i execute this function it prints the value inside the function as 10 but when i print the next line which says um okay now get the value of my var 
um, it actually prints a value of 20. And this is a very key concept because what's happening here is when I initially call my function, within this function, it creates a variable called my var and it prints a value as 10. And the moment my function has been executed, it destroys this variable. And um, the variable which contained the value 10 is of course now destroyed. And all we have is the my var that contains 20 from the outside. And when we print that, we get the respective value as 20. So you can also think of it like this. The my var that is present inside this function is different to the my var that we create outside. So the scope of the my var within this function is local only to this function. And once the function is executed, that variable is destroyed. All right. Now let's look at a another case or the other side of this case where um, say we're dealing with variables that have a global scope. How do we deal with them? So let's create a variable called my where. All right. And I say I store 100 in this. All right. Now if I define a function, I've stored my where. Let's say I define a function. Define underscore say again, same name. Where what I'm going to do in this is I am going to print the value of whatever is there in my where. Okay. So let's do print um, value of variable is value stored in variable is okay. Let's uh, my where. So let's see what happens when we do this. Let's call this function fun underscore name. Let's see what happens here. So as you can see, the value I stored a value 100 in my where and I've called it inside the function. And this is because since I've defined it outside, I can use it inside as well. Now, what if I try to change the value of um, this variable inside the function though? So let's see if I did this and now if I try to print, let's see, do, is this allowed? No, it's not allowed. In fact, I get an error. It says local variable my where reference before assignment. Um, and without going too much into detail, what it's saying is that the variable inside over here is still local to this function. And I have not defined this my where as a global variable. So I cannot make changes to it within this function right now. And uh, to change that, I can use the global keyword. What if I did global over here? So if I did global and now if I said, okay, global my where, and I declare this variable as a global variable. Now, if I do this, now, if I do the same incrementation, now let's see what happens when I'm trying to do this. You see, I get the value 101. This is exactly what I wanted. And that is because I've defined my variable to be a global variable within this function. So I can, in fact, make changes to it within this function. So this is how we use the global keyword and global variable. Uh, also, just to make a quick note, um, there are three types of functions, uh, the three types of categories in which we can divide functions. First one being built in functions. Uh, these are the ones that are built into the standard library of Python. The other is user defined functions. That is the ones which we define ourselves. And the third type is called anonymous functions. Um, they're also known as Lambda functions. And this is something that we're going to cover in a separate video. Now let's talk about the arguments that we pass in Python. So there are four types of arguments that uh, Python user defined functions can take. First one being default, the other one is required, then there is keyword, and then there is variable number of arguments. So the default argument is when, say, um, if I define a function where underscore, sorry, fun underscore name, and I'm saying a comma b, right? But what if um, the user has not, um, like, say, I, I, I want a default value of a and b each time when I uh, use this function. So in the case where if, say, I don't pass a value for a and b, like this will always be used. So I can just say a is equal to two by default and b is equal to three by default. And then within this function, I will say c is equal to a plus b and then return c. So I do this and if I say fun underscore name, and in case I don't pass any arguments here, let's see what happens. By default, I get the answer five because by default a is two and b is three, but this is not fixed and I can always change this by passing my own values here, five and six. And in this case, I should get 11, as you can see here. Now, the next type is uh, required arguments. And when we are defining a required argument, we just simply do not use the equal to sign for the parameters over here. And this basically, um, it makes it so that now anytime we call this function, we have to pass something over here. So now if I try to pass like this, I won't get a, oops, yeah, I won't get a default value. Then that's because, um, uh, that's because, well, there is no default value and it needs an A and B. So I have to pass it a three and say four. Now it should give me seven, as you can see. 
The next type of argument that we'll be talking about are the variable number of arguments. So let's look at an example here. So what I'm doing in this particular example is I'm defining a function called my sum where I'm passing some parameter called my integers and I'm doing something out here. And what this does is um, it will take the values of a particular like collection of objects and that's called my integers and each value I'm going to keep adding it to each other and I'm going to result a particular sum. I'm just uh, going to result the sum of whatever is there. So in this case, what happens is I'm creating a list uh, one, two and three, which contains one, two and three. And then I'm going to print the summation of whatever is there. So it should give me six. Now, the problem in this case is that each time when I'm going to perform this uh, function, I have to create a separate list where I'm going to store these objects. But what if I didn't, I do not know like what exactly I'm going to pass here. What if I don't know if it's going to be a list of objects or like what is it going to be exactly? Well, in that case, I can use a variable, uh, variable, uh, key, variable number of arguments. So it's, it's like a variable keyword argument. So what we use here is, um, a specific way of passing, um, keywords and we do it like this. So I say define my under underscore name and I use an asterisk. Now I give it any name. This can be args. This can be integers. It doesn't really matter what this is, but it's just, this is the key, the asterisk here. And this tells us that whatever we pass here is now, we were supposed to create an iterable out of this and then we can perform whatever task we want. So let's just, uh, since I've already created one here, let's see how I'm going to use it in this case. So as you can see, I'm doing, uh, I'm creating a particular, uh, variable argument function over here and I'm doing the same task. I'm just going to keep, uh, performing edit, uh, I'm going to add whatever I pass over here. But now when I'm calling this function, I don't need to create a separate list as I did over here. I'm just passing all the numbers that I want to in the form of like, it's pretty much like a tuple. So I'm just passing these numbers here. And what this function is going to do is, is going to create an iterable out of this. And then we're going to iterate over it. As you can see, that's happening over here. And I can keep, uh, I don't need, uh, I, I can just keep like, uh, so since I've uh, done it for one, two, three, and seven, the summation should be 13 in this case. I can add another number here, just explicitly, just like this. And you can see the value will change. And that's because this is a variable, uh, this is a variable argument, uh, method of uh, perform, uh, creating a function. Now the fourth type of uh, function arguments is the variable keyword, uh, argument. So let's look at what is the keyword argument now. So I have defined a function here called the concatenate function. And let's see what I'm going to do with this. So in this, I have passed a keyword argument. I've said that, okay, this is going to be a keyword argument uh, function. And what I'm going to do in this is I'm going to create a blank string. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add uh, or I'm going to concatenate certain strings that I'm going to pass to this function. So I, in this example, I have passed Python and is and cool and an exclamation mark, all separate strings. And what I'm going to do in this function is I'm going to join them together. Um, and I'm going to create one whole string out of it. Let's see what's the result. Python is cool. So this is, so of course, like, uh, if I had to add so, some, something else, like Python is say, um, cool and say, I just wanted to say hello and say one more string. I can add, I, I can add it just like this. I don't have to like define a fixed number of arguments. I can pass any number of arguments I want. And this works exactly the same as variable in the uh, only differences instead of positional uh, arguments. We're using keyword arguments over here. Hello, bye. Like this it doesn't really make sense, but just to show you as you can see. So this is how we use keyword arguments. Well, this is it for um, this introductory video into functions in Python. I hope you uh, uh, learned a bit about defining functions and sort of the keywords and the components that uh, are part of function definitions, such as keywords and um, uh, I mean arguments and um, doc string, for example. Uh, you also saw the different types of arguments that we can pass. In this video, we will be covering a sort of a project side type of scenario, which is basically going to be a problem case for you. And uh, it's going to be slightly, slightly difficult, slightly tricky. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to tackle a particular problem. And we're going to, uh, what I'm going to do is also um, show you a solution to that problem. So uh, let's start with this. So this question that we have is, um, we have this program um, that we have to write where we compute the frequency of words that um, exist in some input. Okay. Uh, the program should output after sorting the key alphanumerically. Now, 
this input can be any it's basically a block of text right so in our example we have um, for example if this was our input right uh, what we want to see is um, an, uh, an output which is basically saying that uh, the word python has appeared say well in this example it's appeared five times and then the word read has appeared one time and so on and so forth like for each of these words we want to see um, how many times have they appeared in this particular block of text so um, let's look at uh, a particular example now where we have done this so let's um, let's see here so first of all i'm going to create a dictionary so why am i creating a dictionary is because i'm going to use each uh, unique word as a key and the number of times they have appeared in um, a block of text as the value to that key so um, i'm going to use a sample uh, string which is basically this long string that you can see here which is stored in line so this large chunk of text is what we're going to be analyzing um, so how are we going to do this it's, it's pretty simple so we have this now what we want to do is um, when we find what we one way of tackling this problem that we're going to do here is we want to um, check word by word um, first of all we want to see if it's a unique word and if this word is um, we for, I encountered it for the first time then we need to store a new key in, in our dictionary called frequent table or frequency table um, and if it has already if there is a key already with that um, particular name then we just want to increment the count or the value by one so let's see how we do this over here so if you can see in my this the solution is as simple as this but if you see what's happening it's basically what uh, what it's doing is we're splitting up this string uh, using the split function what this will do is it will split up the string at every white space so it will take this as one part and it'll take this part as another part it will create an iterable with uh, each word as the um, each iterable object in that um, container so it's going to be a list of uh, words like python is one so on and so forth and we're going to go one by one so we're going to say four word in line dot split now if this word is if it exists in frequency table as a key then what we're going to do is we're just going to increase the count of uh, the value of that key by one but if it does not exist then we're going to actually create a key uh, with the word as that unique word and we're going to create its value um, initialize its value to one so when we execute this now if we want to once we've done this we can sort it uh, by the count of the words so what we're going to do is we're going to create a another tuple called sorted tuples where we're going to use the lambda function out here uh, to sort the um, the dictionary uh, in terms of its values so what we're going to do is we're going to take the key uh, the key being the lambda item item uh, with index one index one is basically the value um, so a, a particular uh, key has a value so the word python appears so many times the per the word say scientist appears so many times so we're going to check which words have the highest number of uh, occurrences and we're going to sort it in a uh, descending order so that that is basically what the reverse is equal to true does so when we're going to sort this when we're going to use the sorted function when we say reverse true uh, it tells the sorting function to sort this dictionary um, this dictionary frequency table uh, in terms of value by the, the descending order so whichever um, word appears highest that would be the first word in our uh, sorted tuple so that's what we do in this line and once we execute this we're also going to print so if you see the result of this um, activity that we've done you can see that the word machine um, appears six times learning appears six times then python appears five times and so on and so forth so we've created a sorted tuple where the first object of the tuple uh, uh, we've created a list of sorted tuples where the first object of the tu each tuple is the unique word and the, the second one is the number of times that it has appeared in this um, particular example or this particular string so yeah this was uh, what the first basic project that we have tackled in this video we will continue with uh, what we started in terms of our uh, project number one uh, what we're going to do is um, we're going to tackle another slightly complicated a question or a, a situation um, we're going to try to arrive at a solution
So in this, what we have is a, some sort of a robot, a moving robot, which moves on a Cartesian plane, a two coordinate plane, um, is going to move uh, in terms of up, down, left and right. Okay, and each each time it moves up or down or left or right, it takes a certain number of steps in that direction, um, integral steps, of course. So what we need to do is um, from a starting position, whatever its starting position is, which we're going to take as zero comma zero in this example, um, we're going to make it move to a particular location with the commands up, down, left and right, followed by certain steps. Um, and we're going to uh, ask, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the distance between these two points. Um, and we're going to calculate different types of distances. So you might be introduced to new concepts, um, new distance concepts in this video as well. So what we're going to be using for distance calculation is the Minkowski distance. And that is, um, we're going to take, uh, so the Minkowski distance between two variables is basically the absolute difference between these two uh, variables so these two points um, and we take it to the power of something so if we want to say uh, calculate the Minkowski distance with um, in terms of the quadratic Minkowski distance with basically p2 so we are going to do xi minus yi absolute difference to the power 2 and then we're going to take the second root of it after summing each and every point um, so when we take p is equal to 2 we, we say the Minkowski distance behaves like the Euclidean distance. And this is probably one of the most common distances uh, in case you've done um, basic uh, Cartesian geometry when you are asked to find the distance between two points on a, a plane. Um, we can also take the absolute distance where we take P is equal to 1. So in this case, we're just basically summing the uh, absolute distances between each point. Um, no roots, no powers, nothing. Basically, p is equal to 1. And we call that the Manhattan distance. So we're going to take p is equal to 1, 2, and 3 in each case. And we're going to find the distance between two points uh, based on these measures. So this is just a visual representation. This is basically the Euclidean distance, basically the estimate of the value between these two points. If um, since this is a two coordinate system, whereas the Manhattan distance would be the absolute distance in terms of um, if we go up and then we go right between these two, like say if this was and this was another point. Um, so yeah, let's um, move on to the problem. So what we're in this in this particular example, we're going to start from the static position zero and zero on a on a graph, and we are going to give the commands of up five, down three, left three, and right two. So first of all, what we want to do is um, we initialize the starting position as zero and zero. And we also, just for the sake of this example, we um, initialize the end position as 0 and 0. So what we're going to do, first of all, is um, let's execute this much. Now we have this list, list of tuples. Um, it's, we're going to call this actions. And this is the actions that we're performing. So the, this, the, each tuple contains an action and the number of steps in that direction. So it contains four actions. Up by five steps, down by three steps, left by three steps, right by two steps. So now we're going to iterate over this each tuple and we're going to get the direction first of all in this line um, for each step uh, and we're going to calculate the number of steps it takes. So for each action it's going to first tell, um, it's going to check what is the direction which is done by this line and we're going to find out the number of steps in that direction which is uh, uh, stored in this line. So. Once you've uh, gotten this, for each action, we have to uh, update the end position, right? So what happens is if you go up by a particular direction, so you are basically changing the y y axis, right? The, uh, the y axis. So we're going to change end position and the first index, which is basically this part of the um, end position uh, coordinate point. So we're going to say if it's moving by up, then we're going to uh, update by, by adding uh, the y-axis by the number of steps. So, um, and, and, and if the direction was down, we're going to do the same thing for the y-axis, but we're going to decrement it. Similarly, if we move left or right, we're moving the x-axis, right? So we take end position in the first index. So we take the x-axis, and if we're moving left, it's a negative, uh, it, it's a decrement, and if you're moving right, it's an increment. So if there's any other, like, action, like, any other action, for example, that was given here, we say pass. So basically, the only valid actions that we can pass is um, up, down, left, and right. Otherwise, we we um, just skip that particular action. 
So this is what the, this particular loop will do. It will update our final position. So once we've done this, um, uh, if we, if I execute this, what will get stored in the end position is basically my end position. So uh, now that I have my starting position and my end position, um, just to show you what the end position will look like right now, let's just do this. So if you see here, after I've moved up by five steps, down by three steps, left by three steps, and then right by two steps, my final end position is minus one and two. Um, my start position, on the other hand, was, as you remember, it should be zero and zero. It is zero and zero. So now we're going to find the distance between zero and zero and minus one and two. So we're going to first of all create a function called Minkowski distance, which, which does a basic function of just calculate the uh, the difference between the what do you say um, the end position x coordinate and the end position y coordinate times uh, or to the power of a root and uh, we're basically going to do this operation that uh, you saw here we're going to do this and um, we're going to uh, we're going to use this root variable to Specify to like p is equal to 1, 2, or 3, like what p value we want to take for this Minkowski distance. So once you've done this, what this function will do is basically store uh, this much and it will wait for us to, uh, it will basically wait for us to give us a root. So when we give root 1, it will create these, it, it will check the distance between the end and the starting points um, with the p value of 1. If we give it 2, it will calculate Euclidean distance with p value 2, similarly for 3. And we can calculate for any roots. So we're going to calculate for one, two, and three roots, um, and we're going to see what values we get in each case. So when root is equal to one, I print a statement saying Minkowski distance with root one is something, and then root two is something, root three is something. Let's see what results we get. So if you see here, the Minkowski distance with root one is actually 1.0, but the Euclidean distance between these two points is 2.23, whereas the um, the cubic Minkowski distance with basically the with root 3 is 1.91 so you see these three different uh, distance measures for the same distance between two points so in this video you basically so in this basically by doing this activity you might must have you will learn how to um, basically how to iterate through loops um, and perform these uh, distance calculations which you'll find pretty handy in um, many activities related to uh, data science and machine learning so yeah, this was uh, on the project two. In this video, we will be con continuing tackling different um, problems and pro problem cases in terms of a project called project three, where we're going to be using regular expressions to validate whether um, certain passwords that have been entered, do they match certain criteria or not. So let's look into uh, our particular question. Um, we have a website that requires users to input username and password to register. Now we have to write a program to check the validity of passwords input by the users. Now the criteria that the passwords have to follow are that there's at least one number between A and Z, um, and this is at least one number between, there's at least one letter between A and Z and one number between zero and nine. Uh, the third criteria is that uh, there's at least one letter between capital A and capital Z. So this first and third point basically is saying that there should be one lowercase letter and there should be one uppercase letter. Um, now there should be at least one character from dollar sign hash or the at symbol. Um, it should have a minimum length of six and the maximum length of 12. So when we, whatever passwords that we enter into our um, example, they must be comma separated. So if we're gonna have an input, uh, they're gonna ask us for an input where we're gonna to have to input the different passwords uh, in a comma separated way. So let's look, let's look at um, how do we tackle this. So for my example, I'm going to use these uh, examples in terms of these are my password examples. If we're going to check if these are valid passwords or not. So let's copy this first of all. And now let's import the RE. This import RE is basically the regular expression module. Um, now in this step is going to ask us to input the passwords as you can see here. So I will just control V. So since this is comma separated, what it will do is it will split up each of these uh, by the comma and it will store them in a list. So it will take this as one password, this as another password, this has another password and this has another password. So once I press enter, now if I want to check what's in list, uh, I mean what's in items, what I can do is just check over here what's in items. It's a list of whatever password I had entered. Uh, each object is separately treated now. 
in this list. Now I'm going to create a an empty list called value first of all. Once I've done that, I'm going to move on to the next step. So once I've created my list called value, what I'm going to do is now I'm going to search and I'm going to check for each condition using regular expressions for whatever criteria that we have uh, initially. So if you see here, what I'm going to do is first iterate by each item in this to check for each password. Now my first check will be a basic check uh, for the length of the password. If it's lesser than 6 or greater than 12, then um, our, uh, our basically our password is illegal. So we can't be using this and we will just continue and we won't check for anything else. But if it is within 6 and 12, the length uh, 6 and 12, then we can uh, continue with our check. So we can do, we'll do an else statement for pass, which basically moves on to this uh, next block. Now, once we've done this, what we will do is, uh, this this first statement, what this is going to do is, it's going to do an re.search. An re.search, as you know, is going to look for at least one instance of um, a letter occurring between um, A and Z. So this re.search, uh, followed by this. Now this is the regular expression that we have passed and what this tells us is basically the square in the square brackets We're looking for anything between uh, a and z in terms of small letters. So if um, This is if this condition is not met then again We continue and we leave this uh, particular search because one of our criteria is not met All right, but if it is met then uh, this if not statement will not uh, like we, we won't enter this block and we can move on to the next check. So now now we move to elif not. Now again we're using if not statement. So this is basically checking for uh, a negative case. So anytime one of these cases have been met, it basically means that our password has been invalid because these conditions are not being met. So we're, we're trying to eliminate all uh, conditions, all of these conditions so that we get a valid password. So again, we move on to the next statement, which is basically going to do the search for numbers. Once again, if we find a case, uh, a password without any numbers, we continue and we don't um, check this password no more because we already know it's, a, uh, it's a, an illegal password. Now, next check will be for capital letters, A to Z. Um, and the next check again will be for uh, these particular symbols, the dollar, the hash, and the at, one of these three symbols. Finally, we have a, a, a search for uh, we're going to search for a white space character. So if we actually do find a white space character in our password, um, that's an illegal password and we're not going to continue checking for those cases. So um, so this is basically all our cases. Uh, uh, lowercase letters, uh, numbers, capital letters, these one of these three symbols and the existence of uh, a white space. So once we've done all these checks, um, if if none of these have been passed, we move on to this else statement where we just pass. And uh, what we can do is we append the value. We append the value to uh, we uh, we append p to the, uh, the 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 list called value. So basically, what happens is um, just to go through it again. Um, if this condition is not met, uh, and this condition is not met, this is not met, this is not met, this is not met, and if this is uh, also not met. Um, then we're fine. So basically, as long as we have small letters, as long as we have a number, as long as we have a capital letter, as long as we have one of these three symbols, and as long as we don't have any uh, white space characters, we can append P to this. Otherwise, it will continue and it will break out of this for loop completely. That's what the continue thing, the continue statement at, at the end of each of these blocks checks. Um, anytime this condition is met, uh, this if not condition is met, then we break through we break through this uh, whole for loop and we don't append p to the value but uh, if we actually get to this stage then what we can do is simply append uh, p to value now finally what we are going to do is uh, we're going to print out all the valid um, all the valid passwords so just by a quick look you can see here um, this is a, a valid password right so let's execute this and let's see uh, what we get if you see here, we only get one valid password. And let's look at why um, some of these do not turn out to be valid. So if you look here, all of the conditions are met. It has a capital letter, it has a small letter, it has at least one number, and it has one of the symbols, either dollar sign or the hash sign or the at sign. In this case, we have two white spaces, one over here and one over here. So this is an illegal password. Similarly, in this case, also we have an illegal password because it begins with a space. 
In this case, it's the same thing. We begin with a space and also it does not have any of those uh, symbols that we were looking for, the dollar or the hash or the at. So again, so these three are illegal passwords and they do not get appended to value. However, this does get appended to value and that's why we get the result for only one password, which is the only legal password. In this video, we will be covering the topic of iterators. Now an iterator in Python is an object that contains a countable number of values, or it's a larger object that contains a countable number of sub-objects. An iterator is an object that can be iterated upon. And what that means is we can traverse from each value and we can manipulate or perform certain functions or operations and tasks using each of the uh, sub-objects or values within this uh, larger collection called iterator. Now, um, when we're looking at it technically, an iterator is an object which implements the iterator protocol in Python, which consists of the methods iter and the method next. So to begin with, let's look at a simple iterator. We're going to see the example of a list where we're going to traverse through uh, the objects of a list using the for loop. So we have objects one, two, three, four, and I'm going to print each of these values one by one, as you can see here. Similarly, we can also do the same thing for another iterable known as the string where we can go character by character, again using the for loop, as you can see here. Uh, another example of uh, an iterable in Python is um, the dictionary. So let's say I have a dictionary where I have two values, two key value pairs, uh, key x, which contains the value one, and key y, which corresponds to the value two. Now, when I'm going to do a for loop through this, by default, I will be traversing through the keys x and y, as you can see over here. And of course, um, the other types of iterables in Python are like sets and uh, tuples as well. All right. Now let's look at um, what this iterating protocol is in Python. So first of all, we take an iterable. It's an object that contains, uh, it's a collection of objects that contains sub-objects. And when we use the iter function, it uh, creates an iterator out of it. So we can, one by one, we can traverse through um, each of the objects and we can manipulate each of the objects that is contained in this. And uh, anytime we want to um, move to the next object, we use the next function. And when we have finally uh, completed all of the, or we've uh, manipulated or traversed through each of the sub-objects, we encounter the stop iteration exception, which tells us, okay, there are no more objects to be manipulated or uh, iterated upon. So an ex as an example, I will create a list where I will store the values, uh, some simple values, integers 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 3, 4, 5, okay? Um, I'm going to create an iterator out of this where I will use the iter function uh, and I'm going to say this is, let's say this is called my my iter, okay? And uh, I'm going to use the iter function as I had mentioned and I'm going to pass my list in this. Now if you see what is my iter, it should say it should be a list iterator at a particular memory location. Now let's use the next function to keep going through whatever is there in this. So of course, the first object should be one, as you can see. Now when I look at the next, it should be three, then I should get four, and now I should get five as I use the next uh, successively. Now since I've reached the last of my uh, objects in this collection, now the next time I use this next function, I should get a stop, um, stop iteration exception that is raised as you can see here. So this is the basic um, iteration protocol in Python. Now you might have uh, already gone through the for loop video and in that I have spoken in quite a bit of detail as to how a for loop performs this um, this iterator protocol and how it creates an iterator iterable object out of say a list or a, uh, a tuple and how we how it internally performs the next function and it um, breaks out of the for loop once it encounters the stop iteration exception. So um, for loops are like they're very, very uh, similar to your standard iterator and they use pretty much the same uh, protocol for its functioning. Now, um, let's do a basic comparison of what is a, a, a basic comparison between a generator and an iterator in Python. So in generator, um, we use a function. We use like we define it using the DEF keyword and we define it under one function to create a generator. Whereas uh, in the case of iterators, we use two separate functions, the iter function and the next function. Um, the generator makes use of the yield keyword, whereas the uh, Python iterator does not. Um, in generators, we save the states of the local variables. Each time we use the yield keyword and we pause the loop. Uh, temporarily. Whereas in iterators, we do not make use of any local variables. All we need is an iterable like a list um, to iterate upon. Um, we may use any number of yield statements in generators and we do not use 
yield statements in iterators. Generators are not memory efficient, whereas iterators are very memory efficient. So this is like basic uh, comparison between generators and iterators. In this video, we will be covering the topic of modules in Python. Now a module in Python, to put it simply, is basically a Python file that has functions and classes written into it and is saved with the .py extension to specify that it is indeed a Python file. A Python program can use one or more modules and modules can have one or more functions. They basically help us organize our code and instead of having one, like, one long Python file, we can have several files or several modules. Now modular programming is the process of breaking a large, um, a large event or task into sm smaller and more manageable subtasks and uh, we call these subtasks basically modules. Now individual modules can be grouped together like building blocks to create a larger application. There are several advantages to modularizing code uh, in a large application and we will be going through them right now. So first of all, there is simplicity uh, because instead of focusing on a big, big problem or big task, we can break down the problem into smaller, smaller portions or modules. Now maintainability of code is much better through modules because they are designed to uh, create these sort of boundaries or uh, clear demarcations between different problem domains. Um, there is usability, reusability uh, in the sense that once we create a module, we can use it in different parts of the code or even different different applications itself. Um, there is also scoping and uh, what this means is uh, modules typically uh, define a separate namespace and uh, this helps us avoid co collisions between identifiers in different areas of a program. Functions, modules and packages are basically all constructs in Python that promote code modularization. Um, you might have already come across uh, uh, or gotten an intro into functions. In this video, we will be going through modules. And another video, we will also cover the topic of packages. To import a module, we use the import keyword. And in this example, what I'm going to show you is a simple function or a simple operation of importing the OS module. Um, this is short for operating system. And um, as the name suggests, we can perform uh, system tasks uh, through the functions and methods that are part of this uh, OS module. So simply executing the statement will import this module onto our program for us to use. Now, if we wanted to see all the functions that are present in a module, what we have to do is use the dir function. So if we print the dir os function, it will print us basically a directory of uh, all the functions that are present in the os module. As you can see here, that, like the, all of these are basically uh, names to different functions that are part of the os module. Finally, moving on, another function commonly used with modules is the getcwd function. And what this does is it will give us the current working uh, directory that we are working upon uh, right now. So if I execute this, it will tell me what is the directory that I am currently working upon right now. As you can see, seed notebook dir slash temp. If we wanted to see all the files in a particular directory, what we can do is use the list dir function followed by giving a path. By default, if we do not enter a path inside the parentheses, it will basically give us all the files in the current working directory, which in our case is temp. So if I were to execute this, it gives basically gives me a list of all the files files that are presently uh, there in the directory that I am currently working upon. Now a basic step is um, creating a Python module. The simplest way to create a Python module is basically creating a Python script with uh, whatever functions and tasks that we want and methods that we want inside uh, whatever module and saving it with a .py extension. Um, so in, in my example, what I'm going to do is I have already created a script in uh, Notepad and I've stored it with a .py extension that contains these four functions, add, subtract, pr 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 product and division. Um, I have basically copied, I basically use this code and I've stored it in a .py script and I'm going to be using this as my uh, as, as, as a test module for this particular example. Now how do we import a module? Now once that I have created a script uh, in my example, it will be called mycalc.py uh, and we've stated, stored it in our directory. To import the module, all we have to do is use the import statement. So if I had to import mycalc, all I have to do is say import my underscore calc and now my calc has been imported. Um, so we can use the import statement or if we want to import something particular from my calc, we can do from my calc import. Um, now we can, whatever like for example, if we wanted the add, uh, the add function, we can basically just say only add or if we wanted add and subtract, we can say add and subtract, uh, for example. So this is basically by using from, we can say that we want something from something, but only parts of it. We don't want everything. Uh, we can also use from my calc import and we can say asterisk 
to basically say uh, import everything that exists in my calc uh, right now. So this is another way of importing something from a module. Now to access contents in a module, we have to use the dot operator and I will show you how right now. So what I'm going to do is in my example, I'm going to import my calc as calc. So now what this since this is the original folder or the original module, but I'm going to give it a shorthand name so that I can easily use it in my code and I don't have to type out my underscore calc every time. So now I'm going to import this as calc so anytime i have to refer to a particular method or function inside this script or this module i will just use this uh this uh, placeholder this variable name so now i have two variables a and b and i'm storing 20 and 30 in them so my first func what i'm going to do is basically four operations i'm going to print the addition of a and b and then the subtraction multiplication and the division of these two numbers and each time to do this operation i am going to use the add function that is present in the my calc module so to do that i have already imported my calc as calc all i'm going to do now is invoke these functions using the dot operator that we are already familiar with. So I'm going to say calc.add and then I'm going to pass these two arguments or these two variables to say that I want to add these two. And similarly, I'm going to do it for subtraction, uh, uh, multiplication and division. As you can see, these are the results of my tasks. Now, if I had to do a directory uh, operation on the module calc, it will basically give me a bunch of inbuilt uh, or dunder methods that are, are already a part of any uh, Python script by default, such as built-ins. So if I execute this just to show you what happens when I use the dir function, it will basically give me all the functions that are part of this Python script. So these double underscores that you see are basically uh, denoting uh, magic methods or dunder methods. And these are like inbuilt methods as a part of the script. And if you see here, add, division, prod, and sub, these are the methods that we have defined earlier on in our script ourselves. Now to go slightly deeper or in more detail into what happens when we do a module search, um, let's, let's actually look at what happens. So what happens is when, for example, we execute the statement import my calc as calc as we did over here. So the first, the steps that actually take place are the interpreter executes the above statement and it searches for this Python script in a list of directories assembled from these following sources that you see here. So it takes the directory from uh, which the input script was run or the current directory if the interpreter is being run interactively, which is the case right now. Uh, secondly, it will list all the directories contained in the Python path environment that you set up, uh, that you can set up or you can change later on as well. And this format for Python path is uh, OS dependent, of course, but it should mimic the path environment variable that we see in uh, uh, Windows systems. And then the other source or the other directories is basically an installation dependent list of categories configured at the time Python is installed. Now the resulting search paths that is accessible in the Python variable system.path um, and this is basically obtained from a module named sys. So if I imported this sys and I did sys.path, now these are all the directories that we are going to look for when we want to search for any particular module. So if I'm doing uh, import my calc or import OS, it's not only going to look at the current directory that I am working on, it's also going to look at all of these uh, directories that have been set up as uh, um, you could say directories or um, paths in the uh, system.path. In this video, we will be covering the topic of packages. Now, what if we developed a, a very large application in Python that contains many different modules? And we have so many different modules that have similar names and functionalities, and they're all kept in like or dumped in the same location, that it becomes very difficult to track these modules. What if there was a way to organize and access these in a much simpler and more organized manner? Well, packages allow us to do just that. Packages are a hierarchical structuring of the module namespace using dot notation. And this is the same dot notation that we use when we want to access methods or functions that are part of other classes or modules. So let's try to, uh, let's look at certain examples to understand what we mean. So I have a directory called pkg. This can be basically treated as what we call a package. Now in our package, we have two modules, mod1.py and mod2.py. And what we're going to store in mod1 and mod2.py are the follows. So I'm going to define a function called foo and I'm going to print uh, this particular statement, mod1, and then I'm going to basically say foo. Um, and then I'm going to say in class foo, I'm going to have an empty pass command. Similarly, I'm going to define a function called bar in mod2.py where I'm going to print this statement. So basically mod1.py has a simple function where I'm going to print this statement and mod2.py has a simple function that I'm going to print this statement. Um, and I'm going to store them in mod1 and mod2.py respectively. And these two modules I'm going to store in the directory pkg in my local folder. Now I've already done this, so we can already get uh, to working with this. Now if I wanted to access these 
particular modules from the pkg folder, I can simply use the import command and use the dot notation. So I can say pkg dot mod one. So this will invert, this will um, import the mod one module from pkg folder. Similarly, I can do the same thing for the mod two uh, module from the pkg folder in the same line. So now that it's been imported, just simply execute this and this imports whatever you needed. Now, if we wanted to um, perform a function that was a part of uh, mod1.py, we can just extend the dot uh, notation and use the function as over here. As you can see, it performs this print command, whatever it was supposed to do. Similarly, I can invoke the function uh, that was part of the mod2 module uh, by extending the dot notation to it in the same way. Now, another way that I can invoke um, I can import a package is by directly importing the package itself by using import pkg and uh, not accessing any of the specific modules within it. Now let's see what happens when we do this. So just for this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to restart the kernel so that uh, the pkg uh, modules that were already imported uh, get cleaned away. So we see what happens when we execute this on its own. Now if you see, I have in imported this. Now let's see if I can access uh, my mod1 and mod2. Now if you see here, it's throwing me an error. And this is because using, simply using the import command on a particular package only imports, um, you could say the package namespace, but it does not actually import any of the modules and files that were part of this package. So if I wanted mod1 uh, from this package, I would have to actually say import pkg.mod1 directly. Um, and I cannot simply say import pkg and uh, Python will not import everything that is part of a package on its own. I have to specify it myself um, specifically. Now I'm going to create and I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to show you another type of importing from a package using the star operator. So I have this package pkg once again. Now I'm going to store um, three, I mean, four different modules within this package mod111.py, mod222.py. And I've already done this. So you don't need to bother about um, um, seeing me doing it right now because I've already created these files and what I've done is within mod111.py I've defined, I've, passed, I've written this statement and I've stored it in the Python script. Similarly, I've created another Python script, script called mod222.py and I have basically written this in the code. And I've similarly done this for mod333.py and I've done another for mod4.py. Now, once I have done this, I've stored these Python scripts into my, uh, into my package or uh, pkg uh, package. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create, I'm going to execute this command. If you see this from pkg.mod333 import star. So once I execute this, now I'm going to say print directory and print directory basically will tell me all the functions that exist in my current directory. If you see here, there's this bash function that was a part of mod333 module. Now if I change this and if, if I imported mod111, and if I did the same thing, you will see foo has now been added as a part of this direction directory. And these are all uh, functions that were part of these different modules where I'm importing from. And that is what the star function does. What the star function will do is it will basically tell Python. Okay. So the statement is saying from pkg dot mod mod one one one. So it's saying that, um, okay, look into this directory or this uh, package and find this module. And in this module, import everything that exists inside it up until this point. So this is another uh, another way of basically importing uh, files or functions uh, from a particular package and a particular specific module within that package. So yeah, this was a very brief video on packages in Python. Uh, the conclusion being that packages are basically a an organized way of storing many different modules that we might have created in a very large application. Um, and these modules can be accessed using the familiar dot not notation that uh, we have used in other examples, such as methods when we were working with classes and objects. In this video, we will be taking an introduction into the concept of generators. So Python provides a generator, which is like a function uh, where we can create our own iterator. In a generator function, we use the yield statement instead of the return statement that we use for standard functions. So let's look at a simple generator first of all. So out here, I have defined a generator called my generator, where I'm doing uh, like there are three uh, like three functions or three tasks that I'm doing. Uh, first one is when I'm printing the first item and I'm yielding a value 10. Then I'm printing second item yielding 20. Then I'm printing last item yielding 30. So let's see how do we use this. Now, since we know my generator is the function, it uses the yield keyword. Um, every time we use the next keyword, we will keep getting 
what is next in this function. So let's store um, the generator in my gen. So now we uh, have stored the iterator in this function variable called gen or gen. Now let's see when we do next and we use gen, what happens? So the first um, task is performed or the first itera iteration is performed where we get this, the first yield command is done. All right, let's see what happens when we do next again. Next gen. Now, as you can see, we get second item and we get 20. Let's do it for the next, let's do it once more since there is one more task, we, uh, there's one more iterable inside. You can see this. Now, a valid question is what will happen if we do next gen again since there is nothing after this. Well, let's see what happens. We should get an error. As you can see, stop iteration error. This is another uh, built-in exception um, that happens when we have uh, like reached the last uh, object of an iterable. So we get a stop iteration error. So now a key difference between a generator and a function is that when we execute a function, the moment we hit the return statement in a function or when we execute a function, like whatever variables that were stored inside are lost and they're destroyed unless they were defined as global uh, and the function is completely done executing and we leave the function completely whereas when it comes to a generator when we hit the yield function we don't actually completely leave this function so the first time the yield is found we get 10 but uh, the generator remembers its position inside this function so the next time we use the next we actually move on to the next iterable and then we move on to the next iterable. So you can think of a generator as it sort of has memory if uh, that makes sense. It's a way to like create iterables in Python or create iterators in Python. So to understand a, what the difference between the yield command and the return command does, let's take the same function. All right. And let's put a return over here after this particular, the second yield. Okay, let's do the same thing. We say gen is equal to my generator. And let's start, uh, yeah, let's start doing next gen and seeing what is there. So the first yield will be standard, first item 10. The next one is again, is going to say second item and then 20. But now if you notice, there was a return I put over here. So Technically, when I did the second next, it's not only yielded 20, but it's also executed this return function or this return statement. So let's see what happens if I do next again. As you see, I have gotten the stop iteration seemingly earlier than I did before. And that's because I have used the return function and I mean return statement. And what that's done is that um, if, if we've completely left this function, so as to speak, and there is um, nothing next so as to speak so we get the stop iteration and that's uh, the difference between yield and return now in the next example I'm going to show you how we use a generator function in place of the for loop or for a for loop so let's take this what I have over here and I have defined a function called get sequence up to x and um, what this will do is basically it will keep printing the uh, printing numbers up until uh, whatever we have entered in place of x over here. So if I said, say sequence is equal to, let's uh, copy this, all right. And say I want, um, I want sequentially, I want every number up until 10. Well, not including 10, of course, because Python starts with zero, right? So let's do this. And um, now let's see. So the first number will yield zero. And now if I did this again, it should give me one, two, and I can keep going until I will stop at the value nine, as you can see here. So eight, nine. Now I should get the stop iteration error because that uh, we have reached the end of our iteration. So this is a way of using generator functions for four loops. So another uh, neat example where we're going to use a generator is um, in the case of Fibonacci numbers. So let's use it. 
uh, let's uh, see how we can generate a Fibonacci series using um, generator. So I've defined a Fibonacci function called Fibonacci where I'm passing max. So max is basically the max value that I want. Um, uh, like up until where I want the sequence, right? So uh, this is basically the code which will uh, give, give return me the uh, subsequent values of my Fibonacci sequence. So let's um, pass this to fib and say I want all the Fibonacci numbers until 10. So in, I will pass 10 over here. Let's see what happens when we do next fib. Well, it should start with zero. Then when we do this again, we get one. Then we do zero plus one. It should be one. Next number should be one plus one, which is two. Then we should have two plus one, three, and then three plus two, five. Then three plus five should be eight. Now eight plus five is 13. And since 13 is greater than what we pass for our max value here, now when we try this, we should get the stop iteration error as you can see. In this video, we will be learning about the concept of list comprehension. Now, list comprehension is, it's a neat way of creating a new list based on values that are already there in an existing list. So you can think of it like um, creating a new list uh, using a much shorter and cleaner syntax compared to what you might traditionally be thinking. So let's go through some examples and uh, through those examples, we will see how list comprehension makes uh, creating these new lists much simpler and much easier for us. So in our first example, we will be creating a new list uh, which will contain fruits that contain the letter A in their name. So we already have a list of uh, fruits over here as you can see. It has apple, it has banana, cherry, kiwi and mango. Now we want to create a new list which has only the fruits that have the letter A inside them. So apple would be one of them, banana would be one of them and uh, mango would be one of them. So traditionally, if you look at this piece of code, this would do what we want to do, but this contains a few uh, extra lines. But yeah, it does, it does do what we want to do. Now, what if there was a way of uh, doing the same thing by just writing one simple line of code and that exists as you can see here. So I take the same list. Now, uh, this is where you need to follow. So now my new list is equal to so I'm creating a list over here, as you can see. Now within this list, you have this line. This is what we call a list comprehension. So as you can see, it says each fruit for each fruit in fruits if, now it's checking for the letter or the character A inside each fruit. And uh, what this each fruit is, that uh, we're checking each object in this list one by one. So first, in the first iteration, each fruit will contain the string apple, then in the next iteration, it will contain banana. And in each, uh, each iteration, we're going to check if it contains the character A. And if it does, then we store that each fruit in the new list, as you can see here. So if I execute this line, you see my, my result is the same. I have my, uh, whatever I wanted. And this was a much cleaner way of writing, uh, or creating this new list. Let's look at some other examples now. So my next example, what I'm going to do is I am going to iterate through a string. So I have a string. It can be anything. In this case, I am using a string called human. All right. So I have a string called human, right? Now I want to store each character of this string into a uh, list that we call H underscore letters. So if I use the for loop, this is how we would do it. If I execute this, as you can see, the list contains H and then U, M, A, and then N. Now, what if I wanted to do the same thing, but, uh, by using list comprehension? So what I would do is let's create a list over here, H underscore letters. And, um, so as we know, list com, so list comprehension will, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, you just basically need one line. In this case, it'll just be like this. Now this is my string. Now let's see. When I check what's in H letters, let's see what is the output. So as you can see, I have the output as uh, what I needed. So this is a much cleaner way. Let's go through some more examples now. Now we can do more list comprehensions. Um, we can even use, so we, we've already seen uh, uh, one case where we checked for the character A. We've seen a case where we uh, went through, where we, we did a sort of a loop through a string. We can also use 
this comprehensions in conditionals. So let's uh, look at an example where we use the uh, list comprehension with an if statement. So what if I wanted to store, say, the first 10 even numbers? So this would, uh, so this is an example that I'll be using. So in my list, I want to store the first 10 even numbers. So this would be a way to do it. So I have in range 20. So what this is going to do is x is going to take the value of 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on until 90. Either actually take it from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 until 19. So when we do range 20, we're creating an iterate, an iterable where uh, we're going to loop through or iterate through the value of 0 to 19. So uh, if I, if I do this, and this, what this statement does is basically uh, it checks if it's divisible by 2. So if this is equal to equal to 0, that means we have an even number. And if this condition is met, if this condition is met, that means we store uh, the x into our number list. So let's see what happens when we execute this. This should contain uh, 0, 2, 4, 6 until 18. So this is the first 10 even numbers, as you can see. So this is uh, a neat way of using if statement. We can also use an if else statement. So what if I, I'm checking um, each uh, okay, so I'm going to create another list and in this list, I'm going to s basically see if um, each of my uh, num numbers are the even or odd, the first, uh, let's say, 10 natural numbers. So let's write this statement down. So I want it to be even in case the i that I'm checking, i being every number between, uh, like, say, the first 10 natural numbers, as I said. And let's check if... Um, if it is divisible by 2. Well, if it is divisible by 2, of course, it's going to be even, right? Else, we say that it is odd. And then we check for i in, say, the first, let's say the first 20. Okay. So now when we do this, and we check, oh, we check what's in the list. So as you can see, the list contains like even, odd, even, odd. It's basically saying the number uh, 0 is even, then the number 1 is odd, then number 2 is even, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, uh, an example where we used the, the list comprehension with uh, if-else statements. So another neat thing that we can do with uh, uh, list comprehensions is that we can use it along with functions. So let's look at this function. In this example, we have a function called double x, where we define this double x uh, this double function to take an input, uh, to take an argument x, and what we return is the square of the uh, argument. So let's use this in uh, in our list list comprehension. So what we do over here is that we are we're checking. What we're doing is for every x um, bit in range ten. So we're taking the value zero, one, two, three until nine, and we're passing it to this function double x, and um, we're going to get the square of them, and we're going to store that in a in a list as you can see here let's call this list uh, x let's just call this list uh, let's just call it y so now let's see what's in y when we check uh, it should be 0 1 4 9 and so on so wait this let's check again does this square no this is actually two times so let's make it square as you can see so you can see 0 1 4 9 uh, for the first uh, 10 numbers 10 natural numbers now what I've shown you is obviously list comprehension, um, but we can also do set and dictionary comprehensions. In fact, set comprehensions work exactly the same way as uh, list comprehensions. It, the only difference is the um, set comprehension will make sure that there are no duplicates inside the set. So you can't have like duplicate items, uh, which you can in the case of list comprehensions. So let's, uh, let's like, just take a look at uh, an example. So here in this example, what we're doing is we're going to check. Uh, so we have this string that we're storing in the variable text and the string is, uh, something like life finds a way. So whatever this is. Now what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, in, uh, iterate through this string, uh, character by character and we're going to check if, uh, there are, we're going to check for vowels essentially. So, uh, we're going to see if uh, the character A, E, I, O, or U is present in this string. And if it is, we will pass it into our set. Now, if you, if you look, you will find there are multiple I's, right? And there are multiple A's as well. So if we did this through a list comprehension, each time that we find, found, find a vowel, 
it would be added to our list. But since this is a set and sets do not allow duplicates, so you will only have one copy or one particular object for each of the uh, wobbles. So, uh, of course, now uh, set comprehension is defined using curly braces. So let's keep that in mind. So now if I check what's in this, I will see A, E, I, and U. Even though there are multiple A's or multiple E's or I's and U's, since this is a set, we don't have duplicate copies of any copies of any of these. Uh, so this was just a small example for uh, showing you set comprehensions. Similarly, we can do the same thing, uh, this, this comprehension uh, for dictionaries and we call it dictionary comprehensions. The only thing the, that we have to worry about when it comes to dictionary comprehensions is that uh, we have to define a key when it comes to this. So uh, let's let's look at an example. In this, what we're doing is again dictionary comprehensions are also defined using curly braces, just like sets. Except uh, in this case, we will define a key, and that separates it from a set comprehension. So in this case, what we're doing is that I'm checking. Uh, I'm going through the a list of numbers from zero to nine, right? This is what the range ten function does. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a key which is going to be like 0, 1, 2, 3. And uh, the value of each key would be its square. As you can see here, I'm doing i times i, or just to make it a little more clearer. As you can see, I'm doing i square over here for every value from 0 to 9. So what I should get is like a dictionary where the first key is 0 and the value of that key should be 0 as well because 0 uh, square is 0. Then for 1, it will be 1. And then for 2, 4. And then 3, 9, 4, 16. So let's see what happens. As you can see here, this is the the result that I wanted. So just to summarize, let's go through some key points uh, to remember when it comes to list comprehensions. Um, so it's obviously an elegant way uh, to define and create lists based on uh, existing lists. Uh, it's more compact and faster than normal functions and loops. But we should also keep in mind that we shouldn't write like very complicated uh, list comprehensions because the idea of a list comprehension is to be user friendly. And also it's important to note that every list comprehension can be written in the form of a loop. But uh, every loop cannot be written in the form of a list comprehension. And that is a probably a very key point to remember. So yeah, that's it uh, this, for this video on uh, list comprehension, set comprehension, dictionary comprehensions. Uh, I hope you learned a new, uh, a neat new technique or trick uh, when it comes to creating your new list. In this video, we will be learning about the concept of regular expressions. Now, a regular expression is simply a sequence of characters that defines a search pattern. For example, if you see this example here, you can see a symbol called the caret followed by P and then five periods, then an N and a dollar sign. And what this regex pattern does is it's searching for a seven letter string that starts with P, ends with N and has five characters in between. Let's look at this example now. This is a regex pattern that is looking for a five character string that starts with A, ends with S and has three characters in between. Now, if we had to match this with this string, with these strings as an, uh, as uh, IO test strings, the first one would not match because it's a three letter string and we're looking for a five character string. The second one would match because it's a five character string that ends with an S, starts with an A and has three characters in between. This will not match because what our pattern would do is it would find the first S and it would find that it, the string itself starts with an A and it would say, okay, there are only two characters between this first S and this A and it would assume that this is actually just a, a four character string. To actually uh, identify two consecutive S's, we would have to do something special and what we would have to do is what we will see later on. So again, this is the same example. Since this is case insensitive, capital A uh, is perfectly fine when we're searching for this and it will also match. This is um, this is obviously two words and it's not a five character string. So this will not be a match. Now the regex pattern or the regular expression module in Python can be imported using this statement, import re. Now, once we've done this, we can actually use the, our regular expression tools and methods to do uh, pattern recognition, character recognitions, and to identify different sequence of characters in our strings. Let's uh, try to understand uh, a bit more in depth about regular expressions now. So what you're seeing here is one variable called pattern, which stores something that looks like a regex. 
and another variable that stores our test string called abis. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use the match method of this module re and we're going to check whether this pattern um, or whatever we are trying to search using this regex is in fact does it match with our test string and what we're trying to look for is if you see here very similar to what I just showed you a five character string that starts with a and ends with s. So if you see our test string it indeed is a match and when we use this uh, this command we should get a perfect match. So we should be basically it should say that uh, search is successful if I execute this and this is what it does. Now if I change the test string to this now you will see that now this is no longer what we are looking for a five character string with uh, a and start, starting with a and ending with s and you will see that the search will be unsuccessful as you can see here. Now let's try to understand what exactly do we mean by uh, when, when we use the, these different certain these special symbols like for example this caret or this dollar symbol um, these are by the way known as meta characters and now we're going to look into all the uh, or most of the different meta characters that are used in regex. So to put it simply meta characters are simply characters that are interpreted in a special way by the regex search engine. Now here's a list of meta characters. Let's go through them one by one. Now the square brackets. Square bracket simply specifies the set of characters that we wish to match. So we want to match some combination of A, B and C. It can be 1 A, 2 A's, 3 B's, 4 C's. We are not looking at a specific pattern. We just want to know if A, B and C exists in any form in our string. So if we used it on A, the string A simply, we would find one match because the, the letter A is found here. A, C would match twice because we have A and C present here. In this string, hey Jude, we will have no matches because A, B and C, none of them are found here. And in this weird string, we will have actually one, two, three, four and five matches. So we would have five matches for this, uh, this bigger string because we have five instances of A, B or C. Now let's use re.match to do, to actually search for this and to uh, see if we have our particular, whatever patterns that we're looking for. Now in this input string, this is just some example string. Um, I'm going to test this. I'm going to match whether my pattern that um, a, any of a, b and c is it actually found in this. So let's see what happens when I use re.match for this. So the, the format, uh, the syntax is simply the regex pattern and then comma whatever test string that we have. So let's see what object gets created when we try to do this. As you can see, it's none. Even though you might be wondering, like I can see an A over here, I can see a C over here, re.match actually gives us the result none. Now, if I try to do it on this test string, which is slightly different, instead of the film Titanic was released in 1998, what I'm saying here is all film Titanic was released in 1998. Now let's see if the R match um, works or not. As you can see, it actually does return when I execute this, it returns us an object called re.match object with a span 01. And the span 01 is basically telling us that we have found a match between the 0th and the first character, which is basically this character A, which is what it has found. And it's saying that the match is indeed the character A uh, from amongst these options. So what this is basically telling us and uh, what this means actually is that the re.match method will only find matches if they occur at the start of the string being searched. Once there is a space in, in our bigger string, it will not search for whatever comes after it. So what happened in the first instance was it was actually only searching for matches in this particular word in my larger string. And since it found no match, it basically gave us the result none, which was not the case in the second example because it found a match immediately in the first letter A. Now, if we want to actually check the whole thing, what we would be using is the re dot search, as you can see here, the re dot search method will actually check the whole string and uh, it will return us the first instance where it finds a match. Now let's see, this is a test string now, and we're searching again for our, our uh, we're searching for a, b, and c, any any of these um, in our test string, but we're going to use re dot search and not match. So now if you see, it returns us when I execute this, it returns us a match object again. But this time it's saying the span of 9 and 10. Now the span, span of 9 and 10 actually exists over here. This is the ninth character and A itself is the 10th character. 
over here. So what this basically is telling us that the 10th character is where we found a match, which was the letter A, which was the first instance of either A or B or C in this whole string. And this is basically how re.search works. It will not only search the beginning of the string, but it will search the whole string and return us the first instance of wherever we find. Now, what if we wanted to find out all the instances wherever A, B and C were found and not just the first instance? Well, in that case, we would be using the method find all over here. So when we use find all, it will actually return us each and every case where it found A, B or C. And uh, you might not, it won't uh, tell you the exact position, but it will tell you like, um, so if I execute this, you can see it gives us a, a list with A, C, A and A. And what this basically means is it was looking for the characters A or B or C and it found A first and hence this for the first item in the list. And then it found a C and then it found two A's successively. So this is exactly, this is actually how find all works, where it will actually find all of the instances of our regex pattern. Now that you've seen how the square brackets work and how the re.search and re.match uh, and re.find all methods work. Now we're going to go through all the other meta, meta characters that we saw above. So the period. Now period matches any single character except the new line. New line is basically slash n or a break. Now if you look at this picture, what it's going to do is, um, a, w this expression basically saying that, uh, do we have, um, two characters, like sets of two characters in our string. So this is a single character string. And obviously a single character string is not a double character string. And this expression, this double dot is basically uh, asking us, do we have two characters present in our string? So if I had to match it with this A, it will obviously be a no match because A is one character. If we checked it with AC, it is a match because A and C are two characters. A, C and D will also give us only one match because it will find A, C and then it will leave D as a single character. But when we check A, C, D and E or this string in particular, it will find two matches because it will consider A and C as one of the matches and D and E as one of the matches. So below is basically what we're doing. Basically the same thing. We're just using rd.search for each of these different examples. So if I, if you see when I use find all on A, C, D, E and when I'm searching for a two character match, you will see that it will return me A, C and D, E as you can see here. And similarly for something like this, it will return me again. Uh, whatever like two character patterns it finds successively. So the next symbol, the next meta character is the caret symbol that you've seen earlier. Then the caret symbol is basically used to check if a string starts with a certain character. So if you look at these two, this picture, if you have two, two expressions that we're going to check over here, one is the, uh, one is checking if A is the beginning of a string and the other one will check if A, uh, is the beginning of the string, but is it followed by B or not? So, when we check this, what you can see is the first string will be a match because it's the, only the character A and it will match here as well because this string starts with A, but it will not match here because this string starts with B. Now, if I look at this particular expression, you can see that um, this is going to search for if the string starts with A and is followed by a B. So it will match in this case because it does start with A and is followed by a B, but it will not match in this case, even though it starts with an A because it's not followed by a B. So out here is basically us using the re.search to basically find these patterns. The next symbol that we will come across is the dollar symbol. So the dollar symbol that you can see here is used to check if a string ends with a certain character. And we have already seen how this is used in one of the earlier, uh, one of the earlier examples. So this is going to check basically if, so this expression will check if the string ends with A. So this, uh, this string is basically the character A, so it will match. This also ends with A, so it will match. And this particular string does not end with A, so it will not match. And we are going to do that using the re.search over here. So as you can see, it finds a match in the first character itself here. In this case, it finds a match in the last character, but in CAB, there is no match. So it returns us a none. And another example is uh, of the meta characters is star. So this is the symbol for star. And uh, this, what the star basically is used is for uh, checking if there are zero or more occurrences of the pattern to the left of it. So now if you see here, what this will check for is, um, is there any form of M and A that occurs before N? And it's very important to note that the N has to follow the A in this case. So let's look at these examples and what will happen. So if I ch checked it with M and N, this is actually a match because N is followed by zero occurrences of M and A, which is, if it might seem a little weird, but it is technically the truth because 
the the star symbol checks for not doesn't check for the existence it just checks for if n occurs it must occur after an a or the a should not be there itself in this particular string so as you can see here the n occurs after an m and it's fine because there is no a now you will see when it will not work so m a and n is obviously fine m a uh, m triple a n is also fine because n follows an a and there's an m here this however main will not match now why even though we have m and a and we have an n you see the n is immediately followed by an i is uh, n follows an i immediately or the n is preceded by an i immediately and this is a no match because our the strict condition in the search is that n must uh proceed an a if the a exists again in women it will match because n follows an a over here so we're just going to use the re dot search for these these examples that we saw saw over here in terms of code using the re dot search as you can see here finally we have the next meta character which is the plus symbol yes so the plus symbol matches one or more occurrences of the pattern left to it now this is very sim similar to what we saw earlier in terms of the star except now in the plus the key difference is we're looking for one or more occurrences instead of zero or more occurrences that we were looking for in the case of star so when we say one or more occurrences now we need what is there to the left of the plus sign a zero uh, no occurrence of it will not be allowed or will not cause a match so let's see now what we're going to do here we're going to use the same expression except we're going to replace the star with the plus sign so now what we're going to say is okay we need m and a at least one occurrence followed by an n the all of these conditions have to be met so again if we took the first example m and n this time it will be a no match because there is no occurrence of an a over here for preceding the n so it's a no match m a and n is a match because well this is per, this is per, perfectly fine m triple a and n is also perfectly fine but if you look at m a i and n much like earlier the n is uh, preceded by an i and not an a so there is no match and again women is perfectly fine and we basically execute the same thing through the search function in this piece of code the next meta character is the question mark the question mark symbol matches zero or one occurrences of the pattern to the left of it so let's see what this does so now we saw the star the star which was zero or more occurrences of the pattern to the left of it we saw the plus which is one or more occurrences of the pattern to the left of it now we will see the question mark which is zero or one only zero or only one and not zero or more or one or more which was the previous cases so only zero and one or or one occurrences of the pattern to the left of it again we're going to see the same expression except we're going to replace the meta character with the question mark so now let's see what what happens when we match so if you see here m and n is a match because there is zero occurrence of a and one occurrence of m preceding n so this is fine this is also fine because there is one occurrence of a and m and then it's followed by an n this will not be fine because now we have three occurrences of a which is followed by an n we are only looking for zero or one this again main will be a no match for the same reasons that we have already gone through and women will be a match again for the same reasons and we we do the same thing using the search function in this piece of code the next meta character is the braces character now the braces character is interesting because what we're going to do is we're going to see if there are so uh, the 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 typical syntax for a braces is n uh, brace followed by some integer n comma integer m and then close braces so what this means is we're looking for at least n and at most m repetitions of the pattern left of the braces let's see uh, through an example if you see this expression we're looking for at least two and at most three occurrences of this the character a in our test strings so let's see what happens in the first case we have no matches in this case because this part of the string contains only one a and even this part of the string only contains one a we're looking for at least two and at most three this part will contain one match the second the second example because the second part of the string actually contains two a's for one uh, two uh, repetitions of a's cons uh, consecutively but this uh, in the end and, and in the third example you can see both the strings actually contain matches so we get two matches because as you can see here there's two a's here followed by three a's here now when we look at this particular string let's look at what happens now so what we're going to find is that this thing is perfectly fine so we have two occurrences of a 
But now we have four occurrences of A, but what the search engine is going to recognize is these first three A's and it's going to see, okay, so there are three occurrences of A and I already have a match. It's not going to consider this fourth A in the search. It will just look at the first three and it say, okay, there are uh, three A's and my, my match is fine. So again, there are two matches in this case. Again, we're going to use the search function initially. And you can see each in each of the cases, there is a match except for the first case, which is this case. Now let's see the find all option and uh, see what happens when we do the same thing using find all. So when we use find all, it basically gives us each of the instances where the match has occurred in each of these lists. Now let's try to use a slightly more uh, complicated example where we combine different, let's say different meta characters and we create a, a more sophisticated expression that we want to search in our test strings. So if you look at this expression, what we're looking for is 0 dash 9. Now a dash symbol is valid in Python using regex because what this basically tells it is that it's looking for either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, so on until 9. Basically any of the digits. We are looking for any of the digits from 0 to 9 and we are going to uh, check if at least 2 and at most 4 occurrences of digits if they are there or not in our particular code. So let's see what are the matches that happens when we use it on test strings. So if you use it on this string, you can see it will find one match. This basically this uh, particular part of the string where it says 1, 2, 3. So this is uh, 3 occurrences of digits, so it's fine. Now when we look at this whole string, 12 and whatever this is, you will see this will not find a match here. This obviously will not because these are characters. But if you look at over, uh, this part, it will find matches in, the, in terms of the first 4 and then 7 and 3, the next 2. 1 and 2, again, there are no matches because there's only single occurrences of digits. We're looking for at, at least 2 and at most 4. So if I use a find all, you will see well, like what all it will return. So for the first test string, what it's going to return me is, it's going to return me 1, 2, and 3, as you can see here. But now if you look at this test string, it's going to return me 12. It's going to return me 3, 4, 5, and 6. It's going to return me 3, 4, 1, and 2, but not 7 because we're looking for at least 2. And then it's going to return me 4, 5, 6, and 7 followed by 8 and 8, as you can see in this list over here. Now, if we use curly braces with only one digit, it's basically telling the search engine that uh, we want exactly so many repetitions of the preceding uh, whatever uh, expression that we have. So, when we do this example, for uh, for example, we're basically saying that we want uh, x followed by a dash, and the dash has to occur at least three times in our particular expression, and then it should be followed by an x again which will not match in this case because there are only two dashes and it will match in this case because there are exactly three dashes and it will again not, ma not match in this case because there are four dashes. As you can see here, none followed by an object match followed by none. Next, we move on to the, the alternation, um, the alternation meta character. And as the word suggests, alternation is basically looking for some alternate form of A and B. So A should be followed by B and uh, basically this pattern has to keep going on. So in the first string over here, this pattern will not match. In the second string over here, uh, we will have a match because we at least find an A, even though there is no B. But this is still considered a match because we did find an A at least. Over here, we'll have uh, three matches because we have A followed by a B followed by an A again. So uh, if we did a regex expression for this, we would basically find these many matches for each of these examples. The next meta character is the group. Now a parenthesis is basically used to group sub patterns. So let's look at an example to understand what we mean. Now, if you look at this complicated expression, what this means is that I want some form of X and Z, the X and Z have to occur together. But before that, what I want is some form of A following B following C, some sort of alternation between A, B and C. So this part, as you can see here, is kept in a parenthesis because I want this whole condition to basically occur before I find an X and Z. So let's look at what happens here. In the first case, we don't have a match because uh, there, this basically this parenthesis condition is not being met. We x and z is preceded by a space, or basically the a and b is preceded uh, is followed by a space. So the, if the space didn't occur, we would actually find a match, as you can see in the next example. Here you can see a and b occur. Basically, this uh, initial condition is met, followed by x and z. So there is a uh, one match. So it's fine for us. Now if you look at this uh, slightly more. Uh, a, trickier one, what you can see is we have two matches in this case. First an A followed by X and Z and then we have C, A and B. Now this is perfectly fine because 
we we are looking for a b followed by an x and z we are looking for either of these things we are looking for some form of alternation of these things followed by an x and z and we can get that over here we get b followed by an x and z so you will get two matches in this case now let's go through the concept of grouping constructs now that you've seen many meta characters you've seen how parentheses works let's look at grouping constructs so grouping constructs break up a regex in python into sub expressions or groups and this serves two purposes one is the grouping part which basically says that a group represents a single syntactic entity and uh, any additional meta characters apply to the entire group as a unit and then there's the capturing part which basically tells us that some grouping constructs also capture the portion of the search string that matches the sub expression in the group and you can retrieve captured matches later through several different mechanisms so let's look at uh, basically what we mean by this example over here so if you see this this expression has a plus sign so we're looking for uh, as you know a plus looks for one or more occurrence so this will basically check for one or more occurrence of the character r only because there's no parenthesis as in this example so this plus is Uh, next to an R, and it's going to check for basically uh, whether one or more occurrence of R happens uh, preceding B and A. But if we actually put B, A, and R in a parenthesis followed by plus, it will actually check for the entire string B, A, R, and it will check one or more occurrences of B, A, R together. So if you look at the these two examples, when we use this uh, on these examples, you can see that these are fine, like these matches are fine. But if I used this uh, parenthesis, then these would be the acceptable matches and like b a triple r would not be a match if i use parenthesis uh, as you can see here so this is how grouping constructs work and how parenthesis work so look look at some other examples so what this will do is f o o has to be optionally followed by b a r and b a r must exist to together and um, this is because we have a question mark here this question mark symbol tells us that it should be zero or one occurrences similarly this particular complicated expression is checking for one or more occurrences of whatever we saw earlier basically this whole thing is followed by a plus so we're looking for this whole sequence for one or more occurrences of it c o w is simply just c o w we're looking for this pattern and this is going to check for zero or one occurrence of c o w because of the existence of the question mark for, uh, preceded by the parenthesis in this video we're going to continue our discussion on regular expressions now that you know the basics of regular expressions let's continue our discussion with special sequences now in an earlier video on strings you might have encountered what is an escape sequence and how we use the backslash character to generate these escape sequences and an escape sequence is basically if you remember something that we use to either give a certain special meaning to characters that are otherwise ordinary or it is used to remove the special meaning that are inherently present in certain characters that we call meta characters so let's look at what special sequences are in relation to regular expressions so the first one we're going to look at is the backslash capital a which is used to match if specified characters are at the present are present at the start of a string so out here if you can see we are checking if the word d is present in these two strings so we would get a match in the first case over here because this starts with the word d but in the second case we won't get a match and this is how we're going to check it for the same thing using the find all function so if you see in the first case it gives us it returns us an object because we do find d in the beginning of the string in the second case we get us empty list because the string does not start with the word d now the next one that we'll look at is backslash b small b now this is used to match if specified characters are at the beginning or at the end of a word so when you use backslash small b and then you follow it up with whatever you're looking for it would look for the that particular those particular characters or that pattern if it exists in the beginning of a word in a string so if you look at the first example it starts with f double o and in the second example you see this portion of the string or this word is actually also starting with f double o so it will also match however in this string which is very similar to the second one we don't have a space between a and f and it's basically one word so this does not start with f double o but it actually starts with a f o and it won't match as you can see here now similarly if we wanted to check if something exists in the back of a string at the end of a string we type what we want to search for first and then we follow it with a backslash small b and then if you see here it will match in this first case it will 
match in the second case because this part of the string ends with f double o. But it will not match in this case because, well, we removed the space, so now this whole thing becomes a, uh, the string that we're looking for and it does not end with f double o anymore. And this is basically us just checking it through the find all function. Now the next escape, the next special sequence that we will be looking at is the slash capital B, which is basically the opposite of what we just saw. This matches only if the specified characters are not at the beginning or the end of a word. So if you see here, this is checking if f double o is not at the beginning of these strings. So in this case, there will be a no match. In this case also, there will be a no match. In this third case, there will be a match. Similarly, if we wanted to see if something does not end with a particular string, we would type that whatever pattern we're looking for, followed by a backslash capital B. And then we can use the find all function to generate us lists wherever we find such objects, uh, find such matches in our particular test strings like we have done over here. So the next one that we're going to look at is the backslash small d. And this matches any decimal digit, which is equivalent to doing a square brackets 0 dash 9. As you seen, you must have seen earlier. So if we did a square bracket 0 dash 9 and if we did a search or a find all or a match, it would look for any of the digits between 0 and 9. So a similar thing can be done using a special sequence backslash small d. So as you can see, there will be three matches in this case because one, two and three digits exist. Whereas in this case, uh, for the word Python, there will be no matches. So these are certain examples where we are doing the same thing using the backslash D. Now we have another one, which is the backslash capital D. And this is just basically the opposite. It matches for any non-decimal digits. It's also equivalent to typing a caret inside uh, square brackets with 0 dash 9, which if you remember from the previous video, is basically asking us to check for anything that is not uh, the digit 0 to 9. So this is basically we're going to check in these two strings if there is no digits or no non-decimal digits. So if, if you see here, we will we will find three matches a, b and the uh, double double inverted commas. And in the second string, we will find no matches because this is fully just digits. Next, we have backslash small s. Now this matches where a string contains any white space character. So this is equivalent to doing a uh, check for all of these. So this is like backslash small t is a check for tab space, backslash small n is a check for break line, and then backslash r, backslash f, backslash v uh, are, are their own uh, checks for uh, different sorts of white space characters that you can see by just looking it up honestly. But yeah, so if you simply do a backslash s, it would actually be the equivalent of searching for any of these uh, white space white space characters that we generate. So if you see here, uh, when we do a backslash s on this string, you can see that there is one space over here. So it will match, it will give us one match because there is one white space, which is just the normal space here. And in the second example, there is no match because there is no white space here. Similarly, slash capital S now, as you might have noticed, is basically checking for a string which does not matches in a string wherever there is no white space characters. So it's basically the same as doing caret slash t slash n slash r slash f slash v in a square brackets. So this is basically a simpler way of doing uh, the same thing using square brackets and a caret symbol. So if you see this expression backslash capital S, now we're looking at uh, A space B. So over here, if you see, it'll match for all the non spaces. So it's going to match for A and B. So we're going to get two matches here. Whereas an empty string does not contain, well, it does not contain any non white space character since an empty string is basically a white space character on its own. So this will be, this will give us a no match. So the next special sequence that we're going to look at is the backslash small w. Uh, this matches any alphanumeric character, which is the equivalent of doing a to z in small and then capital A to z and zero to nine follow and also an underscore check in square brackets. Um, it's also, it's important to note that the underscore is considered an alphanumeric character, hence why we include it over here. But yeah, this is the uh, backslash w, uh, small w, which basically checks for uh, any alphanumeric character and matches it in a string. So if you see in this first case, um, it will find three matches at one, two, and also at the letter C. These others are not alphanumeric characters. Uh, whereas in this string, none of these are alphanumeric characters, so we will get no match. Again, much like the other examples, there is a capital, there's a backslash capital W, which will check for any non-alphanumeric character. And it's the equivalent of doing whatever we did before in uh, in the square brackets, just with a preceded by a caret sign. So if you see here, we have this string where we have a bunch of characters. Well, yeah, only one of them, this uh, 
this percentage symbol is a non alphanumeric character so we will get much, one match over here but in this case in this string python we will get no matches because they are all uh, alphanumeric characters which is doing the same thing here with a bunch of different examples using the find all function now the backslash uh, capital z matches if the specified characters are at the end of a string now uh, don't confuse this with uh, backslash uh, small b because the backslash small b checks for a string and it checks each and every word in the string individually and checks if so if any of the words ends with a, uh, a particular thing or or starts with a particular thing but it checks each word individually but in this case the backslash capital z will check the string only and not each word so if you see the difference here in an um, when you use capital backslash capital z um, it will match in this first example but it won't match for the next two but if you used a uh, um, backslash small b over here it would actually match uh, not only in the first example here but it will also match in the second example because it would check this word individually and it will find out that yeah there is a match here as well so it would actually match in the second example as well in this video we will be covering the topic of serialization in python now object serialization is uh, very simply put when we want to convert a data structure or an object type uh, and we want to translate this into a form that is uh, that can be stored in 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 a in a memory such as a uh, a file or a memory buffer uh later we could uh, deserialize this uh, particular file and reconstruct the original object out of it now in python this is done object serialization is done by converting the state of any object into a byte stream this byte stream can be further stored in any file like objects such as a disk file or memory stream it can also be transmitted via sockets deserialization as i mentioned earlier is the process of reconstructing the object from the byte stream now in python we refer to the serialization and deserialization by the terms pickling and unpickling so the pickle module which is which is a module that is a part of the standard library of python um it provides functions for serialization uh, such as the dump and the dumps function and also for deserialization with uh, load and loads uh the data format of pickle module is uh, specific to it's very python specific and so programs that are not written in python may not be able to deserialize the um, uh, pickle data properly and it's also considered unsecure to unpickle data from uh, unauthenticated sources so in this example here what i'm going to do is um, i'm going to the i'm going to take the dictionary object uh, which is uh, represented by dct and its byte representation will be stored in a file called pickled.txt and uh, we were also going to enable the write and binary mode preemptively so if you can see here first i'm importing the pickle package and then i'm opening um i file pickle.txt and write in binary mode um then i create this dictionary and i'm going to dump this dictionary into that particular file and then i'm going to basically close the file so this uh, executing this would do this now it's important to note a pickle file cannot is not a human uh, readable file a, a computer can understand this but it's uh, some so the byte representation of any object or data type cannot be um read by a human in plain sight so this next part is where where i'm going to deserialize or i'm going to unpickle the uh, file pickle.txt so again i'm importing pickle i'm opening opening this file in uh, read in binary mode and uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to load this into d um this will basically in a way deserialize whatever was there in pickle.txt and once i have unloaded it in d i'm going to print what's the content of d which should be my uh, original dictionary itself so when i execute this you can see that printing d prints my original dictionary that we had before and it's important to note since dictionaries are uh, unordered so dictionary objects don't retain the order of insertion of keys so in the way so the way we enter the keys inside the dictionary uh, when we create it is not maybe the same way that we will see the the order of the key the key value pairs when we actually unload it now there exists a uh, dumps function inside the pickle module that pickles python data to a string representation so we're going to do that in this uh, next piece of code so i'm importing the dumps function from uh, the pickle module and i have my same dictionary what i'm going to do is i'm going to dump this dictionary into dct string and i'm going to print dct string uh, to show you like what exactly uh, a string representation of this dictionary would typically look like so when you execute this um, you see this uh, something very cryptic so this is basically uh, what we mean by string representation 
Um, of course, we can use the loads function again to unpickle whatever we just did and uh, get the original uh, dictionary representation of this particular string. So that's what we're doing in this piece of code. And as you can see, we get back our dictionary over here. So now in our second example, what we're going to do is um, we're going to create slightly more complex data structures and we're going to do some uh, serialization, deserialization on them. So we have this function called store data where uh, we initialize two dictionaries called Omkar and Jagdish with some certain key value pairs. Um, now we create another uh, another dictionary, empty dictionary called DB, which will be like a database. And now this DB has uh, two keys again called Om Omkar and Jagdish once again. And now if you notice, my keys, my new keys are Omkar and Jagdish, but their values are these new dictionaries again. So um, we're, we're basically storing a dictionary within a, a dictionary, so as to speak. So once we have done that, what we're going to do is we're going to create a uh, another file called um, example pickle and we're going to uh, create it in uh, binary mode. Now, once we've done that, we're going to dump this, this dictionary db into uh, this uh, this file called uh, db file where we have uh, opened basically where we're going to store uh, the, the serialized representation of uh, this dictionary called db and then we're going to close. So this is what store data will do when we call this function and in load data, what we're going to do is we're going to print out um, what each key and what uh, what it represents. So um, we're going to basically uh, deserialize in the load data function. We're going to deserialize whatever we just serialized in the previous function. So when we execute this, we should basically get something like uh, omkar followed by this sort of an arrow sign and whatever the dictionary that we have assigned to omkar is. Similarly for Jagdish as well. So when we do store data, it will basically do the serialization process. Um, and when we do load data, it should do the deserialization and print out the uh, original, the DB dictionary that we created in store data over here. So let's uh, execute these two. Oops, I did not execute the load data. So now it should work. Yeah. So if you see now when I, when I have executed load data, I get back. Um, so basically from store data, I first serialize my whole file into a particular file called db file and once I have done that I have uh, deserialized it using the load data function over here. In this video we will be covering the topic of Python partial functions. Now partial functions allow us to fix a certain number of arguments for a function and generate a new function. Uh, the func tools or partial module helps us achieve this. Now let's say we want to create a function that explicitly performs exponentiation. So we can get squares, cubes, and other power, power operations on any number. So let's look at an example. So we create this function called power where we have a base and an exponent. So what this does is it will basically print some number which is the base to the power of some exponent and the result which will be returned over here. So let's define. Let's see now what if we want to create uh, a dedicated square and cube functions that leverages this. So we can define a square. Um, function called uh, with an argument called base where we return the power of the same base to the power of 2. So we're basically we're doing for we're defining a square function um, with the help of this function that we defined already called power. Um, for cube we will basically do the same power function but the exponent will be 3. So now when we do square 10 we're going to say if we executed all of this. So now if we say square 10 uh, what this will do is it will say 10 to the power of 2 is 100 and um, if you see the next one cube 5 5 to the power of 3 should be 125 as you can see here now this works but what if we want to create um, say 15 to 20 variations of our power functions and what about say 1000s of them writing a, defining a function for each case is obviously very repetitive it's annoying and uh, this is where we will find partial coming into play so and as, a, as an example, let's do the same thing. Now what, what we're going to do is we're going to import partial from the module called functools. We have a, uh, what we're going to define is this function called square, which is basically going to uh, use the partial functions uh, operation for the power function um, with the exponent of two. So what we're doing is basically we're going to use the power. We're going to reference the power function that we defined earlier, but we're going to pass the uh, the argument for exponent as two. And for cube, we're going to do the same thing, but exponent is three. So once we've defined this, if we do square two, you get the result as you can see. For cube two, you get the result as you can see here. Let's look at another example. So we have this function uh, where we define some function with four arguments 
Now, what we're going to do is argument A, B, C, and X, right? So we're going to return 1000 times A, 100 times plus 100 times B, plus 10 times C, plus X. Now, we're going to create a partial function that calls this function, but it's going to use um, A as 3, B as 1, and C as 4, always, right? And um, so the, how we do that is basically G is equal to partial, like this. So once we've executed these, now if we say G10, we basically get the value for uh, 1000 times, well, 1000 times 3 since A is 3, plus 100 times B is 1, so 100 times 1, plus 10 times, well, C is 4, so 10 times 4, plus X. Now X we've passed as 10, so the result of all this will be 3150 as you can see here. Now let's look at a final example where I've defined some function called add. I have three arguments, a, b, and c. What I return from this add function is 100 times a plus 10 times b plus c. So let's create a partial for using partial functions where b and b is 1 and c is 2. So we have this fixed. Um, we can create a partial function called add part. So what this does is it takes the add function. It creates a partial function out of it using c is equal to 2 and b is equal to 1. So now when I print add part 3, what happens here is uh, 3 gets passed in the form of A. So I get 3, three, three times 100. And since B is fixed as 1 and C is 2. So I get 3 times 100 plus uh, 1 times 10 plus 2. So it should give me 312. So when I execute this, uh, you can see this here. In this video, we will be covering the topic of closures. Now before we understand what a closure is, we have to understand what is a nested function and non-local variables. Now a function which is inside another function is known as a nested function. Nested functions are able to access variables of the enclosing scope. So if I define this function called outer function, where I pass some argument called text and I store that in a variable called text again, and if I create a function within this called inner function, and I want to print whatever this variable is in text, uh, when I execute this, it will be able to access this variable because it's within the enclosing scope. So if I said outer function hey, this gets stored in the variable text, and then the inner function will print uh, that variable, which is basically the string here, as you can see here. Now, inner function can easily be accessed inside the outer function body, but not outside of its body. So here, uh, inner function is treated as a nested function, which uses text, this, this variable text, as the non-local variable. Now, a closure is a function object that remembers values in enclosing scopes, even if they are not present in memory. Um, it is a record that stores a function together with an environment. It's a mapping, basically, that associates each free variable of the function, which are basically variables that are used locally, uh, but are defined in an enclosing scope, with the value or reference to which the name was bound when the closure was created. A closure, which is, uh, which unlike a plain function, allows the function to access those captured variables through the closures, copies of their values or references, even when the function is invoked outside the scope. So let's look at an example to emphasize on what uh, what was just said. So again, I've created, I've defined this function outer function where I'm doing the same thing. Now I've defined the same inner function where I'm going to print the same thing. Now it's very important that when I return over here, what I'm going to return is inner function, but it's not going to be a function call. This is important to create our, our closure. So we return inner function, but with, without um, using the call as we do over here. And what this return will do is basically to create the enclosure, sorry, the closure, um, where the inner function will, re will remember the values of the variables stored in the enclosing scope. So now I'm going to store this uh, outer function in an object called my, in a variable called my function. Now when I call this my function, um, you can see there, there'll be two things that are happening here. So once I've defined this and I've executed this, what happens out here is this function has already executed. And then I'm storing it into this. But because I've done return inner function without parenthesis, I've created a closure basically. And this closure allows the inner function to remember the values that were stored in text at any point at, and at every point, even after the execution of this one time. So when I execute this again for the second time over here, it will remember the value that was stored in the variable text, which is hey, which was, which was given over here. That's why you see when I execute it for the second time over here, the first time being in this line when I'm storing it in my function, when I execute in the second time, again it will give me the result of hey. As you can see, the closures have to invoke functions outside the scope. The function inner function has a scope only inside the outer function, but with the use of closures, we can extend its scope to invoke a function outside the uh, scope. 
So now let's look at this code. So this code, uh, don't worry about uh, what's going on here. Just know that what we are doing here is we have two functions which we define called add x and y which will return x plus y and the subtract function which will subtract x and y. So now we're going to execute these once we're going to execute the add over here and add logger and we're going to execute the uh, subtract function and we're going to store it in sub logger. So technically we have already executed these two functions but now uh, since I've created an ex uh, an enclosure, basically, uh, if you see here, this is the enclosure that I've created. Now what happens is, when I access this function from uh, outside its um, initial scope, which is basically over here, this was the initial scope. When I access it outside, you will see that it, it is it still has access to these variables x and y. So if you see here, I, I, I first of all, I've allowed this, uh, this, the enclosing function to accept uh, arguments of any numbers. So uh, I can pass x, y, I can pass x, y, z also. But if you see here, I, I only have a thing for x and y. So when I want to access any value of x and y, even after the execution of this code initially, um, I have access to these variables x and y. And that is because I've created a closure out of um, that. So if you see, if I do add logger 3 and 3 over here, I'm able to get the result 6. If I do add logger 4 and 5, I'm able to get the result 9. Similarly, for subtraction logger 10 and 5, I will get 5 here. And 20 and 10, I'll get 10 here. And uh, I can keep doing this. I can keep saying add logger. And if I, if I say 4 and 7, so if I executed this, and now I'm going to say, let's say, for example, add logger. If I said 4 and 7 here. So this still has access to my variables x and y because I've created the closure. And it should give me 11. Similarly, if I did sub logger, say 30 and 15, it should give me 15 because 30 minus 15. So let's say 30 minus 16, right? So it should give me 14 because again, I have created the closure and it has access to these variables already. In this video, we are going to be learning about the topic of decorators. To start off with, let's first understand some basic concepts. Now in Python, we know that functions are first class objects. And that means that functions are objects and they can be referenced to and they can be passed to a variable and they can be returned from other functions as well. Functions can also be defined in another function and can be passed as an argument to other functions. So decorators allow programmers to modify the behavior of a function or class. Decorators allow us to wrap another function in order to extend the behavior of the wrap function without permanently modifying it. Now any generic functionality that you can tack on to an existing class or function's behavior makes a great use case for decoration. Some of these include rate limiting, caching, logging, enforcing access control and authentic authentication, instrumentation and timing functions. Now you have to remember that function names are references to functions and that we can assign multiple names to the same function. So for example, if you see here, I have defined a function called success which does uh, basically you pass an integer and it returns one plus that integer. So if I do success 10, it should give me 11, as you can see here. Now, if I'm, if I'm going to say successor is equal to success, I've basically created another function called successor, which does the same job as a success function. So now if I pass 20 to successor, it should return 21, as you can see here. So as you can see that we have two names, success and successor for the same function. An important fact is that we can delete either one of the any of the functions and um, you won't delete the other one. So if I said delete success and if I tried to pass 10 to the other function called successor, it would still execute the uh, whatever task it, the function is supposed to do. Now let's look at an example of a function inside a function. So I've defined a function called f in which I have defined another function called g which has two print statements that you can see here. The function f itself has two print statements and in uh, at the end of the execution of function f, we call this function g. So let's see what happens when we actually execute f. So let's uh, look at it on this side. So if you see here, this is where I've defined it. Now let's call my function f and let's see what happens. As you can see, first when you execute function f, it will create this function and then it will print these functions and then it will do a call to this and when we call this function g it's going to do two of its own print statements as you can see in this order over here so this is an example of a function within another function um, let's look at another example of something similar 
if you see here, I've defined a function called temperature where I can pass um, some value for t and have a I have defined another function within this called Celsius to Fahrenheit and basically I'm doing the conversion. So when I execute this, what it should return me is um, I'll pass some temperature and it, and it will return me the temperature in degrees. So for example, in this case, I have passed temperature 20. So let's see what uh, does it pass, what result does it give to me in degrees. As you can see, it says it's 68 degrees. Now let's look at another example of a um, function within a function for a very common example for the factorial function. So if you see here, I've defined factorial n and I'm saying if the value that is passed in n is equal to 0, return me 1. Otherwise, return me the product of that number times and I'm going to do a recursive call back to the same function, except now I'm not going to pass n but n minus 1. So what this should do is if I pass 10, for example, it will basically check, okay, since 10 is not equal to 0, it will go here and it will return me 10 times factorial of 9 and that will do 10 times 9 times 8 and then so on until we reach uh, n is equal to 0 where it will just say, okay, return 1. So what you will effectively get is 10 times 9 times 8 times 7, so on until 1, which is basic factorial of whatever we have passed. So let's execute this. Let's see, I'm going to check what is the factorial of 5 here. And as you can see, it gives me 120. Now let's have a, let's include a line, uh, an let's raise an exception um, by an else statement, which will basically raise a type error. And it will tell me that if I pass a number n, which is not an int, and if it's not greater than or equal to zero, it should give me this error message. So I have uh, included this extra statement in this just to check. So if I pass nine, as you can see, it should give me a valid result, which is 362. 880. Now what if I pass minus 5? So let's execute this. As you can see, I get the uh, the type error that I have raised over here in case I meet such a condition. And in this case, you cannot find the factorial of a negative integer. So that is why my type error gets raised over here. If you actually look closely at this program, you will notice that each time I call back my function factorial, so if I gave it 5 initially, it will check for the uh, this this condition. And uh, since it's, it will meet the condition, we can, we can continue. But the next time when we call factorial for 4 and then for 3 and 2, each time is going to do this check. Um, that's kind of redundant because we know that if we passed 5 in the beginning, uh, until we decrement it to 0, we are going to only get the valid numbers 5, 4, 3, 2 and 1. So we don't need to do this check at every point. We just need to do one check. So an, a workaround for this um, would be um, in this code that I'm, I've written over here. And in this, I've basically defined a factorial function called n, which will, where I'll pass my um, integer initially. And within that, I've defined the actual function where the actual results will be calculated. And that's called inner factorial. This is where the, um, this is basically the actual factorial calculating part. And uh, if you see this if statement block, this is my check. So this will basically be the only check that will happen. So out here, it will check whether the n I have passed is a valid integer and equal to or greater than zero. And if it is, then we will perform this inner factorial function where uh, we won't be doing any more such checks. We will only calculate the um, factorial. And if it's not, then we will raise uh, this exception just once and we will exit the program in case we've given a wrong number. So let's look at an example for three. So as you can see at each step of my calculations, I'm going to return whatever value I have at that point. So. Uh, basically, if I give 3, you will notice that you will get 0, 1, 2, and 6 if you multiply it in the right way. So let's do this. As you can see, factorial 3. Um, one second. So I have to execute this. Now if I execute this, you can see I first get, because initially it will check, um, when I move into inner factorial, it will check if n is equal to equal to 0. It will basically return whatever value I have at that point. So basically, this is the um, order of calculations in a, in a backward way. So you can see here, it will first be uh, 1, and then 1 times 2, and then 2 times 3, which is 6, which is what we get. So don't worry about the order in which we are re returning these values. This is basically just um, a, re a reverse way in which the, the program will fetch our values. So yeah, this was basically how we reduce the redundancy in, in the check in the check part of our function. Now let's look at some examples where uh, a function will be returning another function. 
So as we know, the output of a function is also a reference to an object, and therefore functions can return references to function objects. So out here, if you see, I've defined a function called f, which will take a parameter called x, and then within it, I've defined a function called g, which will have a parameter called y. And uh, this g will basically return y plus x plus 3, and uh, the function f itself will return the function g. So um, if I pass 10 in function, so what this will do is it will create a function called g. I will create an instance of a function called g and uh, that object is going to be returned to us because we basically return g when we call function x, right? So if I execute this, you will see that when I say f10, it will give me some uh, object location of a function called g. Now if I want to see the result of what I get for this function g, I have to pass something within g itself. So out here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to store this function object in a variable called nf1. Once I've done that, I can pass another uh, parameter for this nf1 object. Uh, and since we know this nf1 is a variable name for the function g, so when I pass nf120, I'm basically passing this y parameter. So since now I have passed 10 for x and I have passed 20 for y. Oh, oops, one second. Yeah. So what I will get returned is 20 plus 10 plus 3, which is 33. When I do nf1 and I pass 20 as the parameter here, as you can see, I get 33 over here. Now let's uh, look at a function where we will implement polynomials of degree 2 and then we will actually uh, extend that to poly polynomials of any degree. So uh, I have created a function called polynomial creator uh, where I pass three uh, arguments which will represent the coefficients. So a will represent the x square coefficient, b will represent the x coefficient and c the constant. So I have defined within this, I've defined a polynomial function called x where I will pass my uh, value for the variable x and I want to get returned the um, the value for this polynomial. Um, so as you can see here, uh, initially when I, the first function will return this object and then for this object itself, I will have to pass another uh, argument where I'll pass the value of x. So let's create, so I'm going to create two instances of this polynomial function. In, uh, and uh, in the first instance, my coefficients are, as you can see, 2, 3, and minus 1. In the second case, it'll be minus 1, 2, and 1. So once I execute this, oops, let me execute the function initially. Yeah, there you go. So if you, if I, if I execute p1, it will basically give me a object location of the polynomial function for p1, which is uh, represented by this basically. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to iterate through values between minus 2 and 2, not including 2, at steps of 1. So I'm going to iterate for minus 2, minus 1, 0, and 1. And I'm going to say, uh, initially print me the values of x that I'm going to pass in this column, this first column. And then I'm going to say, okay, what are the results for the first polynomial object where the coefficients are 2, 3, and minus 1. And then in this column, give me the values of the polynomial with these coefficients, minus 1, 2, and 1. So when I execute this, as you can see, these are my results. Now, what if I wanted to do the same thing for arbitrary coefficients, as in um, a polynomial of nth degree? You know, I'm not specifying the exact degree. So this I can do with this slightly, uh, slightly more complicated program, which is uh, actually very, uh, very simple. Uh, so if you see this function, I've defined a polynomial creator function again, but in this case, I have passed variable number of arguments. So this asterisk basically means I can have any number of arguments here, um, and this will be an iterable with uh, any a, n number of um, objects that can be iterated upon. So, th and that will be called coefficients. So within that, again, I've defined polynomial x. Now what I've done is I've initialized some variable called res, which will basically be my result variable. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to for loop through this coefficients iterable. And what this basically does is in a backward way, um, this is basically going to iterate through the, uh, the array or the list or whatever we have of coefficients in a backward way. So if I pass 6, 7, uh, 8, 9, it's going to give me 9, 8, 7, 6 in that order. And what this enumerate function will do is um, it will assign an index to each of the values and coefficients. So for example, I can just show you over here what it, uh, this means. So if I created a uh, array called um, say coefficients with some some random values over here, right? Now, if I'm going to perform this line, right? Now let's see what happens when we do a for loop. Let's see what values we get for index and when we do this, execute this line. So if you see here, now once I execute this, as you can see, 
what I have done is coefficients. Oh, I made a smelling mistake. This is taking from a different variable. So let's fix this. So as you can see, I've, I've I entered four objects, uh, four integers, 1, 23, 4, and 45. And um, when I do this for loop, I basically want to assign some index value 0, 1, 2, and 3 to each value in this list, but in a backwards manner. So this will be the zeroth item. This will be the first. This will be the second. This will be the third. So that's what we are doing in this function as well out here. We are basically uh, going to use this enumerate function to now if you see this, this result is basically going to add each each component of this polynomial. So if you see closely, what this is going to do is it's going to first um, in the first step is going to find out well what is the value of this the constant term, and then in the next step is going to find out what is the value of this. And it's going to keep summing it up. It's going to sum this part up, this part up until the end. And then we will get our final result in this variable res and we're going to return that over here. So if you see here, I've gonna have done the same thing. I've created four function objects and they're called p1, p2, p3, p4. And now I'm going to iterate through again minus two, minus one, zero and one um, as my different x values. And I'm going to see what are the different values for each of these polynomials. So if you see here, my first polynomial is basically uh, it has only one coefficient so it's a polynomial of the zeroth degree so basically whatever i pass for x that itself should uh, be my result so actually this is a polynomial of zeroth degree so this is basically the only result we will get so the constant is 4 we will get 4 in every result so if you see here what i'm printing is the x values first and what are their their respective polynomial values for each of these objects that we've created so this is a constant so p1 will only have the result 4 this is p2, so this is a polynomial of degree 1. So it's like saying 2x plus 4, and where x takes values minus 2, minus 1, 0, and 1. And in this case, you can see this is a polynomial of fourth degree. So it's like saying um, x to the power 4 plus 8x cubed minus x squared plus 3x plus 2. So the when we replace x with minus 2, minus 1, 0, and 1, we get the respective values in the p3 column over here. And uh, for p4, it's a, it's a, it's basically a square polynomial. So yeah, this is an example of how we can create, um, a, we can do a polynomial creator and get our results accordingly. Now, interestingly enough, what we've done here is basically like, for example, let's look at P3, right? P3 is basically this polynomial. Now this polynomial function inside our dev creator, uh, polynomial creator. So all these examples that I've been showing you where functions are within functions. Um, if you think of it, it's, it's like, uh, I'm giving some basic function x extra. Uh, like I'm doing something extra within them, right? So we can use decorators for this. And um, in our example over here, what I can do with this function is I can implement the same operation more efficiently by using a decorator within our main function. So we can factorize it in a way that it does not need any exponentiation. So we can, if you if you think of it, this polynomial can be represented like this, right? If you think of it, it's basically this times x plus some constant and then that whole thing is again times x plus some constant since this is a to the power four um, this is all we need but if you think of it if we keep going further all you have to do is again enclose it in another bracket and then do times x so we can basically use a decorator to do this so if you look at this function over here what i've done is i've created the same uh, polynomial creator with variable number of arguments but in this inside this function like um what I've done in the form of a decorator is that I'm going to uh, implement this polynomial in by calculating the result in this manner, where um, it's going to be very uh, much more efficient and you don't have to keep uh, exponentiating uh, like how I did in this example. So that's what I'm doing over here. And if you see, um, that is basically implemented over here through this. So when I do the same, when I execute the same thing, and if I go through the for loop again, it should give me the same results, but it's it's much more efficient. Now let's look at another example of a simple decorator. So we have a I've defined a function called our decorator func. Now this will basically be this will this is a reference to another function itself. If you see within this, but inside my uh, decorator I have a function wrapper where I'm going to print this statement before actually like uh, calling the function x uh, before calling the function. And I'm going to perform a print statement again after that. And I'm going to return the function wrapper at the end of like uh, executing the decorator. So let's look at what happens when we define this function uh, foo x. So this is basically a simple print statement where I'm saying hi foo has been called with 
um whatever this is um argument so now let's execute what happens when i say foo high so as you can see um let's execute the whole thing so yeah as you can see here i have executed this it says this is the print statement that i've basically written over here and uh, this is basically this is what gets printed when i call this function here now when i move on to the next statement um it is what i'm declaring is i'm going to now decorate foo with f now what this means is i have now created this uh, ob this decorator object basically so let's let's look at what happens when i execute this and then i'll try to explain to you so when i execute the whole thing you can see something else is happening now so we have we call foo after decoration then we have this before calling foo and uh, this is basically this print function this is the print function that gets executed here now we have this now this is the function call this is basically the function call um which is this which is basically this foo function and uh this is the, this line is being printed from this so if you see here i'm i'm getting some results from this like from this decorator itself but i'm also calling upon the function that is being referred to by this decorator so i'm doing two things i'm i'm doing the main thing which is being executed here which is the result is here but i'm also uh, decorating it with these two lines which comes from this decorator called our decorator so let's look at the explanation so if if you look at the output of this previous program we can see what's going on and that is that the decoration foo this uh, when we did this line which was over here it's a reference to the function wrapper which is this now in this function wrapper this function itself right like this function that we defined here that will be called as well but we will also have a, a bunch of extra like print statements in the form of these two lines which you can see over here before calling and after calling that we have also done along with this so this is a simple example of how we have used a decorator to modify our basic function now this usual syntax for decorators in python is with the at the at symbol so we can write the same thing like what we did before through this so we write at our decorator and this will basically apply the decorator to this function foo x so when we do at our decorator and then we define this function and we call it it will basically do the the same thing as um doing this for example so if i execute this you can see the same thing has happened here now i'm going to give you another example of a decorator um remember the factorial function that we did earlier um where we did a check within the factorial function well let's see how we can use decorators to aid our case in this so as we as we know before we calculate the factorial of something we want to make sure that uh, whatever we pass is greater than or equal to 0 and it's an integer right so let's define a decorator which will basically do this so this in this decorator what we're going to do is we're going to call a create a function called uh, helper where uh, we're going to perform this check and uh, this is going to be our decorator basically right however so what this this will do what this will do is basically this decorator will say okay if this check is met then you can perform you can return the value of function of x which is uh, the function is what is what we pass in this um, as an argument to the uh, decorator so once the check is done we can perform a factorial so that's what we're going to do here so we've defined our decorator now we're going to use the decorator here and we're going to define within it a factorial function so when we actually perform the factorial like for some numbers like uh, we're going to do factorial of 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 all these uh, 10 digits from 1 to 9 sorry so if you're going to do that what is going to do is at each step um so for the value 1 it's going to first check whether our integer passed is actually the correct form of an integer whether it's uh, in integer and greater than or equal to 0 so once that is done then it will move on to the factor actual factorial function so when we do for i in range 1 and 10 since every number is valid we won't get a like we won't nothing nothing wrong will happen there won't be any exception raised but what if we did factorial minus 1 now now the factorial function itself doesn't have a check but since we have a decorator around this factorial function it's first going to do this check and if it finds an error it will raise an exception so if i do this if you see when my when i execute it raises my exception so this is how we have added some functionality to the original factorial function using this decorator in this video we will be covering the topics of map filter and reduce functions in python now python provides several functions that enable functional approach to programming and since functional uh, programming is all about expressions 
um, some of these expression oriented functions of Python are um, lambda functions, list comprehensions, map filter, uh, map filter and reduce. Now we've already covered the topic of lambda and list comprehensions. Um, now let's cover the topics of map filter and reduce. So to start off, let's look at the map function. The map function takes in two attributes, a function and a sequence. Um, a function is basically some defined, some user defined function or any function. Uh, a sequence is basically an iterable object like a list or um, a tuple, for example, or a bunch of lists and tuples as well. So let's look at an example. So one of the most common operations that we do with something like a list is uh, doing an operation on each of the elements in the list and then outputting a new list with uh, the the values as uh, whatever we have modified to the original items of the uh, list. So if we what if we did the square of all of these items in this list and we, we want to create a list based on that. So we can basically iterate through it and we can do a square function and then append those values to a new list called uh, squared. And when we do this, uh, for example, over here, you can see when we print squared, we should get the list of uh, whatever square values we have uh, for the original list. But this is uh, slightly a bit tedious. And what if we had a method that or a, what if we had a, a technique wherein we could um, basically pass a function that we have uh, that we want to do and a sequence on which we want to apply this and we pass it to a function and this function basically takes care of um, applying whatever operation we want to do on each element of a sequence. So well, this is where the map function comes in use. So let's look at uh, how we use the map function over here. So if you look at this, I've defined a square function. So the square function basically returns, uh, takes an argument x and it returns the square of it. And I have a map function, which takes the square um, function as one of the arguments and uh, the, I, the list or an iterable as the second argument. So this map function creates a map object, if you see here. So let's just do it one by one. So I'm creating my list and I'm going to create my function called square. And I'm going to send this to the map function. So I'm sending this, uh, the first argument as the function that I want to do and the second argument as the list that I want to apply it on. Now let's list out all the items that are in this map object. So if you see, it creates me a list with basically the squared items. And this is exactly what we needed. And another way of doing the same thing would be just going through a for loop in each of the map objects and printing each, which would give me the same results. So if you see here, I found a very neat way of passing a function and an iterable and um, using the map function to apply each operation that is part of the function or applying the function on each item in the iterable. So as you've seen, we basically passed in a user defined function and we applied it to each item in the list. Then the map calls the square function on each list item and collects all the return values into a new list. And because map expects a function to be passed in, it also happens to be one of the places where Lambda functions are appearing a lot. So let's look at the an example where we do the same operation using a Lambda function. So if you see here, I have a Lambda function where I'm passing it as the function argument. And what this Lambda function takes is some variable X or some argument X. It does its square and it returns that X. And this X is basically going to come from each element that is present in this list called items. And when we list down these, you will see it basically does the same thing for us. It creates us list with squared items. Now we can also pass instead of passing uh, an iterable itself, we can actually pass a sequence of functions and uh, use the lambda function to perform uh, a sequence of functions on particular items. So let's look at a new example, a slightly different one. So we're going to use a NumPy module for this. Don't worry, we're just using it to use the square root function that is present in the NumPy power module. Um, we will be learning about NumPy in a later section. So um, we're going to import this first. And now I'm going to define three functions called square, cube and square root. So once I've defined these, basically they're uh, returning the square, the cube root, uh, the cube and the square root of some integer x. And um, now I'm going to create a list of these functions that you've just seen. Um, and we're going to uh, use a for loop and we're going to iterate through a range from uh, 0 to 4. So, and we're going to pass this and we're going to say that we want to apply some some function, we want to apply some function x and we want to return that using this lambda function. Now what values this x will take is based on whatever functions we've stored in this 
variable called FUNCS or funks. And in FUNCS, we have a bunch of functions called square, cube, and square root that we have defined earlier. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply each of these functions to R and R will take the value 0 to 4. And now let's see when we print this, what values we get. So if you see here, we get a list of um, square root, squares, cubes, and square roots for integers 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So this is another way of um, using the map function and lambda functions together to apply multiple different operations to a bunch of iterables. Now for our next example, what we're going to do is we're going to create a function that basically what it does is it creates the uppercase of some string that we pass to it, right? So that's what we've done here in this function called to uppercase. So if, let's let's define this function. Now we have a print function basically, which is going to print each object in a particular, um, which is going to print each element of a particular object. And it's going to, uh, at the end of it, and the end of printing, we're going to give a small space for printing a new line basically. So let's create this also, this print iterator object. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pass a string with uh, the letters a, b, and c to this function. And we're going to map, uh, we're going to apply the uppercase function to this uh, string. Now, if you remember, string is also an iterable where it's a sequence of one character strings. So this whole string is basically a sequence of one character string a, one character string b, and c. So we're going to, so we, we can pass a string as a, a, as an iterable to the map function because it will apply the operations on each of these characters. So let's see what happens when we do the uppercase function. Uh, we apply the upper, uppercase function using the map, uh, using mapping to uh, this string a, b, and c. So if you see, it's created me a list with uh, capital A, capital B, and capital C as we had expected um, because we have applied the list function to the map object. Now, um, in the next step, what we're going to do is um, we're going to do a very similar thing. We're just going to, instead of uh, simply mapping and creating a list out of it, we're going to store the map object in uh, a variable called map iterator. We're going to print uh, what type of object it is. And then we're going to print out each of the elements using the print iterator function that we defined here. So um, let's do this. Now, if you see the class, uh, the type of object uh, is of class map and the objects uh, elements inside the object are A, B, and C. Moving on. Let's, uh, let's look at now a, an example where we're going to pass multiple arguments. Um, so instead of one iterable, we're going to pass multiple iterables now. And we're going to apply some sort of an operation. So if you see here, what we have done is we've created two, uh, two, two uh, sequences. One is a list of some numbers and another is a tuple of some numbers. So just to show you, let me first copy this here. Um, yeah. So if you see here, I have a list and a tuple. And I'm passing both of these, if you see, to this map function. And before that, I have defined a lambda function as the operation that I'm going to apply. And what this does is it takes two arguments, x and y, and it returns the product of both of these. Uh, where does it get x and y from? So the x it gets from this, uh, uh, this sequence, which is a list, and it takes y from this sequence, which is a tuple. So what it's going to do is going to take x as 1 and then y as 5 in the first step, and it's going to return the product as 5. And then the next step is going to take 2, as x and then y as 6 and it's going to return the product of that and we're going to get 12 and so on we're going to get 21 and then 32 um, when we did and this is these values are going to be stored in the map iterator uh, which is a map type object and when we use the print iterator function it's basically going to print out uh, whatever results we got um, through this mapping so let's execute this and as you can see this is the result we got 5 12 21 and 32 which is what we wanted so the next part the next function that we're going to discuss is the filter function now. Now a filter function is basically, again, it takes two, two arguments, a function and a sequence. And a function basically tests if each element of a sequence is true or not. Now a sequence, the sequence, um, so this filter function will basically take two arguments. So one is the function and this function is basically going to test if each element of a sequence is true or not. And it's going to take another argument called sequence. And uh, this argument sequence is the list or the tuple or basically any sequence and or iterable that needs to be filtered. And it can be, uh, as I mentioned, it can be sets, list, tuples, or containers of more iterators. And what this function will return is an iterator that is already filtered. Um, so let's look at an example now. So we have this list R, which you've generated, which is basically numbers from minus 5 to 4. So if I create this list here, you can see it will create a list of minus 5 to 4. Now, if I wanted to extract only the values that are lesser than 0, well, I can use a for loop and use a if condition to check this, right? So if I did this over here, 
you can see so it gives me it returns me some list called result which contains only the values um, lesser than zero which is basically checked through this condition what if there was a uh, neat or a more convenient or a more um, organized approach to doing the same thing instead of creating a loop ourselves what if we defined a function where we are going to do the test or we're going to create the condition and we're going to pass this to a particular function and then apply that particular operation on every object of some sequence. Well, just like mapping, we have a filter function to do this. And in this example, what we're going to use is the lambda function, which takes an argument x and it checks for some condition x lesser than zero. And where it's going to get the x from is some sequence r, um, which, which in our case is the numbers from minus five to four. And the filter will basically create a filter object type, which contains uh, only the objects from r that meet this condition, that is x is lesser than zero. And when we use the list operation on top of it, you will see it creates, it results in a list with the values that have met my condition. So for a second example, what we're going to do is we're going to create uh, a list which um, contains a bunch of letters and we're going to only extract the vowels from these bunch of letters. So let's look at what we have here. We have some letters D, A, T, J, K, O, P, L, and we only want the vowels from this. So we want to filter only the vowels. So we can use that using the filter function by first of all defining a function that returns true if a check is met that um, one of uh, the letter matches one of these letters in this list called uh, letters. And if it doesn't, it returns false. So this is our condition that we've created. Once we create this condition, uh, this function that checks this, we can pass this function and the sequence into the filter function and then we can list out whatever we get. So you can see our filtered list contains only A and O, which is basically the only vowels that are present in our original list. Finally, we have the reduce function. This reduce function is basically a func tools. It's in the func tools module of Python 3.0. And what the reduce function does is it applies a function of two arguments cumulatively to the elements of an iterable. And it optionally, it starts with an initial argument and it returns a single result. So let's first import this function. And once we've imported it, let's use it in this example that we have here. So in this example, what we're going to do is we have some list called numbers, right? What if we wanted to get the, get the sum of each element in this list? Well, we can iterate over it and store it in some variable called total in each step, right? Um, this is what we would typically, typically do. And in this step, what you can see is the loop basically iterates over every valuable in numbers and accumulates them in total. The final result is the sum of all the values, which is the value of 10 over here. In this example, the variable total is what we call an accumulator and we can apply the reduce function to do the same task. So how do we do it? Let's first of all create a function called my add where we're going to take two variables, uh, two arguments and we're going to return the sum of it. Okay. So let's uh, define this function. And uh, now we have, we have, we have a list called numbers, right? Which contains one, two, three, and four. Now let's do reduce my add to numbers. Now when I do this, when I use this function, what it will do is it will apply the function of my add, it will take basically uh, each and every element uh, in a sequence. So it will take one and two, then add them together. And then it will create basically what it will do is it'll take one and two, add them together, then we'll have three. So it'll take three and then the next element, which is three again. So it'll create the sum, which is six, and then it will take six and then it will take the value four and it will give us the result 10. So this is how the reduce function would work. So this is how it will give us the result of 10. As you can see here, I've simply used, I've passed this function where I've defined that I want two uh, arguments to be passed to a function and then the return should be basically the sum. And then I've passed a whole list of like four numbers and I've used the reduce function to basically do this process for four numbers in a step by step manner by taking two at a time subsequently. And my result, is, as you can see, is correct as you can see here. So let's use the lambda function now to, the, to do the same topic, to do the same task. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to define a lambda function and that's the function I'm going to pass to this reduce. So when I pass this lambda function, which basically takes two, uh, two arguments, X and Y, and it's going to return the sum of that, uh, as X plus Y. Now where it's going to get X and Y from is in a very, in a very neat manner. So it will take first the first two elements, one and two. It will then do the sum and it, we get three. Then it will take that same three and then take the next object, which is three again, and then give us six. Then it will take six and then the next element, which is four and then give us 10. And then the reduce function will output the, the, the single result, which is 10 to us, as you can see here. 
So yeah, this was our video, um, a discussion on map filter and reduce functions in Python. I hope it's a valuable addition to what you already know about lambda and list comprehensions. In this video, what we will be covering is certain um, abstract data such a structure concepts. And we're going to also use, we're going to implement these abstract data structures using basic Python techniques. And also we're going to get slight introduction into object oriented programming to perform these uh, or to create these abstract data structures. So you can consider this as an exercise or an activity in OOP plus some basic Python concepts. So let's talk about what stack is. Uh, stack being the abstract data structure that we are talking about over here. So the name stack uh, resembles a pile of objects, right? It can be a stack of papers, a tower of blocks, where adding and removing of an item occurs only at the top of the pile. So a stack is an abstract linear data type, which is a collection of objects that supports fast, last in, and first out semantics for inserts and deletes. And like lists for arrays, stacks typically don't allow for random access to the objects they contain. So you can't just access something by an index in a stack. You either go from the top or the bottom of the stack. So what we are going to use is insert and delete operations, which are often called push and pop respectively. Um, stacks and queues are both linear connections of collections of items. Uh, but however, in a queue, the re least recently added item is removed first. So it follows a first in, uh, first out uh, approach. On the other hand, in a stack, the most recently added item is removed in the beginning. So it's like uh, last in and first out approach. So a real life example of a stack is a pile of heavy and precious plates, all kept on top of each other. So if you wish to remove a plate, uh, if you wish to add a plate or remove one, you can only do that from the top. And if you want to remove a plate from the lower uh, bottom of the stack of plates, uh, you have to remove from the top one by one in a practical example, of course. A uh, useful real world analogy for uh, a stack data structures, of course, stack of plates. It can be a pile of clothes as well, where uh, you typically want to remove or put everything from on, on top of the pile and not in the middle or the bottom of the pile. So yeah, so this uh, this is a visual representation of a stack where um, this this whole it's it's a linear collection, but whatever we do is usually uh, uh, something to do with the top the the topmost item or the last entered item of the stack now basic operations that can be performed in a stack are mentioned as uh, follows so there's a push operation which basically adds an item to the stack if the stack is full it is called um, it is said to be in an overflow condition there's a pop operation which removes an item from the stack um, it follows a reversed order to pop items similar to the way when items are pushed so in that case we call it an underflow condition now this peak or top operation, which basically returns the top element of a stack. And then there's the is empty, is empty operation, which returns true if the stack is empty and false if it is not. Now, the applications of stacks, like where do we use them? They can be used to reverse a string. It can be used in uh, expression evaluation, expression conversion. Um, it is used for forward and backward features in web browsers. It is used in recursive passing in uh, NLP and, and so many other operations are there and applications for stacks. Now let's understand stack operations. So the two most basic operations are of course push and pop. Now when we want to push, what we're basically doing, um, let, let's consider an example. So let's consider editing a Python file using the undo feature in our editor. So you, we have a clear understanding of the stack operations. So at first say a new function called insert is added. The push operation adds the insert function into the stack. So this is a visual representation of what we're talking about. So we have this empty list uh, this empty stack initially. And what we're going to push on to this um, is the insert, um, some function say that's called uh, insert or some, some object called insert. So once we've done this, this stack looks like this. It has an object called insert, right? Now a word delete is removed. Let's look at the next thing. Now let's say I, I push something called delete now onto this, right? So if I push delete, some object called delete onto this, it goes on top of the insert stack, right? Because this is a stack, everything occurs in a top, like the last thing that you have added is the first thing that you will see from the top. So we see delete first. So in terms of our example of our Python script, assume the script as the whole stack, where we initially had a function called insert, and then we added a function called delete. And now in the same script, we want some comments for each of these functions. So think of it as another object that we're going to add on top of all of this thread. So now we have this Python script where we have the first function called insert, the second function called delete, 
and a bunch of comments pertaining to these. And that's the last, basically, that's the last object that we added to our Python script. Now let's perform some pop operations. So the first, like say we did undo. Now we have a Python script with all of these things. Now let's say we pressed undo for something. Like say we press undo. Um, well, what is the first thing that is going to go? Of course, it's the last thing that we entered, right? And the last thing we entered was a comment. So when we press undo, uh, what gets popped is the topmost thing, which is the comment. And the comment is now gone. And what we have left in the script is the other two things. And if we hit undo again, well, the next thing that would be removed is the next most recent thing that was added, which was the delete function. And then if we hit undo again, the insert function will get removed. So this is how the pop function and the push function works in terms of stack, where I gave you the example of the undo operation in a Python script. Now let's implement a stack in Python. Um, there are some basic implementations and they, they are as follows. We can use list. We can use collections.dq. Uh, I'll show you what that is. And we can use the custom method, which is basically the OOP example that we were talking about. Um, and there are numerous third party package packages, which we may or may not look into. But for the, the sake of this, a particular video, we're going to be looking at these first three cases in particular. So um, let's look at the first option, which is a list built in. Now the list, the Python's list object type already has a decent stack data structure uh, approach as it supports push and pop operations by default. So let's create a, a list called S. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to append this uh, list with a bunch of strings. So it's, first I'm going to append it with eat, sleep and then code. So if you see here, if I print my list um, that I'm going to treat as a stack, these are my objects, right? Now, if I had to pop from this list, uh, your question would be, well, what is the first object that comes out of this list? Well, um, since we're going to treat this as a stack and since pop is a stack operation, it will pop out or it will remove the, the last most added, the, the, the recent, the most recent added object, which was the string code, right? So if I had to execute these, you will see. When I do the first pop, the, the object that gets uh, popped out is the last thing that was added, which is code. Now, if I did pop again, it will remove sleep because that was again the next most recent one. And finally, if I did pop again, it will remove eat. Uh, it's important to note, uh, oops, one second. So if I do this, then if I did pop and then, okay, so the, so what happened here was basically the pop. Um, okay, so I'll tell you what. Uh, so let's look at an example where I'm going to be using this. So let's define my stack as some list S and I'm going to append eat, sleep and code to it. So the first ob object that, that gets appended is obviously eat, then sleep and then code. So if I were to pop these objects, the first object that should come out is code followed by sleep, followed by eat. So let's look at what happens when I actually try doing it. So let's print out what's in uh, S. So if you see, um, this is basically uh, my my list, my list S. Now my first pop should remove code, as you can see. My next pop should remove sleep, as you can see. Finally, it should remove eat. Now the question is, what if I did pop again? Well, an underflow error would occur. So if I did pop again, you see this error. And it says you cannot pop from an empty list because I have popped every item, which were three items. And the fourth pop will, well, there's nothing else to remove from the list. So it gives me an error. Our next option for stack implementation is using the list, uh, using the collections or DQ. So this is a basic, um, it contains basically Python has a module called collections. It can comprises of the DQ class, which is a double ended queue that supports inserting and removing elements from uh, either ends of this, of an object. So since DQ support adding and removing from either side, um, they can serve both as queues and as stacks as well. So let's import this uh, DQ class and I'm going to create an object called queue of uh, class DQ. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to append eat, sleep and code. As you can see here, let's check what's in Q. Well, it's a DQ object of, uh, it's, it's an object of class DQ with the objects eat, sleep and code. So again, if I did the pop operations, it should remove code, sleep and eat in that order because that's the reverse order in which I have added them in, right? So let's look at it. Code, uh, gets popped first, then sleep and then eat. And of course, if I try to pop even further, it will, it should throw me an error because, um, there's a, it's an empty DQ now. There's no objects left in it. Now the uh, third object is using custom, uh, it, it's using custom method, uh, using classes and objects. So this is basically our example of how we're going to create a class and uh, use concepts of basic concepts of object oriented programming to create our stack.
So let's um, let's start working on this. The so the following stack implementation assumes that the end of the list will hold the top element of the stack. As the stack grows, um, basically as the push operations occur, new items will be added on top of the list. Pop operations will manipulate that same end. So let's create our stack. We are going to create a stack class called stack top end. Um, it will have an initializer which will basically initialize some uh, a list called items. Now once we've done that, we're going to, um, so this is basically the str function. Um, don't worry about this. Let's look at these functions which we are um, concerned about in this uh, particular example. So we have a, um, after we defined our str function, which is basically what is going to do is it's going to print the contents of the stack that we have when we invoke the print function for a particular class object. Now the custom functions, uh, sorry, the custom methods that we have created are is empty, push, pop, peak, size, and display all items. They're very similar to the predefined uh, push, pop, uh, peak functions, etc. So what these will do is the first function is empty, is, uh, as the name suggests, it's going to check whether the list called items is it empty or not. If it is, um, it will return true. Otherwise, it will return false based on this check. The push function. It's going to append an item, uh, whatever we pass to the list items. The pop function, on the other hand, is going to do the pop operation as we have uh, already seen. The peak function, what it's going to do is, um, if you see here, it's going to give us the item in the uh, last most index. So if, if a length of a list is 10, then uh, its last index is 9 since Python is zero based indexing, right? And if we want that last index, we can just do length of that particular list minus one. And then we can use that as an index for our list. So this is basically what's happening here. Um, we're going to check for the uh, last item in the uh, list called items. So yeah, penultimately we have another method called size. This what this will do is basically return the length of our object of, of our list of items. Finally, we have the method called display all items, which is going to return the list itself. So let's initialize a stack. We call it S as you can see here. Let's execute this first. Now we initialize this. We call it S. Now we print S. What it does is, well, it doesn't say, see, it doesn't do anything because what the print of function should do is it should return us the stack contents, which is nothing right now because there is, we haven't entered and we haven't added anything to our list. So we check if it's empty and we see yeah, it is true. It is actually empty. So let's start pushing items into this list. So the first one that we enter, uh, that we push into it will be called will be a string called first, then we push second, and then we push third. So let's do this. Once we have done this, now if we print the uh, this object S, it should give us the stack objects or the stack contents, which is, if you see here, what I've done is actually, I've, I've actually pushed uh, first, second, and third twice by mistake. So it basically contains a list of first, second, third, followed by first, second, third again. Again, this is not an issue. Uh, we can We can work with this as well. Now let's look at the uh, most recent item inserted. So since I've entered first, second, third, followed by first, second, third again. So this list contains is basically a list containing these objects, right? Like first, second, third, followed by first, second, third. And uh, if I were to peek, now what was the peak function? The peak function looks into the last most object. So the peak function should look at the object that I added most recently, which was the string called third. So if I print this, it should give me third which it does over here. Now, if I wanted to view the stack, it's a simple, I can iterate through all of this and print each item. As you can see, since I have added uh, it twice by mistake, uh, what I'm going to do, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to give me everything as you can see here. So it, it, it basically, what this means is uh, my stack contains the objects first, second, third, first, second, third. Uh, similarly, I can also use the display all items to, to do the same thing, to show the same thing as you can see here. Now I can add a Boolean. So what this, uh, what this push will do is it will add a, a Boolean object called true. So if I push this to it, now this stack contains a Boolean object called true as the last object. So let's see, um, let's, let's, uh, so if I, if I wanted to see what S contains now, what I can do is I can do display all items and check. Let's see what is there now. So if you see, I have my objects here, but now since I added a true object, you can see that over here as well, a Boolean object called true. Now let's print size of stack. So we use the size function. It should be seven, as you can see here. Um, now let's, let's push another object. So this object is a, a float object called 8.4. And once I pushed it, and if I don't want to display everything, 
as you can see now I have finally uh, another object called 8.4 in this. So if I were to pop now, what will it pop? It will pop the recent most added, which was the float called 8.4. And if I did that, as you can see, I should get 8.4 here. Finally, if I were to display whatever is left here, it should display everything uh, except the 8.4, which which I have popped earlier on, as you can see. So in uh, this in this other Im implementation, what I am going to treat uh, the top as is the beginning of the list. So the zeroth element is going to be my new top now for the stack. So let's look at uh, how things change because of this. So again, I have uh, initialized uh, a list, an empty list, and I'm going to have something, an is empty function to check if the list is empty. I have a push, which will basically now not insert objects from the last. It will not append objects anymore, but instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert objects to the zeroth index of the list item. And when I do pop, it won't remove the item in the last index, but it will remove the item at the zeroth index. Um, similarly, peak function will also do the same thing. It will look at the uh, list from the left hand side. So it will look at the most, the zeroth index object. So that's the peak. And then the size is the same thing. It's going to return the length of the list and display all items will do the same thing once again. So now I have, um, once I've created this, let's create an implementation called stop zero. Now is stop zero initially empty? It should be true. Um, let's push first, second, and third now. Once I push these, let's look at what was the most recent item that was inserted, which should be third, right? Let's view this uh, stack. Like, how does it look? So if you see here, if I print them one by one, it prints third, second, and first. So even though I've added first, second, and third in this order, the items in which I retrieve it is third, second, and first. And that is because of how I define the stack, where the top of the stack is actually the, the zero with index. So if I did, did, if I did display all items, it should give me a list with third, second, and first in that order. So if I execute this, you can see this over here. So uh, again, if I did uh, just to see again, my peak will basically give me third. Now using these concepts that we have learned, let's perform an exercise. Um, this exercise is going to be where we are going to write a function where uh, we're going to reverse the characters in a string. So let's look at how we are going to implement this. So if you remember this class, stack top n uh, from this from this early, er, earlier case over here. We're going to use this class to create a, 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 an instance of that class. So what we're going to do is we're going to call it my stack. And our input string that we're going to use is called Bangalore. We're going to reverse the characters of Bangalore. So what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to uh, push each string, uh, each character of the string into uh, the stack object using the push function. And then let's see uh, what our uh, object looks like. So as you can see, we have pushed each character of Bangalore into a list and um, we've stored it right now for now. So let's initialize a uh, an empty list and an empty string. Now what we're going to do out here is basically the reversing operation. So as long as my uh, initial list, which is called my stack, this object, as long as this object is not empty, what we're going to do is the pop operation. And we're going to keep the adding, we're going to append each uh, item that we get from the pop operation uh, and add it to the, our empty string. So we're basically going to create a new string with uh, letters that we pop from uh, this particular list, which is basically what it's going to do is it's going to pop E, then R, and then O, and we're going to add it uh, one by one in that order to and create a new list, uh, a new string out of it. So this is how we're going to do a uh, reversing string operation. So once we execute this, and we're going to print what is the reverse string is. So if you see here, uh, the reverse string in the form of a list is like this, and if the, uh, the the string the string form of uh, the reverse string is as you can see here, which is basically Bangalore reversed. As always, I thank you for watching this video. I hope you learned something about the stack, the the abstract data structure in Python and how we implemented it using basic Python lists, DQs, and uh, an object oriented approach to the same. As always, like, subscribe, and share. Uh, this video with your friends so we can reach out to new learners. I hope to see you in the next video and thank you for watching. And with that, we have come to an end of this particular Python full course tutorial. If you have any queries regarding the topics covered in this video, then please feel free to leave them down in the comment section below. Our team of experts will be happy to solve all your queries. Until next time, thank you, stay safe and keep learning.